As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkine Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Very good afternoon and welcome to Expert Talks. I'm Rose Jacobs, your host for the show. Now this is the show that brings experts and industry leaders right to your screen so that you can profit in your own financial world and be inspired by some of the experts and leaders. Today we're speaking with Michael Rayner Jansen, Managing Director of Power Technology Engineered Solutions. Michael, it's a very good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Hello Rose, uh, thanks for inviting me to the show. <laughs> a pleasure. Now just before we get started, I'd like to cover exactly what your company is all about. Power Technology Engineered Solutions or Power Tech is from my understanding an Australian independent family owned energy technology company and system integrator. And sounds like you have a very highly motivated and experienced team with technical core competencies in things like distributed energy, battery energy storage, power systems engineering and system integration engineering. Have I covered everything? <laughs> that was quite a multiple, yes, uh, all, <laughs> all these times, but um, yes, you're correct. Um, yeah, we basically work with utilities and we work with communities um, and, and uh, industry to power their sites or their network more sustainably and uh, more reliably and more independently. So yes, uh, to say it a bit simpler, um, that's it, thank you. So to start with, can you tell us about how microgrid and distributed energy systems and solutions benefit the power supply systems? Yeah, yes, um, microgrids are playing an increasingly important role in power grids. You you know how the energy sector, everybody says that is transitioning from um, central generation, uh, which was one way from the power station to the consumer, to a bi-directional network that, uh, that allows for lots of small distributed um, solar, um, wind, renewable generation in general. And um, that has a bi-directional power flow through the network. 
So microgrid technology uh, delivers kind of um, what I call autonomous cells within this future network. So where a commercial, a commercial or industrial operation or a community indeed uh, can uh, not only power itself more sustainable with their own renewables, but also more independently from the power network. That means uh, they can access uh, the energy wholesale markets, which reduces their, their energy bill. Um, and at the same time, however, can make the network more resilient uh, to avoid overload and congestion in a future network that is more democratic and that allows for more exchange. It's uh, quite a diversification by the sounds of it there. So in your opinion, how sustainable is Australia's power system at the moment? Yeah, on, on, on the high level, um, if I remember well, Australia sits at 25% electricity generation from renewables. So, so that number sits somewhere in the middle as compared to other nations with comparable socioeconomic status. But of course, Australia has all this uh, renewable uh, resource, the sun and can and must do more and become more sustainable and become more of a leader. And, and we all uh, know that, um, well, there are political factors that have slowed down that development. And, but there are also um, systemic factors. Australia has a very complicated regulatory framework, uh, both for, for, for the energy markets and for, for the energy networks. And those must develop. Um, we, we have seen as PowerTech, we, we've done community networks. We've obviously worked through those issues, and we have seen uh, issues uh, with with our projects where basically a network said, "No, you can't have a private electron on a public network," and uh, similar operational issues. So um, these things make simple developments difficult. And as a small business, PowerTech uh, has the opportunity to work through those and contribute uh, to resolve those regulatory developments uh, with pilot projects. Sounds certainly quite complex. So how have PowerTech's capabilities been demonstrated in transformative energy applications? So luckily, we, we did have the opportunity uh, working with customers um, to, I think we have 11 microgrids with battery energy storage systems on the Australian distribution network. And yes, they're all ticking away, they're, they're, they're all working. We started uh, with a project in Cape Jervis in South Australia, uh, which, which is a, a town microgrid and part of that town can go off grid. Um, we received the Clean Energy Innovation Award from the Clean Energy Council in 2016 for uh, community mural park in, uh, in the eastern end of Melbourne, um, where we also have a renewable microgrid that can operate off-grid and it sometimes goes uh, off-grid for 24 hours. We've done three charging stations uh, with uh, Australian charging network uh, ChargeFox. And um, we do tricks there and that, that sounds uh, quite amazing. I think uh, we have high high powered EVs charging like two modern EVs with two hundred with three hundred fifty kilowatts on a petrol station, which is only connected to a feeder that can do hundred kilowatts. So all that is complemented quickly by the battery while keeping the technology parameters in uh, in balance. Um, Quite funny also, we've, we've done uh, two pole mounted uh, batteries for United Energy that dubbed the kilowatt koalas because they wrap around the pole. We've done an industrial microgrid for a jump factory in Handorf, South Australia. And the next one is for the Guinean Dairy community in the ACT. So thanks. Uh, <laughs> we've got quite, uh, quite an opportunity to, to prove these concepts. A very busy schedule indeed. So oh, Michael, yeah, recently, as you mentioned, PowerTech has delivered these first fleets of EV charging station batteries for the public, the electric vehicle charging net network with ChargeFox. So can you elaborate a little more on that and give us your expert opinion on how EVs will transform Australia's energy consumption patterns? Yeah, so, so um, of course, the, the models predict, and that's quite natural, that uh, there's more uh, demand, um, but EVs will also equalize the demand because EVs charge every day, also in the middle of the day when we have a lot of solar. But I think the key question is uh, is how to deal with those uh, spikes that uh, electro vehicle charging causes on the electricity network. And uh, this is becoming very relevant uh, with increasing uptake in Australia. Australia is still uh, on a low level, but now we have lots of new projects, including uh, public bus fleets becoming electrical. And the I think the solution there is not building 
conventional networks means building new large substation. Um, but often the more economical and sustainable uh, approach to deal with those uh, spiky uh, demands, spiky loads, is indeed uh, batteries and microgrid controls. And it's not only about economical, that's even more economical, but of course also about uh, sustainability. And um, the network that we work with, the charging network ChargeFox, for example, uh, aim at being 100% renewable when charging electrical cars. And, and to do that, our technology also helps to generate uh, solar on site or to feed in that solar power at one end of the network and use it as another, at the other end of the network in the given regulatory network and market, which has its complexities. Some very exciting new directions yet to come. I'll be watching that very closely. Now, final question. Innovation is really the key to success for any organization in the present world. So can you tell us about the recent innovation strategies you've implemented in your grid battery energy storage and other products? Yeah, as a, as a smaller company bootstrapping ourselves only on the market since 2014. And so, so, so we didn't take an approach like how do we become the next unicorn? We rather uh, took a, an approach of of uh, uh, get the uh, innovation really from customer pressures. So we work very closely with the network, with, with the industry, with the charging networks, and have the opportunity that within pilot projects, um, we, we actually, uh, we feel the pain and we make them work. We make them work in this environment. So, so we do end-to-end -end solutions, which is a lot of work for a small company, but which gives us the freedom to do innovation. And yes, we obviously do it a bit smart and sophisticated and we work and grow together with our customers. I think that summarizes the innovation strategy best. It's a, it's a wonderful plan and strategy, I can, uh, I can assure you. But Michael, that's all we've got time for, for today. I thank you so much for joining us here on Expert Talks. Thank you for having me, Rose. Thanks for Pleasure. the opportunity. Michael Rana Jansen, Managing Director of Power Technology Engineered Solutions. And that's it for today's talk. I'm Rose Jacobs and I'll see you next time on Calkine TV. Tectonic, the DeFi crypto is quickly becoming one to watch. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calkine Media. Tectonic is one of the few cryptos trading higher than its price at the beginning of the year. The crypto works in the DeFi category, which is great because yield farming and token staking are gaining a lot of traction. Tectonic is basically a cryptocurrency market maker protocol, and its offerings are similar to other protocols like Uniswap. Users of Tectonic can participate either as liquidity providers or as crypto credit seekers. Bomber stake their crypto holding, which in turn creates liquidity and brings passive income in the form of interest to the individual. Borrowers are the ones that use these stake tokens to engage in short-term trading and profit making. Now, what makes Tectonic an interesting watch is its claim that the transactions on the platform are audited by Slowmist, a blockchain auditor. Plus, Tectonic is working to add insurance funds to the network very soon. So, in the event of any lapses in under-collateralized loans, this fund can act as a savior. Tectonic ranks quite low in the coin market cap listing, but its price surge so far in 2022 has been phenomenal. The crypto recently registered over 15% in gains. And if Tectonic finds more backers for its DeFi services, the price may go beyond one US dollar by 2025. Another key factor is that decentralized lending and concepts like Web 3.0 may become a force to reckon with by that year. And if something like this happens and blockchain-based lending in crypto assets does become a big industry, well, Tectonic Crypto may even reach into the double-digit price territory in the coming five years. Its price movement relies both on the network's performance in the DeFi sector and on the overall price trend in the cryptocurrency market that has thousands of assets to explore. As of now, the DeFi sector has some very high market cap cryptos like Uniswap, AAV and Compound, and Tectonic has yet to break into this league. 
What's your take on this crypto? Let us know in the comments and as always, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holland Shields for Kalkine Media. The rise in popularity of cryptocurrencies demand for crypto exchanges has also climbed. Headquartered in New Zealand, Easy Crypto is one of the leading cryptocurrency trading platforms across the nation. It's trusted by more than 100,000 customers and enables an instant and secure gateway to buy and sell digital coins. Here one can trade in more than 100 cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin and Ethereum and can avail customer support whenever needed. This article was written by the team of Kalkine Writers. I'm happy to present it to you today. Subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. So why are Kiwis opting for Easy Crypto? Being a beginner-friendly gateway, Easy Crypto's platform is simple to use right from its sign-up process to the purchase or sale of cryptocurrencies. And further, it does not have any hidden fees. This is the fees charged are all-inclusive, which range between 0.70% to 0.90% of the transaction amount. Moreover, the platform sports numerous payment methods like bank transfers, poly pay, as well as account to account. Also, Easy Crypto boasts extensive educational resources helping investors learn about the nitty gritty of crypto trading. Is Easy Crypto safe? It is one of the fastest and safest growing crypto trading platforms across Kiwiland as it does not store investors' funds or private keys on its platform. Instead, users can directly deposit their digital holdings into cold storage wallets linked to their bank accounts, thereby minimizing the risks associated with theft or hacking. The platform follows a verification process and fulfills Know Your Customer or KYC requirements. Also, it boasts of being the country's first crypto broker to offer a 100% safety guarantee on funds on every order. It's pointed out that this trading platform is licensed and regulated under the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Centre or AUSTRAC. The latter is a regulating agency which enforces financial laws and helps in minimising the risks associated with money laundering, cybercrime and more. Easy Crypto is equipped with an additional two-factor authentication feature which provides an extra layer of security to the account thus making it difficult for fraudsters to withdraw funds or hack into the system. So to sum it up for you, laced with an easy to use interface, Easy Crypto is well known among the Kiwi crypto investing community for its security features. And if you like this information, do let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel if you press the bell icon. You'll be notified of the latest videos from Kalkine. But for more articles like this, check out the website kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney. And today's adventure specialist will share insights from the tourism sector. And 24 Hours in Sydney have a very inspiring motto, you got to love Sydney. And they can give you plenty of reasons to do so with their unique walks and tour offerings. So where the guide actually becomes your best friend. And bringing you live today on the show, we have Mr. John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney. Welcome to the show, John. Welcome. How are you today? <laughs> thank you so much. I'm well, thank you. And thanks for fitting us in your busy schedule. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just love Sydney. Yes, and I can feel your passion through the screen already. <laughs> well, it's a great day to connect with you because the government's announced they're going to have a stay and rediscover $50 voucher for everyone to spend on tourism and aviation. Yeah, it, it's, it's an extension of the Dine and Discover card. It's something that we've embraced as 
24 hours in Sydney. Uh, you can use it on 10 different offerings of what we've got for tours in Sydney. We cover small bars, we cover the rock, we cover um, Manly, uh, all the great places of Sydney that people want to We've been living here for over 30 years or more. We find them places that they don't realise we actually exist. Fantastic. Well, look, John, let's make the most of our time together today. Your business sounds like a very exciting venture. Do you mind telling us the ins and outs? When did you start operating and what was the inspiration behind the brand, please? Well, <laughs> funnily enough, it was goes back a long time for what I know about Sydney. I was a sales manager and I was giving people great uh, exposés of Sydney in the 1980s because they sort of said, John, you know, it's Sydney better than anybody else. And then about 10 years ago, I was approached to run some uh, experiences in Sydney. And then about four years ago, I bought a business called Sydney Urban Adventures, which is now transformed into 24 hours in Sydney. And the beauty of 24 hours in Sydney is that it is a highly sought after search term on Google. And we fortunately now have a website called 24 hours in Sydney. Fantastic. It sounds like you're on to a good thing there. And it's not been an easy time for anyone over the last 18 months, especially those in tourism, hospitality, aviation, entertainment and the arts. How did you survive the downturn and what's the strategy moving, moving forward? The, the toughest thing for us was that we needed to stay in business. And the only way we could do that was to cut back and, and cut back to the bare bones. So what we created was a website, and we've been populating that website, renaming tours, giving people a chance to actually get the experience in it from a totally different perspective. We love to help corporate with their team building, team bonding, and what we discovered is that when people were walking with us, they were doing the talking amongst themselves. So it's a great opportunity to build rapport with your own team as well as potential customers. Oh, great. So you do corporate team building as well as tourists and locals who you just want to find out a bit more. Is that correct? Oh. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it, there's a, the chances are is that a lot of people think they know Sydney, but we've got a place in George Street. George Street North, actually, because at one stage from the late 1860s, 1870s, Sydney was being paved with wood blocks and they were finally removed just before the Great Depression and with the road being paved in wood blocks there's a, there's a section of the road in George Street North it's still paved in wood blocks 30,000 people walk past that section every day and they don't even realize it's part of our colorful history and I mean colorful because we're a fabulous country and Sydney is the greatest city in the world. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And I believe I saw on your website that you're accepting bookings right now. What are the regulations regarding vaccination requirements for these outdoor walks, please? And do you have any specials that you'd like to tell us about? Well, the, 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 con the concept of our um, COVID-19, we follow the government regulations. So at the present moment, we're requiring people to be double vaccinated because as we visit different venues, they're expecting the patrons to be double vaccinated. So we're doing the same thing. So we've got our own Perth uh, New South Wales app uh, that you scan and you register and you come in and bingo, you're in the system. Unfortunately, our app does not allow you to get a blanket entry into venues. You'll need to re uh, enter each time we go in and out of the venue. Well, some of the specials that we have is that we've formed a partnership with a travel partner who is able to offer people who are just thinking of coming to Sydney, all they need to do is to contact us via email uh, or on our social media pages to say, hey, how can, how can we take advantage of your four day, three night stay off on entry from 24 hours in Sydney? Oh, we're right. We are desperate to get people back into the city. Each time New South Wales has relaxed their, their uh, 
there laws to sort of, as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. What we created was is that people um, would go into the regional areas and not into the city. We definitely want people back in the city. We want people back in the offices. We want people back in all of the small businesses that thrive on serving all of our people in the city of Boston. And finally, we have new laws, uh, 70% tax rate, yes, 80% tax rate, and soon to be 90% tax rate. We're accepting visitors again from overseas, which is just fabulous news for our industry. Well, yes, the seagulls and the ibises are getting a bit lonely. <laughs> so we do need some people in the city. <laughs> yeah, well, that, this, uh, the seagulls are one thing, but the ibises are actually called bin chickens. <laughs> Very true. Yep. Um, so you've got your walks starting up pretty soon. Are they operational at the moment? And I think you mentioned a special offer where children can come along for free. When does that start? Well, that, that's been part of our feature on all of our tours that are um, not 18 and over restrictions. So how it works is that for each free adult that pays to be on one of our tours, they can bring one of their children for free. We're not a babysitting service. What we are, however, is that we are offering these uh, this incentives to get kids to get to know about Sydney. We just love it so much, we want to share it with as many people as we possibly can. Well, I had a quick uh, look over your website and I was blown away. There's just so much information there and stuff I didn't know. It's very exciting. So hopefully people will check it out, 24hoursinsydney.com.au and, and come along to one of those walks. So, John, how do you source these amazing locations? Do you do all the sleuthing yourself? Um, as I mentioned, your website is very interesting. It's got a lot of hidden, iconic Australiana there. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you do source these wonderful locations? One of the key factors is that the people who work with us, some uh, we've got one guy who goes all, it traces his ancestry all the way back to the second fleet, another one who traces his ancestry back to the fourth fleet. I myself is a first generation Australian, born after the Second World War, and my parents came here as part of the Displaced Persons Act to populate Australia. And how lucky was I that they desperately wanted to have transportation to the US today and thankfully they came to Sydney. The and Emerald I've City. I've grown up in Sydney and, and I have done all the crazy things that a Sydney boy uh, would do as a teenager. One of our uh, experiences covers the rock area. We're in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. It was probably uh, one of the most dangerous areas to visit in Sydney. Today it's a, a very effective centre, but we take people into one of the bars where uh, Mr. Stin, age South Long, used to have a photographer to take compromising pictures of key influential politicians, lawyers and policemen that so he could gain certain favours if anything ever went wrong with his discussion. Well, yes, that would definitely act as good collateral. Um, <laughs> And you offer corporate packages that we've touched on a little bit, as well as walks for tourists and locals who want to discover more about the beautiful Emerald City. What sets 24 Hours in Sydney's offerings apart from the other walking tours and businesses around? Well, we, we, we actually came up with, during the COVID lockdown. We did a lot of thinking. We discovered that when we take bookings from online travel agents, we would have to have inclusions of a BSA for $10 and the customer would need to pay $16 for that. So we've excluded inclusions from all of our tour offerings because we'd like to save money for our clientele. The, the second aspect that we did is that a lot of other of our competitors, when they charge you, they charge you a per person rate, we book you into groups, and the, more, the bigger the group, the cheaper the per person rate becomes. So you might find that someone, one of our competitors will be charging 60 or 30 dollars per person, our tours can come down to as little as 31 dollars per person, depending on how many people book into the tour. We've even created a Facebook page so that people can put up and say to, say to each other and say, oh, look, I'm thinking of coming to Sydney on the 25th of February, 
I'm thinking of doing uh, um, the, the rock Thunder Box tour. Um, would you like to join us so we can all save money? And that's all available on our website and also on our Facebook groups. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for your information and making time for the show today. We have to start wrapping up. Was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close the discussion? Well, the, the only thing that I, I can sort of say to you is that Sydney has the most fabulous waterway. And I had a person who came, uh, 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 an employee, if I'm allowed to mention, or a Google employee. Google has a head, an office down in uh, Ultimo Glebe. And, and he said to me, how do I get to it? And I said, where are you staying? And he said, near circular thing. I said, well, why don't you just go to the We have the most fabulous transport system here in Australia. And when I was growing up, we had to turn to the correct fare. But now we have an Opal card that makes it very, very easy for people to <laughs> travel around Sydney and, and they can actually use Google for their time of And And I'll, the final thing I want to sort of say is that when you come and you have an experience with us, you end up with a friend in Sydney that can help you at any time in the future. And if you've got other friends who want to come to Sydney, you can refer them directly to us and we will take care of them as if they were all like it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your adventure um, and passion, I beg your pardon, for the adventures <laughs> that you put on. Really do appreciate your time today and best of luck moving forward as Sydney reopens. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Thank you, Thank Catherine. You. Thanks, John. And if you've just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion. Mr. John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney, please do check out the full interview at YouTube on Calkine Media's channel. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Web 3.0 blockchain technologies are in huge demand in the market of late, and one company is making huge waves in the space, Alchemy, which has tripled its valuation following its funding round. Hello and thanks for tuning in, I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcine Media. Crypto startup is now valued at 10.2 billion US dollars after a $200 million fundraising session of ground, which was led by Lightspeed and Silverlake. This takes Alchemy into the Web 3.0 Decacorn Club, as the company is expected to grow stronger following this boost. Alchemy managed to raise around 250 million US dollars through Series 3 fundraising rounds led by Andresen Horowitz. Since then, it's grown threefold with numerous Web 3.0 initiatives. But let's backtrack a little bit. What is Alchemy? Founded by Joe Lau and Nikki Viswanathan, Alchemy aims to be a DeFi superhighway that tracks the development of Web 3.0 through various NFT and crypto projects. Working behind the scenes, Alchemy is now climbing the charts as one of the preferred networks developing companies, which can be utilized by developers to build DApps on top of blockchains. Alchemy's news seems to have generated interest among Alchemy pay investors. Investors in the ACH token seem to have been buoyed by the namesake network as the token was up 5.65%. The ACH crypto is primarily a payment gateway solution that connects fine and crypto worlds. ACH was trading at 0.047 US cents with a volume of 96 million US dollars over a day. 
However, it's important to remember that ACH Crypto's performance has got nothing to do with Alchemy's Web 3.0 funding. Nevertheless, the upcoming months will be crucial for Alchemy as it lays the groundwork towards its future goals. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Hollow Shields for Kalkine Media. In the diverse space of blockchain, decentralized finance is one prominent category. DeFi is a blend of multiple elements, including crypto assets, crypto exchanges, and crypto lending. On CoinMarketCap, there are over 500 cryptocurrencies that are classified as DeFi projects. The list is led by high market cap cryptos, including Terra, Avalanche, and Uniswap. Let's look at one DeFi crypto that is not a billion dollar project as of now, but it is gaining traction. SafeMoon. SafeMoon claims to have many dimensions, including DeFi, a metaverse, non fungible tokens, a wallet, and even a launch pad for new cryptocurrencies. The SafeMoon network also claims to have unique reward features, which include incentivizing users if they hold their assets for longer, which is an extension of the HODL concept. As a player in DeFi, SafeMoon adds liquidity to the crypto world, besides enabling the swapping of assets. SafeMoon is the token of the SafeMoon DeFi project. With a market cap of over 875 million US dollars as of now, the SafeMoon crypto ranks in the top 250 cryptos on the coin market cap listing. If other DeFi tokens rise, there's a fair chance SafeMoon may also appreciate on this positive sentiment. Secondly, SafeMoon may soon add NFT and metaverse features to its network, which may boost the price in the midterm. If the DeFi subsector can prove its utility over centralized crypto exchanges and the traditional financial world where banks dominate, SafeMoon may gain value. Depending on its performance and adoption, SafeMoon may touch $5 by 2025, but for that, there is a long way to go. So what do you think about SafeMoon? Could it reach five bucks or leave your comments below? You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. Volatile stocks are deemed to be highly risky in the financial world, but as they say, with great risk comes the potential for great rewards. Volatility of a stock has a quantifiable value known as beta that measures the range of return for a given security in relation to market index. It measures the dispersion through standard deviation or variance between returns. A security that fluctuates more than the market index has a beta of more than 1.0 and one that fluctuates less than the market index has a beta of less than 1.0. So with that said, let's take a look at the five most volatile FTSE stocks that you should be keeping an eye on. Let's begin with Harbour Energy PLC with the trading code HBR. FTSE 250 constituent Harbour Energy PLC is the UK's largest independent oil and gas company with operations in the UK, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Norway, Vietnam and the Falkland Islands. Harbour Energy PLC's stock has a beta of 4.16 and it's given a return of negative 13.09% to its shareholders in the past year and its year to date return stands at 3.1%. Its shares were trading at GBX 364.8 down by 0.6% with a market cap of nearly 3.4 billion pounds. John Menzies PLC with the trading code MNZS. John Menzies PLC is a leading global provider of landside and airside services. The company has developed to become a critical partner in the global aviation sector, offering logistics and support services. John Menzies PLC stock has a beta of 3.82 and it's given a return of 108.15% to its shareholders in the past year 
and its year-to-date return stands at 48.04%. Its shares were trading at GBX 460 down by 3.76%, with a market cap of £439.29 million. Sign World Group PLC with the trading code SIGN. FTSE 250 constituent Sign World Group PLC is the world's second largest cinema chain that operates through 767 sites with 9,311 screens across 10 countries. Sydney World Group PLC stock has a beta of 3.57 and it's given a return of negative 46.9% to its shareholders in the last year and its year to date return stands at 26.4%. Its shares were trading at GBX 40.5 up by 3.13% with a market cap of £539.18 million. Costain Group PLC with the trading code of COST. Costain Group PLC is a construction and engineering company that offers consultancy and advisory, future shaping strategic consultancy, asset optimization, digital technology solutions, and complex programmed delivery solutions to its clients. Costain Group's stock has a beta of 3.31 and it's given a negative return of 13.48% to its shareholders in the past year and its year-to-date return stands at negative 4.89%. Its shares were trading at GBX47, down by 5.43%, with a market cap of £136.65 million. And lastly, Tullow Oil PLC with the trading code TLW. Tullow Oil is a multinational oil and gas exploration and production company with a primary focus on Europe, Africa and South America featuring more than 50 exploration and production licenses located across 11 countries. Tullow Oil PLC stock has a beta of 3.28 and it's given a return of 64.28% to its shareholders in the past one year and its year to date return stands at 9.71%. Its shares were trading at GBX 51.16 down by 1.24% with a market cap of £742.18 million. So there you have it, the five most volatile FTSE listed stocks that could well be worth watching for the investor with a riskier appetite. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and press that bell icon. Also, you can check out the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkine Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with AJ Gupta. Now, AJ is the CEO at LCC Immigration. They offer visa and immigration services to Canada and other countries. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market.
Hello there, AJ. It's great to have you speaking with us today. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. And how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Very interested to hear more about immigration over in Canada. So what are some of the biggest challenges that immigrants face when moving to another country? Uh, see, Rachel, uh, before moving to the country, even like I think you're based out in Australia and say you are uh, sitting in Sydney and suddenly you have to move to Melbourne or Perth. Uh, when you're moving from a city to city, uh, there also you find a lot of challenges because you're changing your home, you're changing your culture, you're coming across with new neighbors. So it's the city thing. Now, you think like you are moving totally out of country. You are sitting in Australia and you're trying to come to Canada. So challenges will definitely be there. And specifically, if I talk about Canada, uh, the main challenge people which face or the think is mainly on the weather because Canadian weather is a bit harsh sometimes. Uh, like if you are in Northern Territories or if you're in Atlantic regions, uh, you get snow, uh, you get a lot of snow. Like last week, even in Toronto, we had 25 to 30 centimeters snow, uh, which made the daily commute very difficult, the lives very difficult. So that's one thing which is always challenging. Then second thing uh, is the culture because you're moving from a country. Um, you might not get the same culture uh, when you're moving from your country to another country. And uh, the last but not the least is the job market because you are moving for a betterment for your prospects, for your employment. And uh, you need to start all together uh, from the beginning, looking for the jobs or looking for employment. So that might be initial stages, but it is always said, Rachel, give one year to the new country and then that country gives you for the life. So that's how it basically works. Absolutely. And you mentioned yeah. the harsh weather there that you sometimes have in Canada. But many nationalities are still very interested in moving to Canada. Why do you think this is and what is a popular country for people to move from to Canada? Okay. Uh, Canada is rated number one, number one country for the quality of life. Uh, if you see a lot of surveys, if you see US, uh, everybody's rating Canada number one. Uh, because during COVID, the way Canada has handled the situation, I'm not sure any other country has handled it, the kind of things which happen in Canada and the way took, they, they took so much care of their people and uh, took them away from a uh, pandemic. So one is the quality of life, which also include intangibles like job security, political stability, uh, say you can say individual freedom and environmental quality. So that's point one. But other than those, uh, the things which really attract people to come to Canada is the healthcare system. Canada right now have the, be uh, the best healthcare system consistently ranked among best in the world. One of its benefits is the provision of publicly funded healthcare. So that's very, very important when you have the public funding. Then education system in Canada, you might have heard, uh, it's one of the best education systems. And most importantly, like earlier we were discussing in the challenges, the culture thing. So Canada is generally a very progressive, diverse and multicultural country. Like Canada don't have their own population, but they have mainly the immigrants who basically come from various countries and want to settle in Canada. Uh, you might be surprised like in Toronto, which is one of the Canada's largest city, have more than 140 languages which are spoken over here, more than 140. So you can imagine the kind of people who got immigrated it can be from South Asian countries, it can be from Africa, it can be from Europe, it can be from anywhere in the world. So when you come to Canada, you never feel that you are away from home. You always feel it's the same kind of culture, same kind of neighbors you're getting, which makes you feel very comfortable. And that's what people come to Canada for. And in your experience, how do you believe the pandemic has affected immigration into Canada? Okay, uh, pandemic has hit hard for everything, but Canadian immigration was boom in the time of pandemic like uh, 2020 uh, Canadian government announced they will be you know uh, because they set the targets and they set the targets of 120,000 like 1 million 20,000 people they want to get in for the next three years that was the immigration target and in 2021 successfully they have taken 40,000 people and they are on par to get next 80,000 in two years so immigration has really done well uh, during even the pandemic because Canada uh, Canada's economy is totally majorly driven by uh, 
immigration. So they never stopped it. They eased the rules for the people who were already in Canada. Like it has been benefited for a lot of people who were students in Canada, who were workers in Canada, and who were really having a difficult life during pandemic, not getting jobs, getting uh, the pay cuts and all. So Canadian government stepped in and tried to help them. They might not have taken a lot of immigrants from outside Canada, but help those people uh, like students who just finished the studies and was contributing to the economy of Canada. They wanted to help. They really helped them out uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of immigration schemes, which were very, very easy. The point system was cut down. So a lot of things happen and Canadian immigration has really boomed up in last couple of years, which in my experience have never seen this kind of targets and this kind of booms. So yes, it hard, uh, the pandemic hit hard everything, but not the Canadian immigration. And just with your expertise from all the years you've been working with immigration, which countries do you believe have easy policies for international students who want to obtain a new visa? And which countries have the most challenging policies? Uh, challenging policies definitely are mainly what I, as per my experience, are the European countries. Uh, like if you talk about, say, Austria, uh, that's number one. Uh, I think you know about Vienna. So Austria is one of the countries which is tough on permanent residencies. Germany, you can say Japan, Switzerland and US. These are the most challenging uh, countries in terms of getting the visas or in terms of getting the immigrations done. But if you talk about the easier countries wherein you can basically get the visa much easier, easier you can say Mexico is one of the countries. Uh, Panama is another country. Uh, New Zealand, I can rate and say Indonesia. These are the countries where it is much, much easier and you have less challenges to get your permanent residency done. It's very interesting. And with your experience, mm -hmm. how has the industry evolved within immigration? What future do you envision for the sector? Okay, immigration is always the booming sector because you have two types of segments. One is uh, developed countries and one is developing countries. Uh, so, see, I'm basically an Indian. Uh, whenever I was in India, I always dreamt of moving to other countries for my better future, uh, for the education of my kids. Uh, so that's what it happens. Uh, immigration is a recession proof thing. Uh, during pandemic also, I told you uh, we were doing so good with immigration. It kept all the consultants very, very busy in Canada uh, and even a lot of people got blessed with immigration schemes. So it's a recession proof uh, sector. Immigration I have never seen for last 10 to 15 years getting down, even if the countries like US and all, when they make the rules stricter, still people keep trying because they always want to move to a better country where the quality of life is much, much better than their own country. And during pandemic, you know, Rachel, what has happened, like every country has got a hit, whether it is a developed, developing or underdeveloped country. But the major hit has been for those countries which were not getting the vaccines, uh, where the population was so high, the economy was not that good. So now those countries uh, definitely want, like at the, some stage, everybody thinks, oh, I was seeing always in the news, Canada is doing very well, US is doing good, European countries are helping their citizens. So they always want their future, at least if not there, the kids' future should be secured and they should be moving to those developed countries. So immigration will always keep you on toes uh, the way it is. And I think in the coming years, it will be moving much, much more. Canada is definitely one of the best countries to live in. And that's how we basically have four locations over here. And we are trying to help people to migrate to Canada across the globe. So I don't feel any recession like the housing market is on fire in Canada right now. Even in recession, the housing market is very, very good here. So same thing as immigration. I think in coming years, it's once the COVID thing goes off and rules are getting relaxed now, I feel uh, there'll be much, much better scope for a lot of people to immigrate to Canada. Absolutely. And I think with immigration, if you think you want to do it, you should do it because nobody wants to live with regret. So thank you so yeah. much for your insights there today, AG. It's been fascinating to chat with you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for now, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Cal Kine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments 
across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. It's been a huge week for the Polygon blockchain, which received a $450 million infusion from a variety of top investment firms, including Sequoia Capital India, SoftBank Vision Fund 2 and Tiger Global. The huge investment follows signs that Polygon is moving into the Web3 space, which its investors clearly believe is a profitable move. Polygon operates as a layer to the network on the Ethereum blockchain and its role is basically to eliminate traffic from the Ethereum blockchain. This is one reason why Polygon is currently thriving. Over the past year, the Ethereum blockchain has become congested as a result of a huge increase in its number of users. While its usership has increased, so too has congestion, leading to higher gas prices as well as slow transaction speeds. Delays surrounding Ethereum's upgrade have also helped Polygon's popularity. Ethereum's upgrade, called Ethereum 2.0, was originally slated for completion last year, but has since been delayed for release until later this year. Ethereum's layer 2 aside, Polygon's recent moves into the Web3 ecosystem is what has made it so attractive to investors. Earlier this year, Polygon hired YouTube's former head of gaming, Ryan Wyatt, to move Polygon into this new version of the internet. Web3 promises a more decentralized, user-friendly incarnation of the net, which will house the metaverse as well as non-fungible tokens and cryptocurrencies. Polygon also has its own native cryptocurrency called Matic, which has experienced a significant increase over the past seven days. Matic is used as a staking token to validate transactions using the proof-of-stake method. Matic has a market capitalization of $14.7 billion, which ranks it 15th in the largest cryptos by market cap. It's currently valued at $1.97 after being priced at $1.53 just a week ago, an increase of over 20%. This latest spike comes after a short period of decline since it touched an all-time high of $2.90 on the 27th of December 2021. Although the year 2022 has so far been a downturn in the wider crypto market, things are possibly turning around. The winners this year will be those platforms that evolve with the changing of the internet. Polygon is definitely one to watch in this department. So what do you think about Polygon? You can leave your comments below. You can also like and share this video and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calkai Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. 
Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet Three ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24, 2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet Three ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. The electric vehicle market has witnessed considerable growth in the last two years with the International Energy Agency indicating 6.6 .6 million EVs sold in 2021 globally, compared to 3 million in 2020. A significant rise in sales was recorded despite the ongoing semiconductor chip shortage across the industry and the COVID-19 restrictions. China's done well with their sales so far, accounting for almost 12% of the total EV sales in 2021. Norway is the global leader in EV adoption, recording more than 80% of the total new cars sold in the country are electric vehicles. Australia has recorded staggering growth in EV sales. The country tripled its total EV sales in 2021 to 20,665 compared to 6,900 sold in 2020. Tesla's Model 3 was the best-selling electric car in Australia, with 12,094 vehicles sold in 2021. MG ZS took the second position with 1,388, and Mitsubishi Outlander with 592. Australia may witness the launch of many EV models before the end of the year. The largest new vehicle retailer in the region, Toyota, has claimed to launch around 30 EVs across the Toyota and Lexus brands by 2030. Many automakers have released their first generation offerings. A few of them have expanded their catalogue of EVs. More consumers are considering EVs as the next vehicle of their garage, as they can choose from their various options in the exciting list of cars across categories in the coming months. Various EV models, including Hyundai's Lonic 5 and Polestar 2, are expected to launch this year, but they are facing supply troubles due to the chip shortage. Kia's EV6 is also facing the same issue. The growth in EV sales is going hand in hand with the increasing awareness for environmentally friendly means of transportation. 
So will your next car be electric? Leave a comment below and let us know. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. So talk by Kalkine, the crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past morning, year and, and now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me Sage to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Calkine TV Sydney Studios. Now, Australian shares are expected to rebound this morning. According to the latest buy futures, the ASX 200 is expected to open 57 points higher or 0.8% higher. Yesterday, at the closing bell, the S&P ASX 200 was 0.5% lower at 7,207. The best performing sector yesterday was information technology, up 0.97%. The worst performing sector was energy, down 3.1%. The best performing stock in the S&P SX200 was Sims. Their shares closed 13.7% higher at $17.04. The worst performing stock was Beach Energy. Their shares closed 10.5% lower at $1.46. We have a few large companies reporting today. First off, Australian gas producer Santos reports its full year results for 2021, reporting record free cash flow of 1.5 billion US dollars, an underlying profit of 946 million compared to 287 million a year earlier. These results reflect significantly higher oil and LNG prices compared to the corresponding period due to the recovery in global energy demand combined with supply constraints across the industry due to lower capital investment through the pandemic and three weeks contribution from the oil search assets. 
The reported net profit after tax of $658 million includes losses on commodity hedging and costs associated with acquisitions and one of tax adjustments and is significantly higher than the corresponding period that's mainly due to impairments included the previous year. The board has resolved to pay a final dividend of 8.5 US cents per share, that's 70% higher than the previous final dividend. Moving on, and Treasury Wine Estates reported a 19% decline in EBITs for Penfolds to $165.1 million and an EBITs margin of 43.1%, down 1.4 percentage points. Reduced shipments to mainland China were partly offset by strong growth across global priority markets and channels, with Penfolds growth particularly strong in Asian markets outside of mainland China. A diplomatic round between Canberra and Beijing eventuated in the closing of the lucrative Chinese market to Australian wine. Treasury Americas reported a 90% increase in EBITs to $85.2 million and an EBITs margin of 18.3%. That's up 4.2 percentage points. And Telix Pharmaceuticals has entered into a commercial distribution agreement with Global Medical Solutions Australia for Telix's prostate cancer imaging product Elucix for the Australian market. GMSA is a global manufacturer and distributor of diagnostic and therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals, which owns and operates 16 radio pharmacies through the Asia Pacific region. Elucix received marketing approval from the Australian Therapeutic. Goods Administration in November 2021. Well, now it's time for a very short break, but stay tuned for more news set to affect your trading day. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome back to the Morning Outlook Report. Over in the U.S., on Wall Street, the Dow Jones rose 1.22%, the S&P 500 surged 1.58%, and the Nasdaq was up 2.53%. While the Ukraine crisis eased, the Labor Department reported U.S. producer prices increased by the most in eight months in January, a reminder that high inflation could persist through much of this year. Stocks on Wall Street and in Europe rebounded yesterday while oil prices fell after Russia indicated it was withdrawing some troops from exercises near Ukraine. And President Vladimir Putin said he saw room for further discussion with the West. The stocks of 50 rose 1.9 percent. The FTSE advanced 1 percent. The DAX gained 2 percent and CAC rose 2 percent also. The U.S. dollar index was down 0.2 percent, while the euro was up 0.3 percent against the dollar at $1.13. Oil prices fell 3 percent yesterday as they retreated from seven-year highs. WTI futures fell $3.39 U.S. cents to settle at $92.07 a barrel. Brent futures settled down $3.20 to $93.28 a barrel. Gold prices also declined as demand for the safe haven asset eased. Amid the reports that Russia is pulling troops back from the Ukraine border, U.S. gold futures settled down 0.7% at 1,856 U.S. dollars an ounce. Well, that's all for our Morning Outlook report here on Kalkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. 
Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Alex Brammer, the VP of Business Development at Luxor Tech. This is North America's largest mining pool operator, supporting 15 different cryptocurrency coins and over 8,500 miners or thereabouts. And they are experienced in delivering high quality pools with strong uptimes in customer service and are thrilled to bring this knowledge to the Bitcoin mining industry, in their own words from their website. And whilst the price of Bitcoin is nearing its all time high, the crypto space is buzzing, which puts the crypto miners in the spotlight. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates and successful business leaders to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Mr. Alex Bremer, the VP of Business Development at Luxor Tech. Welcome to the show, Alex. Hi, Sage. Thanks so much. Thanks for making time for us. And we're keen to share your Thank insights. You. So let's get started. So Luxor Tech started with a small team of developers back in 2017 and with two public mining pools in 2018. Now you are North America's largest mining pool. Could you please share your journey of achieving this incredible accolade? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just, we are, so started in late 2017 with a couple altcoin pools, uh, Zcash, Equ you know, some of the Equash, Equahash uh, consensus algorithms. Uh, also Saya, one of our founders was uh, a core developer on the Saya project. That started expanding into uh, Bitcoin space. We launched our first SHA-256 mining pool in uh, 2019. And <clears throat> this year, really, uh, this bull cycle has um, been kind of a banner year for us. Uh, closed Series A financing in April, led by NYDIG. Uh, we're currently sitting at right around 6 exahash, which is right around 4% of the Bitcoin network. Um, so we're really just proud of what's going on in the space, proud of what we've been doing. Um, the mining space has been very interesting, and so we've been expanding beyond uh, just the pool services, uh, really focusing on kind of mining consulting advisory services. Uh, as, mining popular, as mining popularity increases, the margins are uh, continuing to increase, especially with the price action that we're seeing today. Uh, and recently, it's becoming increasingly popular for high net worth individuals, family offices, um, hedge funds even, to want to allocate uh, into Bitcoin mining and start investing directly into infrastructure and mining themselves. And so it's something that we've been uh, focusing on a lot as well. Fantastic. And it's great to see those high net worth individuals and uh, institutional investors getting involved in the cryptocurrency sector too. So Luxor Tech yeah. has mining pools for many altcoins and you've touched on this a little just then in your response. And in 2019 added a Bitcoin mining pool. What were the main reasons for beginning with the altcoins? Um, you did say your, um, you collaborated with Saya to begin with. Um, yeah. Could you just elaborate a bit more on that? And why is Luxor Tech still classified as a mining pool rather than a farm? Sure. So uh, to touch on the first question, um, the Bitcoin code base is very complex and it's also very high consequence. So uh, when you're building, you know, anytime that you're building something uh, that's new technology, new engineering, you want to do it in some kind of a sandbox first. And the value of Bitcoin uh, that is transacted, that, that pools process, the hash rate that pools process is, is uh, very large, right? So. Uh, it made sense for the developers, for our founders, to start in the sandbox that is altcoin pools, a little bit more low, you know, low consequence, 
And then once all of our systems were kind of instantiated and had been battle tested and hardened, uh, that's when we kind of transitioned over into the Bitcoin side of things. And obviously that's now our core, uh, our core business. To the second question, so uh, I think a terminology clarification would be useful here. When you hear, and this is probably very useful for your audience as well, because you hear a lot about mining farms and mining pools, and some people kind of question what's the difference. Uh, when we talk about a mining farm, we're talking about a data center. So we're talking about a physical space, whether it's containerized uh, data centers and you know things that look like shipping containers, uh, or it's in large actual data centers like hard stand structures. Uh, that are holding the ASICs, which are the which are the computers that are actually doing the mining and the proof of work algorithm, uh, SHA-256. Uh, a mining pool, on the other hand, is really a software platform uh, that buys all of the hash rate from these mining farms, aggregates it, uh, and then mines it on the Bitcoin uh, on the network itself. Um, and we pay a we basically pay the miners for their hash rate, and we take a spread, which is how we generate revenue. Um, you know, a low percentage spread. The reason why mining pools were invented is because of something called luck risk, which is essentially uh, the chances of even the largest mining farms in the world now, and some of them have well over, you know, they have multiple exahash, they could go 30, 60, 90 days without ever finding a block, uh, and therefore without generating any revenue. And so it's a really tough thing to invest in a company that has such um, irregular revenue flows or cash flows and so what mining pools do is they smooth out uh, mining farms cash flows uh, by assuming a lot of that luck risk and we do that the way that we're able to do that is because we are so large that like luxury is four percent of the network hash rate right now and so we you know we find blocks and we're able to generate uh, revenue for our miners just very consistently with very little risk mm. Thank you so much for sharing your strategy with us. And if I understand correctly, miners pay fees to mine crypto. Would that be correct? Uh, they do. So uh, they're what's called pool fees. And so there are multiple different models of pool fees. And I'm just, I'll, I'll rattle off some acronyms here. And it, it can be, uh, you know, some, some research for later on. Um, the original was something called PPLNS or pay per last end share. Uh, and so the miner basically sells the hash rate to uh, the mining pool. And then when that mining pool finds a block under this model, that mining pool pays that miner back proportional to the overall pool hash rate. So if, for an easy example, if the mining pool has 10 petahash, the mining customer has one petahash that they're selling to the mining pool, that mining pool will pay them one-tenth of every block reward that they get, minus whatever the fee is. And typically it's between kind of one and 3% uh, of the total revenues generated. Mm. Our model uh, and most kind of newer pools um, that are operating in the space operate on what's called a full pay per share method, which is uh, if you're a miner and we are buying your hash rate from you, we are going to pay you the expected value of the block reward, which is the currently 6.25 Bitcoin per block, uh, one block every 10 minutes, and the expected value of what we think the transaction fees are going to be. Uh, so it allows the miner to participate in the upside of both the block reward and uh, the transaction fees associated with, um, with that block. If that, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, sure it, it does, but it definitely will open up uh, for our viewers and for me to do some more research on that. Yeah. So could you help us understand how the price of the crypto and the gas fees relate to the miners' earnings? And Bitcoin halving happens approximately every four years. And is this relevant to the hash rate of the other cryptos too? Yep, so uh, the way that... Bitcoin spot price affects mining revenues, um, and I'll and I'll talk in terms of Bitcoin specifically, just because it's you know the, the the most relevant one. But uh, this is generally true, um, more or less, for the other altcoins. Uh, in Bitcoin, so the mining revenue is determined by a combination of the Bitcoin spot price on the one hand and the network hash rate on the other hand. Um, if you hold uh, obviously, if you hold network hash rate, and when I, when I say network hash rate, I mean the amount of miners uh, that are actually connected and mining on the network. Um, if you hold that constant and the Bitcoin spot price increases, then revenues will increase. If you hold uh, the Bitcoin spot price constant and you increase the network hash rate, mining revenues will decrease because as the network hash rate increases, the difficulty of finding a block and the more energy that is required to be expended to find a block per miner increases as well, increasing the costs, the operational costs, or what we call OPEX, 
and therefore decreasing um, net revenues. Um, <clears throat> so your second question about how this affects uh, other cryptocurrencies, other proof of work cryptocurrencies, miners. There, there are other, there are other, Ethereum is obviously the most um, well known of the proof of work cryptocurrencies that are not Bitcoin. Um, most of your viewers are probably aware that they're trying to move to proof of stake. I am not aware of any strong correlation between, uh, that is directly related between the network hash rate on the Bitcoin network and the network hash rate on uh, the Ethereum network. What I would say is hash rate typically follows price. So as price increases, hash rate on Bitcoin will increase. Um, we also know that the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin are pretty highly correlated. So as Bitcoin pumps, Ethereum also pumps. And so by the transitive property, we would expect that as Bitcoin price increases, Ethereum price will increase. And as Ethereum price increases, the network hash rate on Ethereum will also increase as mining revenues, you know, as mining uh, profitability increases. The one thing that I would say that probably throws a wrench in that logic now is um, the, the uh, transition to proof of stake. So if they do a full transition to Ethereum 2.0, uh, that is, you know, they, they basically have the beacon chain now, and if they go fully live and they translate that over, obviously the mining question uh, is no longer relevant for ETH 2.0 whether Ethereum Classic and other uh, kind of forks of Ethereum continue to be mined is up in the air, but it, you know, it's not something I really can speculate on because I'm not, uh, not too keyed in on the Ethereum side. Yeah, fair enough. That's uh, quite exciting. They've been talking about this layer two uh, for quite some years now, so it'd be nice to see it actually eventuate and, and get some closure on that. So, or maybe open, it'll, it'll open up so many doors. It's like a rabbit hole, isn't it, crypto, when you work out one puzzle it leads to another it's, it's such an exciting space so Luxatech developed mid-year crypto mining stock index so mid this year I remember reporting on it a crypto mining stock index and which is a basket of over 50 mining or mining adjacent equities um, sounds yep. similar to the new ETFs that people are talking about can this index mm -hmm. and the hash rate index be utilized to maximize profits from crypto trading uh, certainly. So the, the index, yes, like if you're looking to buy, uh, if you're looking to get uh, proxy exposure to cryptocurrencies, um, and the one that I'll talk about, the one that I'm most, most familiar with, like the example would be RIGS. Uh, so the Verity Funds Cleaner Crypto Mining um, ETF. It's basically just a basket of publicly traded mining companies, um, chip manufacturers, etc. people who are in uh, that industry. If you're looking to get uh, exposure through a proxy to crypto, th these are good vessels uh, to go with. The Bitcoin ETFs, um, th they're all gonna be good. You can put them in traditional retirement accounts, uh, institutions that have risk management departments that haven't fully wrapped their heads around crypto, um, the, the issues of custody in crypto, uh, the, you know, the kind of different counterparty risk profile. Uh, these are great, these are great opportunities. There's um, you know, a lot of alpha to be made, especially right now. Like we have a thesis that mining stocks are going to continue to appreciate um, and beat a lot of other market segments. And I should say not not financial advice here, but yeah. uh, just because of how profitable mining is going to be um, over the next few years and, uh, you know, how correlated the stock price of these things is going to be. It's a lot of the other part of this is that particularly, and again, I'll speak directly to mining companies because it's where I'm most, um, I think I'm most qualified to talk. These mining companies, the analysts that are that are doing um, the valuations on these mining companies are getting much more nuanced in how they uh, execute their valuation modeling. And so they're getting much more savvy on understanding um, operational efficiency. Uh, and so they're, they're actually going to these farms. They're looking at what type of cooling they have, what type of uh, airflow management they have, what type of electrical engineering they have, what type of security they have. How old are their miners? You know, how often are they flipping their ASIC portfolio? Um, and they're looking at things like how much Bitcoin do they have on their balance sheet? And so, they're, so where before it was really just a question of like raw hash rate was kind of the valuation metric for these mining companies. Now you're seeing analysts that are taking a much more nuanced approach. And so the valuations are going to become much more, I think, accurate. Um, and as mining profitability increases, it's going to become, uh, you know, they're going to be really high alpha stocks. On the, um, you know, 
on the other side of the investing coin, my personal opinion um, is that like most of my most of the things that I talk about with friends and family in terms of they're always asking how do we invest, um, I tell them to invest in the in the actual cryptocurrencies and and like mine is mostly Bitcoin and um, I would encourage them to hold their own keys. So these public market uh, you, you know instruments are very useful. I have them in my IRA. I, you know a, a lot of people use them for interesting things, but a lot of like hardcore Bitcoiners also just want to hold their own keys, and that that requires uh, self custody. Thank you. I, I guess it's just an indicator and it helps you to give a, an overall picture of what's going on. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so GPU yeah. supply chain crunch is causing waves for many industries. Do you see this having impact or an, any impact on your mining pools operations? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's not just it's not just GPUs. It's uh, it's silicon wafers in general. It's everything that goes into making um, all the computers. So GPUs are kind of one subset. A6 is a an entirely different chip, but it's still made out of silicon. Um, it's and it's not just uh, chip shortages either. So um, it's obviously very germane to uh, this conversation, uh, but it's also it's affecting everything, right? It's affecting used car. Like used cars are selling more than new new cars because the supply chains are so uh, are so disrupted along everything. So it's chips, it's steel. Another long lead item that is really um, complicating the build out of mining facilities, especially in North America, is uh, transformers. So like all the steel, the copper, everything that goes into building both the large scale transformers that do the kind of high voltage to medium voltage step down transformation and the low voltage, like the 415, 240 transformers that do the mid to low voltage transformation, we're seeing backups of um, you know close to 40 weeks in some cases for the low voltage stuff and out up to a year for the high voltage kind of substation level. Uh, all of this is having a profound effect on um, lead times for building out and deploying mining farms. And so it's partly why uh, mining is so profitable right now because the people that are up and hashing and already have their farms built out and they're producing hash rate are reaping outsized benefits while the people who are trying to enter into the space are being challenged with these uh, supply chain constraints, um, both on the chip side, which is what you mentioned, which is which is prohibiting uh, you know mass production of ASICs to, to satisfy demand, but also on the more traditional infrastructure side as well. I mean, even containers, the steel for containers um, is backed up and then you start to incorporate all the shipping challenges, like the Port of Long Beach looks like, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of ships um, stacked up outside of the Port of Long Beach waiting to get in and access to the crane. So it's just kind of, it's soup to nuts on the on the supply chain that are, that are creating challenges for Bitcoin mining. Oh, well, I hope um, President Biden's infrastructure plan, I think he's got a bill that wants to start local manufacturing of chips. Is that correct? The infrastructure bill or one of his bills has mentioned that in the past. Hopefully he can find a solution to this um, demand. Yeah, so, I don't know how much of it would be him finding a solution. I know you got an agenda. Go ahead. I, it, we'll see. I think it's probably going to come from, a, from a, the market will help to fix this. I'm not sure how much the uh, infrastructure bill is going to do for that. But. Cool. Thank you so much. And we have to start winding up now. I uh, wish we had longer to um, share your insights with our viewers. But crypto mining is often criticized for its energy consumption. And we've heard of people like the Cardano Foundation pledging to plant millions of trees to help combat their uh, yeah. energy consumption. Is Luxatech doing anything to minimize their carbon footprint that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll say two things here. One, I mean, we uh, offset with renewable energy credits. And so um, having got, kind of dived down the rabbit hole of offsets versus recs, like we really think that um, proof of work mining, Bitcoin mining is as a function of its high energy demand and also its ability to be uh, interrupted, meaning shut down on and off, uh, you know, on demand and its ability to consume stranded assets that are far away from uh, loads. So essentially like in the middle of Iceland, they're producing Bitcoin off of geothermal energy that would not be able to be brought to market anywhere else. We think that all of this is really leading to a scenario where Bitcoin kind of accelerates the transition to a renewable energy infrastructure, um, kind of in the medium term. And so in the short term, we actually offset with renewable energy credits uh, because those renewable energy credits go directly into existing uh, renewable energy production facilities or power generation facilities. Uh, which is really what we want to get after. And there's a, a whole kind of 
there's a murky underbelly of global carbon offsets. Um, you know, there's a lot of scandals where, I mean, the, Card the Cardano uh, Foundation may be planting a lot of trees or they may be getting scammed um, and thinking they're planting a lot of trees, but they're not. So we tend to like to uh, subsidize the actual energy generation. But yeah, we're very aware of that, um, very cognizant of it, and very bullish actually that Bitcoin helps to really accelerate the transition to renewable energies. Great. Well, thank you so much. And technological developments are helping so many other sectors and industries to become more energy efficient and find breakthroughs. So hopefully further developments in the technology will help the crypto sector too. Um, Alex, was there any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Thank you so much for your insights today. No, I really appreciate it. This is fun. Um, you know, it's, it's fun to uh, kind of have discussions like this outside of just the North American market, which is where we're predominantly um, engaged. And so if anyone, I'll, I'll do a little shameless plug here. If anyone is interested in, uh, in building a mining farm uh, or getting involved in the space, we're happy to have a discussion. I'm on Twitter, Telegram, Discord, all that stuff. So feel free to reach out. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that opportunity. And thanks again for making time to share your insights on Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Your time is appreciated. And if thanks you just so joined much, us, sir. we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Alex Bremer, the VP of Business Development at Luxor Tech. And the full interview will be available for viewing via YouTube at Calkine Media. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is going to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Jacobs with you for Calkine. In this segment, we're exploring all you need to know about Nexo Crypto. Before we dive in, hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen. Nexo is primarily a lending platform that offers users instant crypto backed loans for quick access to cash and support for maintaining digital assets. The users can deposit leading tokens as collateral to receive an instant loan in the form of cash or stablecoin. Backed by its native token, Nexo, it allows users to get discounts on the interest accumulated on the existing loans. It also provides an opportunity to receive interest payments against the accumulated funds. Nexo Crypto's rise seems to be on the back of its Metaverse announcement on 7th of February. Anthony Trenchev, co-founder and managing partner of Nexo, suggested that it aims to create a whole new economy with crypto as its main currency through its Metaverse plans. Nexo has been performing well over the past two weeks, registering gains of 24.2% and 10.3% in the last 14 days. Launched in April of 2018, it targets to solve the issues related to the lending market and can offer smart contracts and Ethereum-backed loans as an automated lending process. When users deposit a certain amount to repay the loan, Nexo's blockchain returns the cryptocurrency, thereby keeping track of the transactions. Nexo maintains the database of the clients who continue to use the platform and provides royalty for its its loyal followers. So Nexo's loyal customers automatically form a part of its loyalty program where they can access 30% of its profits in the form of dividends. Nexo investors will be happy to see its bullish run come back and hope that the rally lasts for a longer period. Investors can take heart because Metaverse plans are getting good traction with the participants and the future looks promising. But that's it for this topic. Head to the website for more, calkindmedia.com, and make sure you do like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you for joining me. Uh, 
As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Australian EV startup Tritium is set to build a new production plant in the US in the coming months. And thanks for tuning in, I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calkine Media. Tritium's new plant is to be established in Tennessee and will produce approximately a 30,000 electric vehicle fast charges a year. It's been estimated that it'll also create roughly 600 local jobs. So what's been the major reasons behind Tritium's expansion into the US and how is the position for future growth? Well, Tritium CEO Jane Hunt appeared beside US President Joe Biden at the White House recently. She discussed the company's expansion plans in the US and according to Hunt, the e-mobility facilitator's shift to the country is a direct result of Biden's electric vehicle policies. The administration is expected to announce a statewide allocation of five billion US dollars in funding for EV charges. So that certainly has served as an incentive for the Australian company to take the leap. Tritium also has seen an uptick in demand for its charges in North America, and this is one of the main reasons why the manufacturer returned to the US. Tritium's Tennessee factory is to begin production by the third quarter of 2022, and in the next five years, the new plant is anticipated to create over 500 or 600 jobs, perhaps in the region. Hunt also added that the Australian market, where the electric cars represent only 1.9% of light vehicles, is lagging behind other developed nations. She believes that the government should frame policies aimed at boosting EV take-up rather than simply offering parking spaces. While Tritium's upper management seems disappointed with Australia's policies, the Morrison government welcomed 
their continental move, noting that it was also supporting EV charging infrastructure in Australia. And as the Australian startup announced its expansion plans in the US, its shares closed 39.47% higher shortly after. Even President Biden celebrated this decision, lauding it as a great news for the American workers as well as for the planet. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Calcai Media. With the crypto market beginning to re-emerge from a prolonged dull phase, investors are returning to the market and are looking for big gains. The majority of the attention will be on some of the biggest market cap projects, Bitcoin, Ethereum and BNB. So in this video, we'll take a look at these projects and how things might pan out moving forward. Just before we do though, please subscribe and of course click that bell icon. Now, Bitcoin is gradually creeping back. Having hovered around the 68,000 US dollar mark around three months ago, it dipped to just $29,000 on January 1. But it's now hovering about the 40K mark per coin and has found stable footing at this price, indicating that it could be set for another surge. Currently, Bitcoin has a share of almost 42% in the total market cap of all cryptos tracked by coin market cap. This is no mean feat when we know that coin market cap tracks more than 17,000 different crypto assets. Bitcoin's market cap is nearly US $830 billion at this point in time. El Salvador's experiment of Bitcoin as legal tender, India's move to tax cryptocurrency investments instead of outlawing them, and the launch of Bitcoin ETFs and other similar events might decide the price trajectory in the days to come. If the crypto market stays bullish, Bitcoin could well reach $55,000 US dollars by the end of the first half of 2022. Ethereum, the world's second largest crypto project, is, for the uninitiated, a popular blockchain network with support for new tokens and NFTs. Ethereum accounts for an 18% share of the total market cap of the crypto space. That equates to nearly $380 billion US dollars. Now, Ethereum faces fierce competition in smart contracts from new players like Solana and Phantom. But with wider adoption of DeFi and NFTs and Ethereum's shift to a new consensus mechanism, demand for the Ether token may also rise. By the end of the first half of this year, Ether could well touch $4,000 US dollars apiece. But for this to happen, it has to maintain that edge over other networks. And lastly, Binance Coin ranks as the fourth largest crypto by market cap, accumulating for nearly $70 billion. It ranks just below Tether, which is a stable coin. In other words, a coin that is not designed for investing, but instead is pegged to the US dollar. One Tether equates to $1. Binance Coin is a wide-ranging project with a blockchain network and a cryptocurrency exchange. BNB faces competition from other DeFi projects that have bet on decentralized exchanges, which help earn revenues without liquidating the crypto asset. BNB may touch $600 by the end of June 2022 if the wider crypto world remains bullish. Now, unfortunately, there is little assurance on where prices may hover as crypto remains inherently volatile. But if the momentum sustains, a very strong 2022 could be in store for the coins mentioned in this video and much of the remaining market will follow their lead. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to check out the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. Cryptocurrencies always find a reason to hear the headlines thanks to a flurry of fresh developments frequently stirring up the crypto space. With cryptocurrencies getting more mainstream by the day, using crypto to pay for products and services is becoming more and more popular. Many corporations across all types of industries are adopting cryptocurrencies and allowing consumers to pay for their products and services with them. 
Here are five such companies taking crypto. Overstock is a technology-driven online retailer based in the US. Overstock has grown from a fledgling firm to a multi-billion dollar internet retailer since its inception in 1999. Overstock began taking Bitcoin as payment in 2014, making it the first major US retailer to accept digital currency as a medium of payment. Bitcoin is a digital coin that enables secure and speedy online payments. Overstock has collaborated with Coinbase, a cryptocurrency exchange that allows its clients to trade in cryptocurrencies. Overstock also struck a partnership with Shapeshift, a cryptocurrency exchange back in 2017. Shapeshift enables consumers to purchase online from Overstock's almost 4 million products, including DIY, furniture, rugs, accessories, bedding and the like, using all the major cryptos such as Monero, Ethereum, Dash, Litecoin, for example. Next up is Travala. Since its inception in 2017, Travala has evolved from a small startup to become the world's premier blockchain-based travel booking platform. The company uses tokenized incentives and next-generation blockchain technologies to book travel. They offer a variety of cryptocurrency and traditional payment alternatives, as well as an innovative user experience. Travala is quickly shot to prominence as a leading crypto-friendly hotel booking platform, which accepts a variety of cryptos. Next, in 2014, tech giant Microsoft began accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for purchasing games, applications, and other digital content from Xbox, video stores, Windows, Xbox games, and Windows Phone. Microsoft also announced the launch of ION in 2021 with the help feed crypto growth. ION is a permissionless public and open layer 2 decentralized identifier network built on Bitcoin's blockchain. And customers in the United States who have premier and personal PayPal accounts now have an opportunity to use their cryptocurrency holdings to pay for certain purchases with millions of online companies. PayPal does not charge for storing cryptocurrency in the account, but there is a transaction fee that users need to pay while selling and purchasing cryptos. And coffee retail chain operator Starbucks announced in 2021 that consumers would be able to pay for their coffee in cryptos via the Backed app, which converts Bitcoin into US dollars. The Backed app is a platform that combines Bitcoin and other forms of digital assets. Whether converting participant rewards points to cash or paying with Bitcoin, customers can do it all using one simple app. Apart from the companies listed above, many other firms such as AT&T, Twitch, Newegg and AirBaltic also accept cryptos as a form of payment for their products. It'll be interesting to see who else jumps on the crypto bandwagon. So what do you think about paying with crypto? You can leave a comment here. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calchi Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organized by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Scott Pendlebury. Now Scott is the founding director of high growth online retailer, the Renovator Store. The Renovator Store is a purely online retailer of building fixtures. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Scott, and welcome to Calkine. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, Rachel. It's nice to be here. Good to speak with you today. Now, first up, Scott, could I get you to tell us more about the Renovator Store and how it helps being online? Sure. We're, we're a renovation product store, and as most people can appreciate, uh, any homeowner that's looking to improve their store is very focused on the products that fit out their home, um, and that's exactly what we, we stock and offer online. Uh, we've chosen to be purely online because that uh, allows us to sell at a much more reasonable price than, than a showroom model. Now, the pandemic has helped influence more house renovation choices across Australia, mainly with people being at home a lot more than they have been in the past. Have you seen this growth in your business? On the retail side, definitely. I think uh, homeowners being at home, uh, uh, undertaking a lot of DIY projects. So we're seeing a lot of products uh, go to improve kitchens and bathrooms, uh, even flooring and LED lighting. Um, on the wholesale side, I think it's the opposite. There's been a lot of projects put on ice. Uh, so larger builders and projects, uh, you know, have, have stopped their purchases for the time being. Now, getting a dream home isn't easy, is it? So what tips do you have on creating a dream home? And what are the best renovation products available to help you achieve that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and, and we talk to customers all the time about this. Uh, you know, at the core of getting what homeowners really want is is budget. Uh, as you can appreciate, Australia is an expensive place to to buy and to renovate a home. Um, so anything you can do to extend your budget uh, is going to help you reach that dream and fit out the home. To, to the standards that you want. So um, that's why we, we pursued an online model and it's important that we keep our prices low so that people can really get you know, the luxury end of the products when they're fitting out their bathroom or kitchen or whatever room it is. So I think um, extending that budget is the main, main point. And, and some of the popular products you know, to enhance your kitchen and your bathroom, for instance, uh, some of the really innovative storage items. Uh, Pull-out pantries is probably one of our main products. Um, people are really appreciating the fact that they can uh, utilize their spaces in their kitchen fully uh, with an easy to pull out pantry. And that's, that's just one way that they're getting their dream kitchen. <coughs> So yeah, you mentioned there some of the popular renovation trends and products. What are your best sellers? Or what would you recommend to someone when they first take steps to renovate their home? There's some pretty obvious trends at the moment. I think, um, you know, like any uh, any renovation product store, we're seeing a lot of trends in sort of bathroom tapware and towel rails. But some of the more interesting ones are uh, pull-out bins. I think people really appreciate the fact they can hide away their bin now in, in a nice, neat uh, kitchen, underbench kitchen bin. Um, heated towel rails seem to have really gone up in, in sales. So I think people appreciate the luxury of a, a nice, warm, fluffy towel in the morning with their heated towel rail. And as I said, full out pantries uh, have been big. So uh, if you've got one of those pantries or even you know a corner cupboard, where you're reaching to the back and, and finding that, you know, items that are well out of their use by date, uh, that's when that's when you're considering a pull-out pantry or a magic corner. Um, and they've really shot up in sales during this, this pandemic period. 
Sounds like a great idea for storage. Now, customer service is obviously very important in any business. What are the strategies you implement at the Renovator Store to ensure optimum customer support? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because because we're online, um, we've got to really focus on customer service uh, with the products that we sell. There's typically a lot of questions pre-purchase and we operate a, a call center here that allows customers to ring and ask questions about the products that we um, we sell. So they might have questions about installation, certification, and then and post sale as well. Um, it's important that people can get support during that installation phase, and if they've got any issues with products and, and care uh, down down the track. So uh, we make sure we've got a, a large team that's that's very knowledgeable on the products. The customer service is also on the screen. We, um, you know, we have a live chat, and we make sure all the products got a lot of information on the screen, so that you know, if someone's shopping on their couch at nine o'clock at night, they can make a purchase decision uh, confidently, and know that the product's likely to meet their needs. And the Renovator Store supports the charity Ladder. What can you tell us about this, and how important it is for your company? Yes, we're, we're very proud to be a supporter of Ladder. They uh, are a charity uh, that many people might have seen are supported by the AFL. Um, they, they basically tackle homelessness uh, in the teenage community and disadvantaged youth. Um, so we're very proud to help those, help the charity that helps that, that sector. And, um, you know, whilst our customers are lucky to have a home and, and, and uh, be, be improving it, there are Unfortunately, uh, a lot of youth out there that um, are in a different situation and don't have a home. So we we get one dollar from every sale and donate that to Ladder. And it, whilst it sounds like a small amount, it quickly adds up, um, and we're a proud supporter. Absolutely, that sounds extremely charitable and such a great idea. Um, meshing home renovation and helping people that are homeless and don't have a home. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today, Scott. It's been great to have your time. Thanks, Rachel. Have a good day. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calcoin TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest business insights. 
Today we're joined by Mr. Hans Schwedler, the director and co-founder of Wellness Gift Box. Welcome to the show, Hans. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate being on Calcon TV. No, thank you for it. It's great to have you on. Now, first of all, being industrious and innovative is key when it comes to wellness and its related products. So what can you tell us about your innovative strategies? Well, I think the thing is I need to discuss what wellness is. It can be different to everyone, any people, most people. I think wellness is a holistic um, integration of physical and uh, mental and spiritual well-being, fueling the body, engaging the mind and nurturing the spirit. Also, I'd like to discuss how we actually came up with wellness uh, gift box. Well, the idea originated while I was bike riding by myself one morning during the severe lockdowns in the 12 local government areas in Sydney, which has been quite uh, hard at times for many people. I'd made a habit of saying good morning to everyone I passed. I could gauge the mental health uh, of the people from the sponsors I received, which varied widely. And I thought to myself, I thought people needed to some sort of pick me up. For, and I thought to myself, okay, mental health first aid kit. Okay, and a friend just rang me just at that time. And I suggested the idea of a mental health first aid kit to him. And he, we started kicking it around and we came up with the idea and refined it to a wellness uh, gift box. If you're not feeling whether well, whether physically or mentally or spiritually, it's hard to pick yourself up. Through my experience um, running laughter clubs and working with uh, different people in mental health, you need something to pick you up. And we thought, geez, this is a great way to start the wellness uh, gift box. Right. It's really interesting that you compare it to a mental health first aid kit, I believe, was it? Yes. Yeah. It, because I've done the first aid, mental health first aid course, and it's quite an interesting course, and it's just, you need to pick me up, and a lot of emotions in it. We talk about happiness. Happiness is an emotion. You need to have inner joy, and that's why we came up with the wellness gift box. It's just lifting emotions, building the joy. And I think that helps people through. Right. So in your opinion, wellness as a concept is very much related to mental health and it's very holistic in nature as well. And is that why it's sort of connected to the physical body, would you say? Oh, definitely. Look, um, I think there's been many studies being uh, done and they believe most of the illnesses that come through emotional being. And I think if you lift people's emotions and look after them in that way, it helps with their holistic health, which is the mental, physical and spiritual health. Right, I couldn't agree more. Very well said there. Now, speaking of holistic and mental wellness, what, what are the kinds of products that you believe boost mental and physical energy? Well, one of the products with in our wellness gift box is Koala Karma. What? What I love about it, it's an Australian-made drink and it combines the lasting effect of calm mind and a relaxed, relaxed body to support the consumption of energy products. It doesn't, it's designed for a busy lifestyle without caffeine or sugar rush, which helps your in, boost your energy. It consists of passion flower, tryptophan, hops. There are a good side of value out of hops, not just alcoholic, and chamomile, we all know what chamomile is, it's just a, it's a beautiful relaxing drink, and also magnesium, which is great for your body or or your muscles, etc. Another, some of the other products I, we recommend and we organise, uh, dark chocolate, it's just cocoa, and it, it has the sources of antioxidants, we have nuts. Nuts are hot, good in good fat, low in carbs, great source of nutrients, including vitamin E, magnesium, selenium, and it helps 
helps health in many different ways. One of the good products, and it's been around for a long time, is fermented products such as sauerkraut, kefir, buttermilk, raw yogurt. And one of the things that we make sure that most uh, gift boxes are kombucha, helps your digestion, it rids the body of toxins, boosts your energy. It's also said to boost your immune system and helps you lose weight and helps you with high blood pressure. Collagen, just it's just part of your body and that just helps you the framework, the structural framework. Now herbal teas are absolutely amazing. What can you say about them? It's, it helps uh, they have vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, uh, helps to fight colds, improves the boosts immune, reduces inflammation, anti-aging, relieves stress and anxiety. And they're, they're the sort of a start of some of our products, but we're looking always looking for something else that we can put in. And it just in a little in a box and it's so exciting for people to receive and just one of the examples of um, we received uh, just recently from a lady that received a box um, sent by her family and she had fun opening the box but it, the best thing was when she opened it the children enjoyed going through the box and all the little bits and pieces and and the extent of that for her would have improved her day too so it's not only just the products, it's just the, the belonging. You know, people need a uh, feeling of belonging, care, get some products, and it's so exciting and to be thought of. Right, absolutely. So it's definitely the whole experience there, would you say? It's more than just uh, products. It's just the emotional feel and that's it's mystic and that's what we're looking at right and obviously a lot of the products you mentioned as well especially kombucha for instance are actually very trendy at the moment and have been trending of Correct. late so it's obviously showing that people are more concerned about their health and uh, turning to these wellness related products oh definitely i think that's the way it's going i think <laughs> But then, and it, it's been amazing that the sort of, if you have a look at, uh, you can get everything delivered. You know, we see the BWS ads, you know, you can get alcohol delivered an hour. And uh, we've got all these delivery, menu log, uh, DoorDash, delivering all the fast food. But then on the other side, I just, it was interesting to notice HelloFresh, um, uh, Marley Spoon, Diddly, uh, pepper spoon, every plate. These are uh, companies that sell uh, food box deliveries and it's proportioned to the size for say two people or four people and people are learning to cook and doing more cooking at home and enjoying cooking and making those meals. So it's a combination of both and um, I'm hoping and we're hoping to encourage more sort of healthy wellness type of uh, foods, products that, um, and that lift people's spirits consistently. Well, that'll be really good to see. And now just before you wrap up, do you have any tips for our viewers on how people can enhance their overall well-being? Oh, there's a, quite a lot of things like sleep is one of the best ones, isn't it? Um, how do you feel when you don't get a good night's sleep? You make poor decisions, don't you? Um, it, you know, like a good sleep helps reduces your stress, reduces uh, inflammation, uh, helps with your balance. And one of the biggest things is it actually heals your body. And um, you need that sleep. It's such an important uh, and so, it's so important that you need to get a good sleep and be consistent with it. And uh, I think that's one of the things that not much I haven't participated, in, but a lot of people, because they've been going through the pandemic and um, so they're in lockdown, they may work from home, so they they start to uh, uh, get up at watch TV longer, Netflix, eat a little bit more, go to bed later so they get up later. So it's just a, 
a cycle, a vicious cycle, if you're not uh, careful of it. And you need to be able to control that by just looking after your sleep. Nutrition, it's a give me, you know, balanced meal. So a lot of people think they've got to become like Jane Fonda or, or you know, sort of other muscle men and all that. But exercise can consist of just gardening, just having a kick around with the ball with the children, walking to the park, um, just using all the facilities at the park. It could be dancing, yoga, it could be anything. That's amazing what exercise it could be playing a musical instrument or just build something. You may want to just build something with the children. Sunshine, that's the give me. Mindfulness, kindness, and the important. Just share the kindness and share it with everyone. Just a smile. I know it's hard. It's hard with your face mask, but you can still smile with your eyes. And I think that's such an important thing that people. And the, the one that sort of surprises me more that it's respect. And when I go into some of the shops, you see signs, please respect our staff. And I think that's the important thing we need to do for all people. Just respect in these tough times at the moment. Right. Really well said there. I think we can't downplay the importance of those things, especially sleep, exercise, the need for vitamin D, and um, obviously respectful human contact. Those things are very key to health and wellness as well. So on that note, it is just about time for us to wrap up, but I've got to say thanks yes. so much for joining our show and sharing your insights with us. Thank you. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks, the show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. Today we're thrilled to be joined by the BNPL market leaders of Zipco to shed some light on the space for us. Please welcome Dr. Tommy Memmelstein, Chief Strategy Officer. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, and have a great day, and thanks for, for having me today. Well, welcome to the show. Now, first of all, a congratulations is in order for your exceptional uh, financial year 21 results and a transformational 12-month period. Has it been all smooth sailing for Zipco? Uh, you know, the business has been around for eight years. I've been with the business for five, and it feels like we're, we're just getting started. It has been a, a massive year for us over the last 12 months, well over... 100% year-over-year growth. We've done a number of acquisition and organic new market entries, you know, Middle East, 
We recently announced South Africa and an investment in India um, took, took the keys of the U.S. business and rebranded them from QuadPay to Zip. And all in the time of COVID, you know, through Zoom and, and distributed teams. So it's been a very busy 12 months, um, but we're very excited about the, the next 12 months as well. And that's incredible to hear. So would you say that COVID has been more of an opportunity rather than a speed bump for you? I think we've been, um, you know, besides for the human toll and, you know, a huge amount of mental health issues and um, there's been significant economic um, sort of costs. Net, net though, Zip as a business has been a beneficiary. And I think that's because one is we're a technology business and we've always had the ability to work remotely with distributed teams. Um, I think it's fundamentally changed how consumers um, transact and make purchases. So the growth of e-commerce where the lion's share of our business, in particular in markets like the US has been growing uh, very strong. And then, you know, the government support has helped, um, you know, the consumer. So, you know, savings rates, and um, you know the, the repayment profiles of our customers are looking extremely healthy. Um, so net net, we've probably done okay out of it. Um, but it is a challenge, you know, uh, working from home, lockdowns, all, all, all the stress that comes from us, and then you have to continue to sort of make sure your your credit models are, are appropriately timed as stimulus potentially comes off and things are, are rapidly evolving. Well, I don't doubt that. And it's uh, safe to say that it seems like you've come out on top with that. So that's very good indeed. Now, you mentioned your expansion to international markets. So just to touch on your recent strategic investment in that Zest Money, the BNPL player, how would you say this bolsters Zipco's global presence? So we, we see a truly um, an opportunity to create a global powerhouse. Um, and there are very few players right now that can offer up the number of markets and the diversity of markets, both across developed and emerging markets, uh, that's similar to Zip's footprint. And that's because we think the opportunity is, is massive as consumers, not only in countries like Australia and the US, move to point of sale finance and interest free installments, but in emerging markets like India, where affordability is a real challenge, access to traditional credit with like bureau files, um, you know, it, it is truly challenging. And, it, you know, if you take a step back and you look at India as a market, it has very strong payment infrastructure with UPI. It's got a very large and growing middle class and consumerism is, is on the up. Um, E-commerce growth is, you know, one of the fastest growing e-commerce markets globally. So the size of the prize there is, is very large. Um, and if it felt like when we think about our global aspirations and our mission and our purpose, it's in a market that over time we definitely want to have a footprint in. It made sense to back a local team. So we did a lot of work. Um, who are the players locally? What is the market going to look like over the coming years? What are the different product offerings and the regulatory requirements to actually have an installment offering? Um, we've been quite friendly with the Zest Money team for some time. It's nice that their name starts with a Z, a Z as well. Um, and so we've been following their story and it, you know, uh, we're, we're very excited to partner with them. Uh, Peter Gray, our, our, one of our co-founders, will be joining their board and we think we have a lot of value to deliver to them and vice versa. Um, you know, we're learning, continuing to learn about the market. Uh, it, it's very exciting. We think some of the learnings that we have uh, will be very relevant for them. But ultimately, we're also seeing a lot of latent demand in our merchant network for um, exposure to emerging markets, and India is, is up there on the list. So, you know, just after the announcement, the number of inbound from merchants and also payment processors and PSP and other types of partners around, can we also look at expanding the relationship to India is, is already um, coming through. That's great to hear. It sounds like a very promising partnership indeed. Now, you mentioned as well your expansion to the South African market, I believe. Could you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So um, there's a the number one player in South Africa is a business called Payflex. When we acquired PartPay more than three years ago, it actually came with an equity interest in Payflex, and we got to know that business um, over the last three years. So our day one, once we acquire a business, looks very different when you've, when you've known the founding team and you've been sharing insights and technology for the, for the last three years. Um, and a, a number of weeks ago, we announced the, the, the full acquisition of that business. 
uh, it just made sense to bring it in house right now. Um, we're looking forward to completing that transaction over the coming months and welcoming the Border Payflex team into the business. They are clearly the market leader. And one of the things we really like about that business is the alignment of culture. And it's actually one of the markets that has the lowest um, bad debt rates. So the, the, their unique decisioning technology very much aligned with us around the ethos of financial responsibility. Their product set is quite interesting. And um, it's another important addition to the broader group. That's incredible. It sounds like it's a, a very good match for you indeed, a match made in heaven there. Are there any other, uh, other sorry, international markets that pique your interest? Well, we have a... Um, uh, we announced also the entry into the Middle East, the, the GCC region, through the acquisition of Spotty. Um, that again, e-commerce, you know, double-digit e-commerce growth, a very strong founding team, the coalition of founders, and we've been doing a lot of work with the broader platform in the region, um, and we'll have some exciting news around that opportunity in due course, seeing very strong growth there, um, starting to make uh, expansion plans into the, the EU, um, again, off the back of the Twisto investment. And recently we launched in Mexico and Canada organically. And it's really the ability to offer all those markets through a single integration and a single merchant interface. That is, that is you know, the merchant promise. Um, and that's what we're delivering to market. And we recently announced, you know, a very large retail in the likes of Sheen. Uh, and what we've been able to do and, and negotiate with them is to launch across all 12 markets through that single integration point. Um, and that's re really an amazing outcome for both our, our business, but also the merchant to be able to service them and support them across all those different regions. Absolutely, yes. and uh, Sheen is incredibly popular at the moment and will likely continue to be, but it seems like you've got a really strong reach on virtually every continent on earth. So that's great to hear on your end. Yeah, I think we've been very thoughtful. Um, you know, the, the focus is still the core markets and the majority of our capital and our focus does go to the U.S. and, and to ANZ where we have a, a very large and substantial business. Our view is the cost to these markets will only increase over time. Um, the ability to find the right founding teams and boots on the ground. And because we have this truly global platform that we can over time re-platform these businesses and, for, and at different speeds um, really is part of our competitive advantages when we think of what differentiates us from our, our global peers. And if we just fast forward over the next two to three years, we think you know these, these businesses, these new operations will deliver substantial free cash flows and ultimately enterprise value and, and shareholder returns. All right, definitely. Very well said there. And speaking of competition, it's actually obviously no surprise that the BNPL space has had very heated competition in recent months, which I'm sure you're aware of. And uh, Zipco founder has officially welcomed this, Peter Gray. Would you say, considering this, that the competition has proven itself to be to the company's benefit thus far? I think competition is healthy. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing how much headlines buy now, pay later grabs, given how small we still are in the grand scheme of things, you know, in terms of the amount of uh, payment processing we do versus traditional credit cards and, and the likes. But I think what's happened is there's been a recognition of what the longer term opportunity is as consumers globally shift away from old school credit products and into simple interest free installments. And, you know, Players like PayPal and some of the others that you know are, are starting to move into the space. I think they help demonstrate that you know the opportunity is large, um, and we're all uh, we're all able to enjoy the growth of the addressable market as it continues to expand. I think for Zip, it also opens up a range of new strategic partnerships. So players that probably have discounted the space in the past are finally waking up and thinking about you know buy build partner and looking at partnership opportunities with market leaders, uh, and there's only a handful of them out there. So we, we do see a, a number of really exciting partnerships evolving, given the competition and the excitement within the space. Well, that's certainly good to hear and like, uh, sounding like it'll work in your favor, definitely in the long run as well. Now, I we know that uh, you have several exciting new developments in the works of Zipco. What can you tell us about the rationale behind, for example, the move to offer physical cards and crypto payments? For sure. So I guess, um, you know, our broader strategy is we're longer term, you know, developing a broader 
digital wallet and payment offerings. What we're trying to do is address the consumer's pain points around payments. And if you think about our, our, our mission to be the first payment choice everywhere and every day, it really speaks to a much broader offering and developing this deep engagement with our customer base. So through the trusted relationship around credit, we can move into other adjacent services. In the US, for example, though, you know, you know, paying with uh, mobile wallets and, and phones, Apple Pay and Google Pay isn't as prevalent given the, the physical card readers just don't, don't enable that and consumers haven't nearly adopted the tap and go mentality that we have here in Australia. So the physical card in the US will be really important as we continue to sort of take advantage of the in-store opportunity, which is really large and underdeveloped in the market like the US. So physical card in the US is, is very high priority for us. We did a pilot and we had some very strong uptake and increase in transaction frequency. Um, and just having the physical card in a wallet gives you sort of that mind share, where in Australia that's, that's clearly not required. So, so that's a, a very exciting initiative for the US in particular. And then uh, more generally, when you start thinking about crypto and rewards, again, it's about building out the use cases. And we speak to our customers to try to understand what they're looking for and what they're looking for from Zip specifically and what we have the right to play in. And crypto, again, is a natural extension um, where customers are looking to to get in and you know, we, we, we can enable that through some of the rewards offerings and some of the broader digital wallet capabilities. And that's another uh, feature set we look to launch first in the US, um, but then look at other markets where it's uh, applicable as well. Well, that's really good to hear. It sounds like you're definitely staying on top of the game and evolving with the times there, especially with the introduction of the crypto payments. Um, but I actually took a guess that the introduction of physical cards was something that would definitely benefit the older range of your consumers who are definitely used to that, that kind of medium. Is that the case? Um, it's it really starting in the U.S. not necessarily going to help us target a different age demographic. It's more about that in-store opportunity. Um, and in reality, just there are many places in the U.S. where you can pay with Apple Pay or Google. It's just the, the card readers aren't as advanced. And consumers haven't, even the younger demographics, just haven't adopted uh, the digital wall of payments as fast as we have in, in some markets like like. Australia or even Southeast Asia. So that was the primary primary sort of driver behind that. Um, but it all speaks to the longer term strategy. We're trying to develop a very strong, uh, uh, deeper payments experience and, and the increased engagement with our customer base. So other payment use cases, and again, physical card in some markets is, is a relevant uh, requirement. All right, certainly very interesting and important to have that variety there as well in terms of payment options. Now just before we wrap up, what can you tell us about what's on the horizon for Zipco in the near term and potentially do you have any predictions as to how the BNPL space will play out in financial year 22? Well, I'll speak to Zip first and then we can talk about sort of how the market shakes up with competition. For us, continued focus on consumer and merchant. So, uh, we're very focused on expanding the product set. We're relevant with both our consumer base and also developing a range of new services and products for our merchants so that we become more important to them and, and stay ahead of the competition in essence. So one is the, the expansion to continue to focus on our core set. So we still see a huge opportunity um, to grow the customer base, to grow the, the merchant network in the markets we play in, and then expand over time. The, the second focus for us is we, we have made a number of strategic investments and bets. Um, it, it's time to demonstrate the growth from those green shoots. And so we're really excited that over the next couple months, we'll start announcing and sharing more around how some of these new market expansion activities are actually shaping up and some of the flywheel merchants that, that, that we have in the pipeline that will, you know, help us scale in those markets extremely quickly. And the third focus is just on the people on the team. So, you know, um, in times of COVID, globally distributed team, uh, globalization, making sure we have the right people in the right places, we continue to support our talent, our Zipsters is, is also always going to be a continued focus. Um, we're at well over a thousand people now and we have still very strong growth aspirations and we need to make sure that the zip culture, the zip, you know, the way we work, our focus on innovation, on product and technology continues uh, to stay ahead of the curve. 
In terms of the market, I'd say there will be um, more interesting deals as the market continues to evolve. I think that the space will remain competitive, but in a good way. Um, and I, I'd also see you'll start to see players, you know, expand from pure play, buy now, pay later. You know, that's a great opening wedge to build a customer relationship. But Zip and many of our global peers, you could see us very quickly expanding that relationship across a range of products and services in the financial space. So you start seeing some players probably, you know, do more on the consumer side of the equation. Some players might start differentiating by developing more services around the platform from a merchant interface perspective. And I think you'll see more segment specific players that are really going to go and stay very focused, but can build you know serious and sustainable businesses around specific ecosystems. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of potential growth for all of us, and I think uh, you know we'll continue to take market share away from from the old school dinosaurs. <laughs> No doubt. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how the space evolves as well. And it sounds like you've got quite a lot of growth still left ahead of you to go. So we look forward to seeing that in the near term and future as well. Thank you very much and thanks for having me today. Thanks for joining us. Yes, on that note, it is just about all we have a time for today. Um, folks, thanks for joining us. And if you missed this episode, you can catch it later today. We've had a great discussion with Mr. Tommy Melma uh, Stein of Zipco as well. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkind TV for more live updates. The global crypto market has grown by leaps and bounds, from just 18.5 billion US dollars in February of 2017 to 1.97 trillion on February of 2022. At the moment, there are around 17,500 cryptocurrencies and more than 450 crypto exchanges globally. The gains of the market have also accelerated over the past two years and the momentum is likely to continue with the advent of new technology and innovation like Web 3.0, the Metaverse and NFTs. In October last year, ProShares Bitcoin strategy became the first ever crypto ETF to debut in the US stock market after a nod from the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And not long after, more ETFs followed. ETFs or exchange traded funds are one of the easiest ways to get exposure to diverse crypto assets and they're relatively safer than direct investment due to the market's high volatility. So let's narrow in on the top three crypto ETFs based on their AUM or asset under management. Number one, of course, is ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF, the original. ProShares or BITO BITO, the first crypto ETF in the US, manages the front month CME Bitcoin futures portfolio. Founded in October of 2021, the open-ended fund has an average daily trading volume of 197 million US dollars, while the asset under management sits at 1.16 billion. BITO does not invest directly in Bitcoin, but in Bitcoin futures on the CME Commodity Exchange. Its expense ratio is 0.95%, and the top 10 holdings include the US dollar, futures, and US Treasury bills as well. Number two on our list is Valkyrie Bitcoin Strategy ETF. The Valkyrie Bitcoin ETF was launched in October as well, and it's an open-ended fund like BITO and has approximately 43.17 million US dollars in assets under management. The BTF portfolio includes Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Bitcoin Futures, corporate bonds, cash treasuries as well. And it does not directly invest in Bitcoin as well, and it doesn't track any index. BTF's expense ratio is 0.95 and its daily average trading volume is 12.98 million US dollars. ETF's top 10 holdings include mutual funds and treasury bills. And number three on our list is Vanek Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Like the other two, XBTF doesn't invest directly in cryptocurrency. It invests in front month Bitcoin future contracts. Launched on the 15th of November in 2021, this open-ended fund has 28.34 million US dollars worth of assets under management. 
Its average daily trading volume is at 1.41 million US dollars. And XBTF has a lower expense ratio than the other two at 0.65%. The expense ratio is critical because higher expenses may lead to less profit. And the CTF's top 10 holdings include the US dollar and treasury bills. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our news to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Bitcoin is the world's largest and most popular cryptocurrency with a market capitalization of over 800 billion US dollars. This digital token can be purchased as a long term investment or make payments for certain goods and services. There are several ways to purchase Bitcoin in Australia. It can be purchased using a Bitcoin ATM. If you want to purchase Bitcoin using cash, this may be a suitable option. However, Bitcoin ATMs are a costly source to obtain the digital coin as they charge between 5% and 20% as fees, which is over 10 times higher than the fee charged by online crypto exchanges. The most convenient way to purchase Bitcoin in Australia is through a Bitcoin exchange. You can open an account online and purchase Bitcoin in only a matter of minutes. These exchanges store Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies on behalf of their clients. Bitcoin exchanges also have some of the lowest fees for purchasing Bitcoin in Australia. You can spend as little as 0.75% in exchange fees on a platform like eToro. You can also purchase Bitcoin over the counter from news agents in Australia. Here you can make payments either in cash or using cards, either credit or debit cards. There are over 1,200 participating news agencies in Australia who deal in Bitcoin. However, the fee charged by news agents is very high. They normally charge around 5%, much higher than the fee charged by online crypto exchanges. So what are the most well-known crypto exchanges? Well, according to eToro, they are the world's most popular social trading platform for Bitcoin. You can open a free account and there are no management or ticketing fees and no added broker fees. For trading in Bitcoin, eToro charges a spread of 0.75%. Once you buy Bitcoin on eToro, it will be transferred to your digital wallet. Due to its ease of use, minimal fee structure and rapid account setup processes, eToro is a preferred medium to trade in Bitcoin. 
eToro is specifically useful for novice traders because of its copy trader functionality that allows users to imitate the strategies of expert traders, increasing their chances of making profits while reducing risks. Then there's Coinbase. Founded in 2012 by Brian Armstrong, Coinbase is an online exchange to deal in cryptocurrencies. It also specializes in providing storage facilities for cryptocurrencies. The Financial Conduct Authority regulates its e-money services. Through Coinbase, you can access over 100 cryptocurrencies and can trade in over 80 crypto to crypto pairs, making transactions on Coinbase affordable as well. You require a minimum deposit of $2.70 and the commission charged by the exchange varies between 0.5% and 4.5% per trade. That's depending on the cryptocurrency you want to trade. Binance is another crypto exchange for trading Bitcoin. It's the world's biggest crypto exchange in terms of trade volume and speed, in fact. A wide range of cryptocurrencies and low trading fees are two of its biggest advantages. If you trade in crypto to crypto pairs, you have to pay a flat trading fee of 0.1%. You can reduce trading fees further by using its native cryptocurrency, Binance Coin, for paying the trading fees. There are different trading fee tiers with lower fees for users who hold enough BNB coins and maintain certain monthly trading volumes. So there are some of the best ways to purchase and hold Bitcoin in Australia. Can you suggest any other ways? Leave a comment below if you can. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. So talk by Kalkine, the crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year and now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me Sage to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine.
Under the Sun is one name you may have heard of when it comes to the lucky few who've made a fortune from cryptos. But there's more to the story than meets the eye. Hassan originally attracted attention from reportedly making sky-high profits in the crypto market within just a few months. The 20-year-old told the public that he forayed into the world of digital currencies with a mere 50 US dollars in 2020, and his investments reached 1 million not too long after. Hassan is reported to be a college dropout and decided to put his crypto gains to good use by opening a charity group and spending close to 200,000 on various good causes. But his rags riches story isn't all it's cracked up to be. The BBC has just axed a documentary about the so-called crypto millionaire over allegations of him scamming investors. Concerns were raised shortly after an article from a renowned media house went viral and stated how a successful trader, Hanad Hassan, age 20, had managed to turn an initial £37 investment into nearly £6 million within just the span of a year. And evidence of the damage has already surfaced. Several individuals had alleged that they've lost their entire savings due to the scam. Hassan's case is a classic example of why investors need to be alert and vigilant and need to do their research before making important decisions like this. More updates will follow. I'm Holly Shields of Kalkai Media. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hey there, James for Kalkine, and in this video, we're going to get acquainted with Theta. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos. Theta is primarily a blockchain based network built to stream videos. The network uses decentralized networks wherein users can share the bandwidth and videos on a peer to peer basis. Founded by Mitch Liu and Ji Yi Long in 2018, Theta's protocol aims to pioneer content services. Centralized video services can often have high overhead costs and bandwidth issues, but with Theta, users benefit from getting cheaper content than other competing centralized platforms whilst reducing the entry barrier. Theta crypto price saw a significant surge of over 10% and a volume gain of over 500% recently. But why was it rallying? The Theta token recently was in the spotlight mainly due to the recent news of Replay, the blockchain based video tracking and payments network emerging from stealth mode due to backing by the Theta network. This would mean that through Replay's solutions, the users of the video ecosystem stand a chance to be fairly rewarded for their contributions. Consumers of Replay, a TNT20 token built on the Theta blockchain, will now stand a chance to be rewarded for subscribing and watching content. By utilizing the Theta Video API as the underlying infrastructure for video delivery, Replay users can also earn while they watch the content. Theta token is ranked number 38 on CoinMarketCap, and it's been enjoying a strong run of late. As of Feb 15, it's gained 24% in the past two weeks. Theta investors would be hoping this purple patch continues, and the next few days could provide some key insights into its future performance. Additionally, the Replay Theta partnership will give content creators a unique way of posting content online and standing a chance to earn revenue from it. The strong utility value of the token could be crucial in terms of its long-term success, but by no means is this a simple existing for the sake of existing project. So add it to your watch list. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe, and don't forget to press the bell icon. For more information, just check out the website calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. 
As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Alter Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get... Hi there, James Preston for Kalkai TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Alter Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. 
for all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello and thanks for joining us on Kalkine TV for Smart Market Insights. I'm James Preston and in this edition I'll be shining a light on rising inflation and five sectors to watch amidst the backdrop of high inflation. News headlines have been flooded of late with the latest US data of a massive increase in the Consumer Price Index or CPI. The US has the largest global economy and it has multi-dimensional effects on several other economies as a result. The persistent disturbances in the supply chain management in the pandemic have been one of the most significant causes of high degree inflation in the US and other nations. A substantial number of advanced and emerging economies are experiencing high inflation at present. As this was supposed to be the recovery period, it was expected that the world economy would experience some inflation. However, the CPI for various goods and services across most countries is climbing much faster than anticipated. The Biden administration seems to be under immense pressure, especially after the latest CPI figures were released. The report showed that the index rose at 7.5% over the past year and 0.6% in the past month alone. This is the highest level of inflation experienced by the US economy for the past 40 years. The worrying factor is that the price is now not rising for only pandemic-affected goods, but other commodities as well. Consequently, citizens are becoming pessimistic and consumer baskets are shrinking. Many investors are now presuming that the Federal Reserve might increase the interest rates to curb the high inflation rate. However, raising the interest rate may contract the demand and thus the revival journey could be hampered. A handful of economists have suggested that the high level of inflation could slide by the end of 2022 with supply chain barriers easing. However, some have suggested that such high inflation may leave long-lasting impacts on the US economy and thus the central bank and policymakers need to take stringent steps to correct it. The 19 nations that use the euro currency are also sailing in the same boat as the USA. Prices have been increasing at a substantial rate consecutively for the past three months. In January, the annual inflation accounted for 5.1% in December and it was 5% in November and ultimately 4.9% overall. These inflation rates have broken all records dating back to 1997, which coincides with the year that such records began to be kept. The primary causes for such a high price level are the skyrocketing prices of oil and gas and the supply chain disruptions. Oil prices have spiked in the global economy, however natural gas prices have increased in Europe for a number of reasons, including depleted winter reserves, low supply from Russia and also Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. The European Central Bank recently had a meeting with the outcome likely to be that no rate hikes would occur in order to attempt to curb inflation. Turning our attention now across the Tasman and New Zealand is not far behind the rally of high inflation countries. The nation experienced a massive increase of 5.9% in the consumer price index throughout 2021. According to Stats New Zealand, the rate has broken all records for the past 40 years. 
Several economists have suggested that high inflation might not be transitory, but instead could be persistent. The leading cause of the price level changes is affected by the massive increase in inflation in the USA and the worldwide supply chain disruptions. Investors in the country are worried about protecting and growing their wealth in these times of extremely high inflation. And lastly, let's focus on our home shores. Australia's consumer price index rose at 3.1% in 2021, which was the highest since 2011. The cost of living is getting increasingly expensive in the country, which is the most worrying aspect for everyday Aussies. Fuel has seen the most significant price rise, followed by the rise of food products. And speculation is now forming as to whether the RBA would increase the interest rates in accordance with the actions of the US. Whilst the pandemic is gradually shifting to endemic status, the effects on supply chain disruption and restrictions in a number of countries are still causing a number of economic ripples. All right, well, that's all for this edition of Smart Market Insights on Kalkine TV. Another edition coming your way tomorrow. And in the meantime, make sure to keep it locked to Kalkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Priya Mishra. She is CEO of Corporality Global, a marketing and management consulting firm with expertise in offering high-end marketing solutions across various industries. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello there, Priya. Welcome back to Calkine. Hello. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you. Good to speak to you today. So let's talk about how Corporality helps its clients strengthen their objectives and increase their brand's visibility. Yeah, so I mean, as we have been discussing earlier as well, that we are the company is actually very focused on people's future uh, visibility. So we are a very brand positioning company, not the brand uh, lead generation company. So the way we focus, we create the customer experience, we create the marketing with the consistent intended maturation model, and we implement into the system. So the system is so culturally conditioned. Uh, it can talk about the more future with the present and we increase visibility in the longer game. And Priya, could you tell me about some of the high quality solutions that Corporality offers? We are offering um, digital media marketing. So the way we work, we work in a very packaged way. We believe that doing bits and pieces is not going to work. So we are very much omni effect company so we create a if omni effect that and we have phases to achieve the goal and the vision the client wants to achieve so the way we work we actually package if you want to go in a very digitalized transformation we work on a whole digital media strategy and we choose the tools and and the process which is needed to take you to the place where you want to work go with your vision so we are very focused on the strategic aspect and can I ask, how does the Corporality Effect program assist its clients with digital sales? 
See, the, the way, it, the more visibility you have these days, everybody knows that, you know, you can't hide behind the curtain. You have to have the visibility. You have to have the brand positioning. You have to create a perception where you want to see your client um, is vis visualizing you and your service. The customer experience is very focused for us. And once we start giving that customer experience, they, they become your evangelist. They start talking about you. And once they, the, your customer starts talking about you, we can be, work on a more sustainable model. And when we design our next level, first is in your first years of your service, we talk about more customer, uh, your corporality effect. We try to reach out to the larger audience with the very consistent communication and narrative. Um, and we create the omni effect in that sense that where everybody uh, should start hearing the same communication and the perception you want to create. Once you would achieve that, we go to the next level and we talk about how you're going to target your current plan and the future plan together. You know, if you want to be somewhere three years down the line and five years down the line, you have to start planning now. You have to act now. You know, um, we are in a fast growing industry and, you know, majority of businesses are very competitive. So we have to be very active. And Priya, would you like to talk about the package service offerings by corporality? <coughs> Yeah, so our services are like, uh, you know, we offer um, corporality effect, which is like a digital media marketing. Then we offer another service, which is marketing strategy for 2022 to next financial year. So each year people start working six to seven months before so that they can, they can plan ahead for next financial year. We also offer the customer experience service, um, you know, which is, um, we are kind of your outsource CMO or you can call us outsource uh, CXO. Um, if you look at the CXO services, like in 2017 to 2021, the 35% increment in the people in the larger businesses started hiring more customer experience officer rather than customer marketing officer. And I would like to uh, differentiate what is the difference between customer marketing office, chief marketing officer and chief experience officer is that chief marketing officer is very much your marketing. So it's more out, outside experience. When it comes to the CXO, the CXO has to look after your inside and outside both. Mm -hmm. So you, we, the way we offer the employee experience, your stakeholder experience, your partnership experience, and also your, of course, your customer experience does matter. Yeah. And you did mention the grand omni effect. Um, can you talk in more detail about its success? What is so important about the grand omni effect? So the reason why I'm very particular about, about it, because the, unless you are visible everywhere together, you are lost, lost in the crowd. So we all know that digital is actually playing a bigger role in marketing these days. And when you look at the digital media platform, just different tools, whatever you are trying to use and achieve, it's very, very noisy place. So unless you go with the you know grand effect, and if you can give the same experience and same message on a different place, it's not gonna give you the effect you are looking for. So you can't just choose one platform and say, "Oh, I'm doing marketing." It's like kind of a you know, uh, it, it, it will not be very effective for you because your majority of crowds are actually seeing your um, messages on the different pl platform on a di different time zone and so as as you go the more platform the more places the more visibility you can create the more noise you can create the in that's where your actual effect you can see and the vision you can achieve in the longer go game time you know Exactly. And, and could you please tell us about the shared value you build with the Stakeholders Benefit Society with the corporate citizenship expansion feature? Yes. Yeah, so I am always a big believer of giving back to the society. So I always believe in co corporate social responsibility and we have done an initiative. Every pers income we are getting, 1% income will be going to my charity work, you know. And uh, in fact, we go ever and beyond during this in this COVID time. We try to help a couple of old age uh, homes um, in India because they they have dementia and all they've lost their home. They don't know where to go. 
so we help the, those houses to you know food shelter medicine whatever it is needed we also help people uh, from the orphanage we just initiated a youth program um and the program was initiated for a very small group but now it's literally going is it's nearly 2000 members now from india uh, student group and the group is from 15 years to 25 underprivileged students who don't have the you do, who has the proper education but they don't know what what to do with that so what we are trying to uh, bring the concept of becoming entrepreneur if job job opportunities are not there or the dream work is not there why can't we create that and i have seen during the covid time that there was a huge migration from village to city metro cities was happening and it affects the lifestyle the humanitarian ground of lifestyle you know the basic standards we not followed because of the lack of money and the earning they do in the metro city and the cost living cost is very high and i'm encouraging people if you stay in village and you can live better life with the better income why would you not so we, we are trying to educate you and to make better use of their education and uh, leverage what they have it sounds very charitable some of the work you're doing there and what are corporality's plans to advance in the marketing space for the future see uh, we are very big believer of having a sustainable business model right there are a lot of businesses are just surviving you know and they are surviving because they have lack of uh, you know system futuristic approach um they have lack of strategy and planning and if they have you know a lot of people plan and the execution is a biggest challenge and there is a, a huge gap we can see between the in, in management and the employee the management is you know i mean it's their baby they they actually start with a very huge pro, you know vision and they they pushing it pushing it hard working day night but then the employees are not clear enough what they are supposed to be doing or if they are they are just following the instructions and all so what i'm trying to say fill that gap using my cxo um, process fill that gap they, let's work the vision together because it's an, it's like an army right so it's like if you're going on a war foot you can't go win the um, you know whole war by yourself you need an army your team is your asset so it has to be you know together the culture should be like togetherness the, the, they should live your vision uh, what you want to achieve where you want to go they should support that that process so that it, your life will be much easier so i'm helping businesses to become create more sustainable model right rather than going behind the short term flashy outcome it sounds fantastic and just finally pray congratulations on the launch of your book called journey of perseverance could you Thank just you. briefly tell me what you would like the reader to take away from your book? See, this is a kind. This is the my book, and it's just a look I would like to give, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, journey I have been through and how I achieve what I achieve. A major role in my life in my achievements is my perseverance. I was very persever perseverant. in every pro everything i thought of i had a zeal i have a passion i and i was very perseverant about it so i felt like i should share my story and this is a bit of a story and my achievements how i achieve and we brought some case studies in that for the you know successful people so this is a inspira inspiring trip towards the you know change adoptions you know the success we achieved with the time and this is this is the story of the people who can actually who wants to go through the the journey i have been through and the others also um and you can achieve what you want to achieve if you will be following the certain rules and the process of yourself that sounds amazing and congratulations once again on the launch thank of your you. book with that prayer i will say goodbye but thank you so much for your time today Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank okay. you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tons of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight 
to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050. Battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the government across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Alter Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. The price of Ellipsis has gained momentum over the past few days as it gathers interest from potential investors. Ellipsis Crypto is a BEP20 token and according to CoinMarketCap, it has a total supply of 623.1 million tokens with a circulating supply of 594.1 million. EPS is the native token of Ellipsis Finance, which is Curve Finance's authorised fork. Ellipsis Finance acts as an exchange for users and decentralised protocols to trade between various stablecoins. The network is designed to enable secure and low slippage swapping of stablecoins. As Ellipsis receives support from Curve Finance, it's expected to ensure features like no liquidity lockups and no deposit and withdrawal fees. According to the white paper of Ellipsis Finance, EPS is primarily a revenue earning token and it benefits the stakes and liquidity providers. Ellipsis Crypto's liquidity providers and stakers get a portion of the trading fees. Generally, it's split equally between the two. EPS Crypto appears to be bullish at the moment and if it continues the momentum, it could witness a price surge in the future. However, it is essential to know that the cryptocurrency market is highly volatile and prices of virtual assets continue to fluctuate. Therefore, it's crucial to research before investing. Ellipsis is available on a number of exchanges if you are interested, including Binance, KuCoin, Mandala Exchange, and Crypto.com. Hope you enjoyed watching the video, and if you did, then please make sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkai. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Jeremy Hurst. He's the co-founder and director of the sharing economy platform Space2Co. That is a web platform for sharing short-term rental of spaces. Here at Calkheim, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you today, Jeremy. How are you? Uh, very good, Rachel. Thanks for having me on the show. 
Good to see you here today. So first off, Jeremy, could you please explain how Space to Co works? Yeah, of course. So the what we've created is a platform for the short term hire of spaces in the community. And what that means is essentially we match make people who have a space to people who need a space and vice versa. Um, on the marketplace, you can find all different types of spaces might be like a co-working hot desk, it could be a community hall or community centre, it might be even a tennis court uh, or a cafe that sits uh, empty in the uh, late afternoon and evenings that can be a useful hireable space. Well, that sounds fascinating. Now, I believe your company was a winner at this year's National Eye Awards, receiving the award for Government and Public Sector Solution. So this is a huge honour. What do you believe was behind the achievement of this award? Yeah, great question. I think uh, one, of the, one of the qualities we've had over the years is we just haven't given up. We've been persistent uh, in our journey and we didn't start out thinking that we were going to solve the needs of local government. And it was a bit of a pivot we did back in 2017 to uh, take on uh, the local government market. And it's, it's just been a, a perfect match for us. Uh, we're a small team, but we're, we've recruited incredibly well and we've got an amazing bunch of, of people and we're, we're very organized. Uh, the, the founding team were all former school teachers and we, we do know how to be organised and structure things and that's definitely worked to our advantage. That absolutely sounds like great teamwork there. Now, your company is a WA Local Government Association preferred supplier now. How has this helped your business and what do you believe lies ahead in your near-term pipeline? Look, I think um, being a preferred supplier, um, not just with Walga, but with local buy for Queensland and the Northern Territory, what that's done is that's given trust in the marketplace and our product and our brand. So when you get on these preferred supplier panels, you have to sort of be rigor tested and go through almost like a tendering process. Um, and look, I think what that's done is that's really uh, just added some validation behind who we are as an organisation, that we're known, that we're trusted and um, that we're, we're, we're worth looking into. In terms of your other question around what's next, I would say it's all around uh, consolidating what we're doing in Australia and New Zealand. And we've also got some exploration work we've, we've already under started with around what other international markets that space to co could be a fit for our concept is um, one that translates globally and there is no um, look there are shortages of spaces wherever there are people and uh, connecting the gaps and showing what spaces are out there in the community uh, works as well as in, in any other country other than just what we've got here in Australia New Zealand Absolutely. And as many of us know, it can be quite complex and also quite slow to book council spaces, particularly. How do you believe this process can be improved? Oh my gosh. Uh, look, the core focus we've taken to all of this is all around focusing on the customer journey. And so, you know, if you look at the process that most councils have for around how you hire a space, it's a very, very time consuming uh, and there's a lot of back and forth to get your questions answered uh, and to find out the availability of a space. And what we've done is we've given people the answers to most of their questions up front in the, the, the process we have. And that makes it just incredibly fast to find the booking that you need for your family celebration or your work event or whatever it is that you're planning. So uh, it's purely down to the customer experience, Rachel. That's been the big thing we've focused on. Uh, conversely too, for the council, we make the process easier for them. Um, the, sometimes the, the councils have some systems in place that aren't exactly the most modern. And when we sort of give them sort of a more enterprise modern experience, it really helps them be efficient. Um, one classic example is how they collect a bond for say a whole hire. Uh, if you wanted to grab like a $500 bond, that money has to be basically collected off the hirer it's put into a trust account 
uh, then the bio, then the activity happens in the whole in 99.9% .9 of cases they actually don't hold a bond they have to return it to the guest and that process involves them raising a credit note handing that to a finance officer to authorize that uh, refund handing it to another officer to um, actually do the transaction and get the money back to the hire and that process can take six weeks and you know there's a lot of people in the community that don't want to be without their five hundred dollar or a thousand dollars um, that's held up in a local council bond flow so yeah we've really improved that down to uh, automatically uh, sending the funds back to the hire so once again customer experience that sounds great and as you mentioned customer experience there what do you believe are the three key ways in which you create the ideal customer experience uh, one of the things we've done all the way through our journey is user testing. So we do listen to the customer, we sit down, we interview them, we find out what it is that trips them up, what it is they, they love, what it is they don't love, and we lean into that feedback and we iterate on it very, very rapidly. So that's probably one of the core things we've done and we continue to do all the way through um, the development of our product. We're a two-sided marketplace. So we have customers who have space to share and we have customers who are looking to hire a space. And so we make sure that we're user testing on both sides of that marketplace. Um, the other thing we do is we hold a quarterly session with all of our local government partners that we call Space to Co-Create. And the purpose of Space to Co-Create is to share stories to lean in and listen to feedback uh, around how the platform's being used. And from those co-create sessions, we've come up with some ideas that we wouldn't have otherwise learned about. Um, so that's been absolutely um, fabulous. And, and the other thing we do is we run surveys, we have space reviews on the platform, and we glean a lot of insight from those as well. It sounds great. And just finally, how has the COVID-19 pandemic either helped or hindered your business? Oh, that's an awesome question. So for us, we, uh, we've been focused and we're quite lucky and almost just fallen on our feet in this way. Uh, we work with uh, WA, South Australia and New Zealand predominantly. And if you look at three areas that have been largely immune somewhat to the COVID pandemic, it's been those three areas. So we've been very lucky that they are almost our three first um, core markets. So the impact of COVID has not been terrible uh, for us. Of course, we've had lockdowns and disruption, but uh, we've been able to use that to our advantage. A couple of things uh, have come up. So first and foremost is suddenly there is this acceptance that we don't have to jump on a plane and go and meet somebody in person at a great cost to our business. We can actually just do a Zoom or Teams call and have the meetings that we need all online, which is super efficient, uh, faster and way less costly, uh, which has been an absolute game changer. When we had the big lockdown of sort of uh, March, April, May 2020, we actually doubled down on some development on our platform and we, able, we were able to really take the platform offline and roll out a huge uh, update to space to go And had we not had that downtime, it would have been much, much harder to, to, to do that big update push. So yeah, we can, we're actually one of those companies that says the COVID pandemic has actually been an, an enabler and helped us on our journey, funnily enough. Excellent. It definitely sounds as though it has helped you along. Well, it's been great chatting with you today, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me on, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Malcolm Hevelwhite. He's the CEO of Atmo Biosciences. Now Atmo is a digital health business commercializing a world first ingestible gas sensing capsule. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. I'm very excited to chat with you today, Malcolm. Welcome. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. Now, first off, could we get you to give us an introduction to Atmo and tell us more about what you are doing in the digital health arena? Certainly. So, um, look, we're a, a digital health company commercializing some technology involving a gas sensing capsule, which uh, you ingest and which senses gaseous biomarkers that are clinically important and transmits that information wirelessly to the cloud for aggregation and analysis. So it's to be used to analyze gut health and dysfunction. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Now you have been successful in raising almost $10 million. What are your plans for this raise? Yeah, so we're, we're very excited to have on board as shareholders as part of that raise, uh, among others, Otsuka Pharmaceutical, and Allium Capital um, here in Sydney. So we're really excited at how the demand that we experienced during that raise and the, um, the reception that we got from both existing shareholders and from new investors such as Otsuka. We've developed what is now the third generation of the capsule technology and we're involved in 11 clinical trials which are either underway or that we have completed. And we've administered the capsule now to almost 300 subjects in those trials. So it's certainly more than an idea. We're gathering a lot of valuable data. And this raise will enable us to complete the product development in preparation for a pivotal trial next year and make a regulatory submission with the FDA for a first indication. So it, it also allows us to continue our clinical program and explore additional clinical indications in commercially interesting applications like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which is the largest chronic condition that's treated in the US at the moment, for instance, and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which affects anywhere from five to 15% of the general population. And along the way, we'll be obtaining quality accreditation to the appropriate medical device level, um, along with automating and scaling up our manufacturing capability and growing our team to support those kinds of additional activities. Excellent. And Prime Minister Scott Morrison also marvelled at Amo's lab in a pill on his manufacturing tour in Melbourne back in July. Um, are you able to tell us a bit more about how the pill actually works? Certainly. So um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Morrison did enjoy his, uh, his visit to us. I think he was quite, uh, quite fascinated by what we're doing. But the, the microbiome, for those of you who aren't aware, is the collection of all of the microbiota that live on and within us. And there's a lot of them. They outnumber the cells in our body. They weigh a couple of kilograms and they play very important roles in various um, physiological processes. And it's largely an unexplored area and many aspects of the microbiome are a mystery. And your gut is essentially a, a nine meter long tube connecting different organs. 
um, and it's very difficult to get into the inner reaches of it. So much less to understand what is going on functionally in there. And our technology opens up a window and shines a light on the microbiome function, providing insight by measuring these clinically important gaseous biomarkers to better understand gut health or dysfunction. And that's going to lead to earlier relief of symptoms, more personalized approach to therapy, and ultimately healthcare cost savings. And given that one in five of us are going to see a gastroenterologist at some point in our lives, there is an enormous unmet clinical need that needs to be met here because there's a lack of tools that are available for gastroenterologists to demystify what is going on in the gut. And we see enormous potential for this to become a ubiquitous as a first line screening and diagnostic tool to provide functional insight into microbiome function. And it does sound so very futuristic. What are the future prospects that you have for this pill? Look, um, there are a range of applications, um, all of which result in data that are, are transmitted to the cloud and build a large data set. As I mentioned before, we've got um, over almost 300 subjects and their data from the clinical trials that we're currently running. But what that allows us to do by building a data set like that is to overlay algorithms and apply machine learning and AI to the data to extract additional insight about an individual or a cohort and the state of their gut health or, or dysfunction. So um, we're very excited about some initial indications that we have a line of sight on and there are plenty more coming you know, beyond that. And you did mention the US Realty Clearance of the ingestible capsule. Where will this take the product and how important was that for your company? So we're, um, we're working at the moment with a strategic partner and shareholder in a company called Planet Innovation out of Melbourne for the product development uh, capabilities that we need. We're also growing the Atmo team itself to continue building the technical capability that we, we need, which we'll need to, to serve the multiple applications that we'll be pursuing. And we're in the process of scoping a pivotal trial that we will be conducting next year in Australia, the US, Europe, to gather the data for that regulatory submission for an initial indication. So that's um, where a lot of the funds that we've just raised will be, will be going um, with a view to completing those activities. And the COVID pandemic has obviously affected many businesses. Has this called any stalls for you with regards to the trials and how have you managed to continue progress during this time? Yeah, certainly. I, I, I think everyone's been obviously impacted by you know, unforeseen circumstances and it certainly created challenges for us. I mean, what it meant was that we had to make our budget go further, particularly as a you know an early stage startup. So that it, that uh, that created some challenges for us. But but by by staying you know as flexible and certainly as lean as we could be, and by being creative, we've managed to not just survive but also thrive. Um, when COVID, for example, uh, shut down our Melbourne trial sites. Um, we went to New Zealand and we developed alternative uh, clinical trial sites elsewhere, um, such as in Christchurch. So planning for and mitigating against threats like COVID uh, by having contingencies has enabled us to uh, not only survive, but also to gather the data and achieve the milestones that we've needed. And that's what put us in a good position to be able to raise this latest round which was not only upscaled, but it was oversubscribed. So it, it's indicative of um, the activity that we've been um, progressing and, and the, the progress that we've been making, but it's also indicative of the, the interest in this space uh, in what is a nascent field in terms of my, the microbiome and our, our tools to investigate it. Well, it is absolutely marvellous to see progression in this arena. And congratulations again on your raise. Thank you, Malcolm. It's been great to chat with you today. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Keep Network and New Cypher tokens have merged to create the Threshold Network token, and the cryptocurrency exchange Binance has agreed to upgrade the tokens to T. The Keep Network and New Cypher communities approved the merger back in June 2021. After the network upgrade, the existing Keep and new token holders will get the new token T. Keep Network and New Cypher are protocols for data privacy on the Ethereum blockchain. Binance fully supports the merger, according to Keep Network in a post on Twitter. The Keep and New tokens will now be automatically upgraded to T tokens on Binance in the next week. 93% of Keep Network stakers voted in favour of the merger. Keep's maximum supply is around 1 billion and New's maximum supply is about 3.9 billion. Keep Network is an incentivized network for storing and encrypting private data in the form of off-chain containers called Keeps on the blockchain, making it fully censorship resistant. It addresses the problem of holding back blockchain adoption. Developers can make fully decentralized apps on the platform. Keep is the native token of the network and it can be staked. Keep's market cap is US $441 million and the network was founded back in 2017. As for New Cypher, well, it's a decentralized encryption and key management system for public blockchains. It offers end-to-end -end encrypted data sharing and decentralized storage solutions on blockchains. NU, or NEW, is the native token of New Cypher. It's used to incentivize participants to perform key management services and access operations on the network. It's also used to run the worker node through the staking process. New Cypher published its first white paper in June 2017, and in the following year, it launched its private testnet. The Threshold token was created after the merger of these two platforms, Keep Network and New Cypher, and it was finalized on the 1st of January 2022. The network now aims to provide a suite of cryptographic primitives for the dApps. T is a utility for the Threshold network and is acting as the governance token for the Threshold DAO. Users can lock the token in coverage pools and then earn yields. Keep Token is still available for trading at exchanges such as Binance, KuCoin, Crypto.com, Gate.io, and Mandala Exchange, and New Cypher can be traded on Coinbase Pro, Binance, Uniswap, Hobi, and Gate.io. And of course, T Token is coming very soon. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to check out our website, KalkineMedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of 
Calgary Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Alltech Chemicals, and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Gaming cryptos are gaining traction these days thanks to the growing popularity of non-fungible tokens and the metaverse. Let's take a look at some interesting ones. Introduced in 2019, Gala Games had a total supply of $35 billion tokens. It was invented by Eric Shiremeyer, who intended to reclaim the control of games. Gala Games' goal is to provide a wide variety of blockchain games that put fun first and blockchain in the background. With the help of blockchain technology, the project hopes to restore innovative ideas into games by granting players authority over in-game assets and games. Within the Gala Games ecosystem, players may possess non-fungible tokens and affect the game governance. Gala Games, in addition to purchasing, uses its utility token Gala. Gala Games has so far built an NFT collectible series called Vox and one playable game called Townstar. Star Atlas is a virtual gaming metaverse-based huge multiplayer online game. Atlas was invented by Pablo Quiroga and Michael Wagner. It's been made on Unreal Engine 5, which provides cinematic quality real-time environments. Star Atlas's economy is based on non-fungible tokens that can be traded and obtained. In addition to Star Atlas, it intends to provide an NFT release schedule and an NFT marketplace for the distribution and trading of in-game assets. Star Atlas takes place in a futuristic science fiction setting in the year 2620, where three major factions are competing for resources and control. These three factions are humankind, a consortium of alien races, and sentient androids. The Axie Infinity game universe contains intriguing creatures called Axies, which gamers can adopt as pets. For their Axies, gamers can nurture, combat, obtain, breed, and establish kingdoms. Players can trade, purchase, and sell the resources they gain through competent gameplay and contributions to the ecosystem in the universe's player-owned economy. In this game, each Axie is an NFT having different attributes and can enter into three versus three battles. Here, the winning team means more experience points, which can be used to level up an Axie stats. Yield Guild Games is a decentralized autonomous organization that invests in virtual world NFTs. Gabby Dizzen, a team member who introduced the Axie Infinity and Yearn Finance communities, established YGG's Manila-based game studio. Their purpose is to create the world's biggest virtual economy, distribute profits to its stakeholders, and manage its assets to increase utility. In decentralized games, YGG's has created a community of investors and players who generate money through investments in NFTs that are used in blockchain-based games and virtual worlds. The dream of building a large game environment is beginning to come true. The year 2022 will likely be a watershed moment for blockchain gaming and these top four gaming cryptos are likely to benefit the most. So what do you think? You can leave a comment here and like and share this video. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calchi Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. 
come 2050. Battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the government across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Alter Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Hello, it's great to have your company here on Kalkine TV. I'm Rachel and you're watching The Buzzing Trends. Today we're looking at three ASX gold stocks catching investors' attention. Now gold prices did ease overnight due to the de-escalating of geopolitical risks coming out of the Ukraine and Russia. Despite a continuous recent rally taking it to an eight-month high, the last year hasn't been great for gold. Let us look at three ASX gold stocks that have been on a bit of a run recently. Silver Lake Resources was founded in 2004 and is a growth-focused gold miner in Australia, having a wide portfolio of gold prospects, including Mount Mongo and Deflector Camps in Western Australia. The company has a market capitalization of $1.51 billion and had clocked an increased revenue in financial year 2021. Their shares have risen 10% over the last year and its current price is $1.68. Next up, Evolution Mining is a New South Wales-based $7.25 billion ASX-listed gold exploration company and operates a total of five wholly-owned gold mines across Australia and Canada. It's one of the few regular dividend-paying gold miners on the Australian bourse and trading at a dividend yield of 3.03%. Although their shares have rallied to a high of $4.04 on the 15th of February, profit booking from upper levels made a softer closing yesterday. The stock is currently trading at $1.68 per share. Investors have also taken their money off the table before their upcoming earnings report. Now the last stock on our list is Northern Star Resources, an Australian headquartered global gold producing company with projects in Australia and North America. The company is focused on delivering shareholders return through continuous investment in building assets based on strategic acquisitions. Their shares have fallen 0.22% in the last five days to its current price of $8.88. The shares are also trading at a dividend yield of 2.16%, having declared $0.19 cents per share dividend in calendar year 2021. Now, geopolitical tensions between Russia and the U.S. over Ukraine did send the yellow metal to an eight-month high, as investors are looking to park their money in safe haven assets. However, as we've seen, the gold prices dipped and these short-term sentiments look to be fading as tensions settle. Therefore, investors should keep their guard up while investing in gold stocks on the back of escalating geopolitical tensions. Well, that's all from me for now. We'll be back soon with our Buzzing Trend show to share the latest market insights with you. Till then, stay tuned with Kalkine TV for more stock, business and economy-related trends. I'm Rachel for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees come 2050. Battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. PancakeSwap is primarily a decentralised finance application that allows users to swap tokens, farm them and earn fees in return. Launched in 2020, the decentralised exchange executes trades through smart contracts, thus eliminating the risk associated with various transactions. Powered by the multi-blockchain network, PancakeSwap originally used the automated market maker model, which effectively means the liquidity pools are used instead of the order books. Users can add tokens to the liquidity pool, and from there they can farm and stake the cake tokens to earn rewards. On the 10th of February, PancakeSwap was surging after ERA7, Game of Truth, also known as ERA, a play to earn game, announced its new initial farm offering, or, or IFO, on PancakeSwap. Cake holders will get special access to IFO 3.1 through a new private sale allocation. The ERA7 intends to launch its IFO to investors on February 18. Cake Token is ranked 56th on CoinMarketCap as per the market cap of the project and it's enjoyed a strong run of late with gains of 12.2% and 15% in the past 14 and 7 days respectively according to CoinGecko. Investors can take heart from the bullish run that Cake is enjoying and this IFO launch may well help the token maintain momentum for an extended period. For investors, there could indeed be a cherry on the top of their cake. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon. Also, you can check out the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees come 2050. Battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. 
Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet Three ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24, 2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. AstraZeneca stock saw a massive surge at the end of last week, topping the index after the release of its extraordinary full year and fourth quarter results. Hi, thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcane Media. AstraZeneca's results showed that last year was a year of phenomenal pipeline and commercial delivery. The total revenues of the pharma company increased by 41% to $37.4 billion US dollars in 2021. While the COVID-19 vaccine earnings were included in this figure, even without them, revenue was still up by 26%. In the fourth quarter of last year, the total revenue was up 62% and touching the $12 billion mark. AstraZeneca's core EPS was up as well 32% last year and through the acquisition of Alexion, the company has been able to speed up its strategic transformation. EVU Shield and Tess Spire have also been approved, which is positive news for the company's pipeline and it supports its outlook for 2022. However, due to the acquisition of Alexion and the additional funds spent on R&D and product launches, AZ has reported a pre-tax loss of $265 million US dollars, as compared to a profit of $3.9 billion in the previous year. As the prospects and cash generation potential of the company seem bright, AstraZeneca's board is planning to raise the annualized dividend from 0.10 US cents to $2.90. In March of 2022, the company is due to pay a second interim dividend of $1.97 for the year 2021, marking the total dividend for the year reaching 2.87. AZ has raised its guidance for the fiscal year 2022 after beating its fourth quarter profit expectations. However, it's one that the sales numbers, which were significantly up due to COVID-19 products, may fall. The pharma giant is listed on the main market of the London Stock Exchange, and it has been since 1993. It's a constituent of the FTSE 100 index and it's also traded publicly on the Nasdaq exchange. The current market cap of AstraZeneca stands at £129.5 billion and has provided a return to shareholders of 17.97% over the last one year as of the 10th of February 2022. Meanwhile, its year-to-date return stands at negative 0.52%. With a robust trajectory in 2021, AstraZeneca is positive about its profitability and the growth in the long run. The company has raised its 2022 sales forecasts and annual dividends as well, and it has some bright future prospects. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to save to date. This has been Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. 
Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and you're watching Calcane TV. In this report we throw some light on Australian biotech giant CSL. Now the company announced a rise in revenue in the first half of financial year 2021 and that was even as plasma collections remained weak due to COVID-19 restrictions. While the revenue of the biotech rose 5% to 6.04 billion US dollars, the net profit after tax fell 2.8% to 1.76 billion US dollars due to a 3.4 percentage point slip in its gross margin in the half year, ending 31st of December 2021. Now, despite its muted earnings, CSL's board maintained its interim dividend at $1.04 US cents per share. Meanwhile, the company reported a 1% fall in its biopharmaceutical company, CSL Bearing Revenue. Their influenza vaccines business, Securus, once again delivered a strong performance with revenue up 17% at constant currency. They also report strong growth in market-leading haemophilia B product, Idelvian, and in specialty products, Cassentra and Hegada. CEO Paul Perillo said that the earnings matched the expectations in a challenging environment due to COVID-19. On the 14th of February, the company announced it had completed its $750 million share purchase plan. They say the share purchase plan funds will be utilized to support the proposed acquisition of Vifor Pharma. Now, Vifor is a global specialty pharmaceutical company with leadership in renal disease and iron deficiency. The share purchase plan received strong backing with valid applications totaling $942.7 million, which meant the offer had to be scaled back. The biotech reaffirmed its guidance for financial year 2022 with an impact expected to be in the range of almost 2.15 billion US dollars to 2.25 billion at constant currency. The guidance is expected to be supported by improvements in plasma collections and increased demand for flu vaccines. This morning, CSL stock was trading at $259.88, up almost 7%. It fell almost 18% year to date. 
CSL shares are currently trading at $257.93, up 6.14% so far today. Well, that's all for now. Keep watching Calkine TV for more news and info on the economy and markets. I'm Rachel signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkine Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calkai Media. Hello everyone, Sage here. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Today's guest is Mr. Darren Nelson, the director and founder of Solace Sleep. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for Solace Sleep, a national online and retail bedding company specialising in adjustable beds as well as mattresses and pillows. The beds are functional, elegant and affordable. And their purpose is to provide a better sleep and to ease the pain as part of their customers' health journey. So we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today we're very lucky to have live with us Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solar Sleep. Welcome to the show, Darren. Good morning, Sage. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to e meet you. And I'm glad to share this great piece of news with the viewers that Solar Sleep could increase its sales by 400% since the pandemic hit in 2020. And despite mm. the regressing market, you achieved astounding growth. Darren, please share your strategies behind achieving such great success. Well, I, look, it, it starts with, uh, I suppose, what everybody expects from a business. Uh, sometimes we don't get it, which is just, we're a, a family business. So those, those family values, those ethics, uh, we treat people the way they expect to be treated. Uh, a lot of it's got to do with our pricing strategy as well. We're factory direct pricing. Um, typically, we're about half the price of uh, you know normal betting retailers out there. And we've developed product that suits the market in terms of, as you said before, their health journey. Um, we've developed product that is easily delivered 
totally around Australia for their online purchases. And we've got a fully stocked warehouse, which is really important because when an adjustable bed comes along, a lot of it's got to do on an urgency of a health crisis, uh, pain, comfort. Uh, people don't want to wait 10 to 12 weeks for their product. No, especially when it's going to ease the pain or give them a better night's sleep. And with the advent of the new work from home culture, people now spend more time in their homes. Do you think this change has affected how people view and invest in their furniture and beds especially? Totally, totally. What people are saying to themselves now is their health um, and their sleep is one of the highest levels of what they put on their criteria about their uh, their own body uh, and we're playing catch up in this country sleep is now becoming a really hot topic and people are understanding the value of sleep because as they move through different stages of life they want uh, as i said before their health to be consistent in terms of the people staying at home um, they're challenged with uh, trying to find a peaceful place in their house to um, conduct their business. Often that's done uh, in the bedroom. Often that's done propped up with a couple of pillows and it's not helping their posture. So they're looking for something that's going to um, perform everything they need to perform and that's typically an adjustable bed. And it's never too early, I think, to start investing in your neck and spine um, because mm. the, you'll reap the benefits in the long run. I think you're exactly right there. Posture is so important. So speaking of comfort, older people need more comfortable beds as they spend perhaps longer hours in their homes. And we are making our homes like our own personal oasis these days, which is great. So how yep. do you ensure that your beds are super comfortable and warm for people of all generations? Well, we start with, um, I suppose, our core belief that uh, first we have a range of product that gives people options. Um, they don't have just one choice and it's not logical for people just to have one mattress. Um, as we know, uh, when we purchased our mattresses over a long period of time, uh, we need to have an option in mattresses and we need to be explained what that option is. So there's a lot of scientific proof about what mattresses are best for you. And we go through a whole bit of, uh, I, sp I suppose, understanding what the customer needs, understanding where they've come from and where they want to go. In terms of uh, people staying at home in an older generation, they're also valuing that more than they ever have because they want their um, health and again their home care to be done in their own environment. They don't want to go to a aged care facility or some sort of care facility, particularly as we are understanding that's more of a high risk environment today. And I think you probably want to invest in a bed that is adjustable and is um, able to be used in times when perhaps you become sick instead of having to at that time then hire out a new bed and then have to make the changes around so why not invest in something that's going to provide you with all the functions and features and, and to get the most use out of it before something drastic happens yeah I see what you mean wait, um, and wait. sorry we, we often talk to people about something that we all know which mm. is you rather be, um, you know, you rather take care of your health now. So, in other words, uh, preventing anything, than then trying to cure something later on. So, the prevention stage is critical because you get more oxygen into your blood stream, uh, you get better, a better postural relief, as I said before, and typically um, you're getting a deeper sleep. So with a deeper, longer sleep, your brain and your body is repairing itself overnight. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Prevention is better than the cure. You're absolutely spot on. Thanks for that. And you have used pressure mapping in your beds. Would you please also elaborate on the benefits that uh, pressure mapping provides to people? Yeah, again, critical. What we're, what we're seeing now with our I suppose our extra bit of advice, our extra bit of um, 
I suppose, prescription based, you know, understanding again that body and how you do that is by measuring the pressure points on their body. So then we can tell people, okay, how high typically do you need to raise your head? How high do you need to raise your feet? And when you get those two combinations together, that reduces the pressure off your body. Because the people that toss and turn all night, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing that because the blood flow around their body is stopped. So your brain says, turn me over. I don't like the fact that my blood's not flowing around. That is just another indication or that is the core indication of pressure. Uh, so if we can map their pressure uh, and then we can understand what we can do. For example, even me, I was be able to show when we first started to test it that my body sits on a bit of a skew because um, over many, many years ago, I had a knee injury and that makes my one leg touch shorter than the other. So I could see where my pressure was. Right. Very interesting. And thanks for sharing your own personal journey as well there. And Darren, since you have been working with occupational ter therapists, could you please give your nuanced opinion about uh, positional and comfort therapy? I know you've just touched on it then, but if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that too. Absolutely. What we know is our bodies and our shape of our body should not sleep flat. And that's where postural therapy, positional therapy comes into play. It again means that it might mean um, typically putting your body in a position where uh, again we reduce pain, reduce swelling. It may be things like uh, lung disease, um, again oxygen flow into your body. It, it typically can be as little as uh, chronic snoring, sleep apnea, things like that is all about positional therapy and an occupational therapist looks for our advice from point of view where that best position is to ease pain, provide better comfort, um, really just about health because they're trying to again provide a health journey going forward for their client. In terms of comfort therapy, as I touched on before, there's a whole big pile of different ranges of mm. uh, indicators that we need to be careful of. One more than anything is things like when you're transferring from a mobility device, be it a wheelchair or a mobile chair in some ways, about how secure and safe the edge of that mattress is, um, to the height of the mattress, to the amount of pressure relief it gives. Um, that's what we call comfort therapy. And then you need positional therapy and comfort therapy to match to those clients' needs. And that's again a lot to do with that pressure mapping and a lot to do with the understanding of what their occupational therapist needs and also what the client needs. Yes, absolutely. And um, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you mentioned having a deeper sleep can aid in the prevention of uh, things down the track that could go wrong with your posture and even with your organs because at night time is apparently na n natural therapists tell me when your organs are healing and it's important to have a complete focus on that and not be tossing and turning all night. Well, Darren, I've really enjoyed your insights today. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your passion for Thank your project. You Was there any, oh, my um, pleasure. Was there any final comments you'd like to share before we wind up today's discussion? Look, I just, I just encourage everybody to consider their sleep. Um, you need to get a long, uh, valuable sleep and often many people say they've slept for seven hours, eight hours, but still don't feel healthy in the morning or they feel like they haven't slept. And that's got a lot to do with the fact, that, as I said before, that tossing and turning, that pressure. Um, and you need, um, and I, this is really important, you need to get into a deeper sleep. And if you do that, your body will then react beneficially to that deeper sleep. Great advice and a fantastic note to finish up on there. Thanks, Darren, for your time today and for joining us on Calcine TV. 
And if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion. Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solace Sleep. And your body might thank you if you check out his website and the offerings his store will give you. The full recorded interview will be available later at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. So please check it out. And thanks for your time watching. Stay watching Kalkine TV for more live expert talks and market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Could Web 3.0 catapult Bitcoin to 300,000 US dollars? Hey, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Kalkine Media. Proponents envision Web 3.0 as the next gen of the internet that will take the digital world by storm over the coming years. This decentralized version of the internet is expected to shift the balance of power between tech giants and users. Now we know that blockchain runs on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, meaning that power is not centered at one specific point but distributed among users that may be present anywhere in the world. And Bitcoin is indeed the most dominant blockchain-based cryptocurrency. And if the digital currency finds its way into Web 3.0, well, there is a fair chance that Bitcoin might become what Jack Dorsey predicts will be the native currency. And if blockchain finds its way into Web 3.0, there might be a fair chance that Bitcoin will become what Jack Dorsey predicts is the native currency of the internet. The price of BTC might be propelled forward if this does happen. And since Web 3.0 will take at least a few years to make strides, Bitcoin's price for now. The price of BTC might be propelled forward if this does happen. And since Web 3.0 will take at least a few years to make some strides, Bitcoin's price from now until 2025 remains a close one to watch. The mainstreaming of Bitcoin has seen developments like the S&P Dow Jones launching Bitcoin indices in 2021, Bitcoin ETFs getting listed on popular exchanges like the Toronto Stock Exchange, and a few multi-billionaires are tweeting about Bitcoin, with Tesla and MicroStrategy holding BTC as an asset. Although adoption as a legal tender has still remained subdued. El Salvador's move made headlines in 2021, but other countries are still treading cautiously. As of now, major economies, including the US, are not in any mood to legalize Bitcoin as legal tender. Meanwhile, the governor of India's central bank recently called cryptos a threat to financial stability, and China has outlawed Bitcoin altogether, with a focus on its own digital yuan project. But that aside, historical price data of Bitcoin or its moving average cannot be relied upon to predict the price of this hypervolatile asset. But if the Web 3.0 project unfolds in the same manner as predicted by its proponents, with Bitcoin truly emerging as the native currency of the decentralized internet, then the coin may rise sharply. 
The reason lies in the fact that it has a limited supply of 21 million tokens. And if these tokens are acquired in the new economics of the internet, prices might rally to an unprecedented pace due to a demand frenzy. Though it seems likely that Bitcoin might not enter a six-digit price trajectory by the end of the year, a favorable turn of events with regard to Web 3.0 and BTC's adoption as legal tender may take the price to US$300,000 by the end of 2025. What's your take on Bitcoin's price trajectory? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Amos Simotov, founder and CEO of Way2VAT. Now they're headquartered in Israel and it's a global leader in integrated VAT claim and return solutions in over 40 countries and in over 20 languages, serving hundreds of enterprise businesses worldwide. It owns and operates a patented artificial intelligence technology that powers the world's first fully automated end-to-end -end VAT reclaim platform. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Amos, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> good morning to Tel Aviv from Sydney. Good morning. Good now morning first, from Tel Aviv, yeah. Now, firstly, congratulations on your recent listing on the ASX. How do you see the Thank listing you. in Way to VAT's longer term story? And how do you plan on using the funds raised? So this is a great moment for us uh, starting our listing in ASX. We've been looking on that process in the last 18 months. So uh, recently we succeeded with that. We are very happy. Um, User fund mainly will uh, support our growth uh, globally uh, in different countries, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, in the US, and uh, most importantly also in the Australian market. So bear in mind today we are working by uh, two channels, enterprise, we do a lot of uh, a direct approach to uh, big corporates around the globe. And we are the only vendor in the world today that also pro having an access for SMB market. And for SMB, we will work closely with technology partners. Therefore, having a presence in different territories is a key to our success. Excellent. And congratulations once again. The ASX welcomes you, I'm sure. Now, you have over 150 customers across 40 countries, mostly across Europe and America. Do you have any plans for expansion into these markets? Yes, so uh, today we, uh, we have some presence. Uh, we have our headquarters in London. Uh, we're going to uh, expand our uh, uh, footprint in the, in the Dutch market and Benelux and the Nordic by having another subsidiary. Um, we're going to open an uh, office in New York uh, for the US market. Uh, supporting our growth with our uh, American clients and also you know, in Sydney down the road uh, potentially for, for clients that we are starting to engage in the last few months. Excellent. Now let's look at your company in a little more detail. How does your company plan to revitalize the current tax processes and what difference is expected to make to businesses who currently use manual processes for their VAT? 
Yeah, most likely if you are looking on the industry, so most of companies are doing that manually when it comes to foreign VAT and they need to reclaim uh, simultaneously in, in 40 different countries. Uh, doing that uh, for a company, it's almost impossible. Uh, so we are providing them an access, automatically access end-to-end -to, -end, uh, to 40 different countries by AI technology, computer vision technology, patented by four different patents. Um, we are doing that today with uh, for our 180 different enterprise clients, and we're doing that also for our technology partners, mainly for the SMB. As mentioned, for the SMB market, we are the only vendor in the world providing a solution and access for small, medium, and large uh, companies in the same time. Uh, small and medium for us, it's a key market. Uh, it's a greenfield. Uh, no one is touching this market. And we think with the technology that we are having and the partnership that we'll have or having today with uh, technology partners will provide an access for any company around the globe, no matter if it's a small, large, or, or big, to access our platform and to reclaim the VAT in 40 different countries. Great. Now, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected lots of businesses across the world. And way to VAT had hoped to list on the ASX last year back in 2020, but that was postponed due to the pandemic. What has happened over the past year that allowed um, way to VAT to conduct such a strong listing for this time? Surprisingly, uh, if we are looking on the last 18 months, we grow on, you know, almost by two times. So this g gave us uh, the encourage to proceed and uh, uh, list starting the listing process uh, uh, last week. So uh, we grow by revenue two times. Uh, we grow by our pipeline. So we have a very strong pipeline in terms of the contract that's going to be signed. Shortly, we're going to announce some big contracts that we signed with big American companies. So we are very encouraging with, uh, with that. We think that, uh, and we are seeing also an increase on the business travelers in the last few months. And we hope once we will uh, we'll get more to on track in terms of uh, business travelers, we will see some dramatic growth in our business as well. Bear in mind the last 18 months, because of the uh, COVID, We've been focusing most on the local VAT for corporate. So we prepare our their uh, VAT local expenses for travel expenses in their own countries. And this brought us some significant revenue. And also uh, claiming uh, account payable, foreign account payables for companies. So now if we see that uh, the a growth in the travel business, then this will come on top of what we have already achieved in the last 18 months, and this will also contribute significantly to our revenue. And as you mentioned there, your company has had some positive tailwinds with the return of travel across the world and also digitization of taxation models driving new processes for many companies. How is Way2VAT tapping into these trends? So this is a trend that uh, we are seeing that jurisdictions are leading that in the last uh, few years. We think with the access that the different countries are providing for a company like us, doing that automatically, that means uh, we are getting all the data, we are analyzing that on a daily basis, we get the, the relevant number of the VAT reclaim, and we are submitting that automatically to their platform. The support that we are having now with different jurisdictions, helping us also to have some uh, big growth in terms of revenue and big growth in terms of return uh, to our clients. So if we are looking on four years, five years back, getting money or uh, getting uh, uh, a cash from uh, different tax authorities, uh, the timeline was between three to four months. Now we are talking about one to two months to receive the money back for our clients. And this is on, on based on the support that we are getting from the jurisdictions and also based on technology that we provided recently integrated to their platform. Well, it's been fantastic chatting with you today, Amos. And once again, congratulations on your listing.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But stay tuned to Calkine for more informative interviews. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Hello, I'm James. Great to have your company on Kalkine TV and this is the Daily Crypto Catch, proudly brought to you by Crossgate Capital. Let's now catch up on the past 24 hours from the crypto space. Investment firm Fidelity International has entered the crypto space, launching the equal cheapest Bitcoin exchange traded product, or ETP, in Europe. The Fidelity Physical Bitcoin ETP, or FBTC, is now listed on the Deutsche Börse and Frankfurt Stock Exchange and is set to list on the six Swiss exchange in the coming weeks. This physically backed ETP will allow people to invest in crypto without being exposed to the market's usual level of risk. The ETP has a total expense ratio of 0.75%, the equal cheapest on the European market. 
Fidelity International said it launched FBTC after conducting a survey which found that 70% of institutional respondents expect to invest in digital assets in the future. Fidelity International is just the latest ETF issuer to enter the digital assets market. In late 2021, US giant Invesco launched the Invesco Physical Bitcoin ETP, which listed on the Deutsche Börse. Meanwhile, Bitcoin has increased over 4% in the past 24 hours to hit just below 44,500 US dollars. Moving along, and the majority of crypto investors would hold their asset even if prices plunged dramatically, according to a report from Deutsche Bank. According to the report, over half of crypto investors surveyed wouldn't lower or completely sell their crypto positions, even if prices dropped by 80%. Additionally, nearly half of respondents say they've already left their job or are considering leaving their jobs due to the success of crypto investing. There were 3,250 respondents to the Deutsche Bank survey, of which 680 said they used cryptocurrency. Over half of those who invested in crypto say they only got into the crypto market because they believed they could make money from it. Moreover, a quarter of respondents said they believed Bitcoin would reach $110,000 apiece within the next five years. The findings of the report reveals the bullish sentiment when it comes to digital assets. However, despite this, findings also revealed that the majority of crypto transactions were for amounts of less than $100. US dollars. Moving along to today's winners and losers in the crypto space over the past 24 hours, and Metaverse token Decentraland has jumped an impressive 17% in the past 24 hours, while Secret also climbed 16% over the same period. As for today's losers, Decred fell just slightly at 0.35%, while Symbol also experienced a minor fall of 0.25%. And that's all for today's edition of the Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Kalkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James, signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Alexandra Malloy. She is a lecturer in aviation at the School of Engineering and IT at UMSW in Canberra. Her research topic is training young novice operators, drivers and pilots. 
Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Doug Alexandra, it's a very good pleasure to meet you today. Thank you, Rachel, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Now, I did mention some of your areas of research there. Could you elaborate on those for me and explain how connected is driving a car to flying a plane? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And my background research is actually in uh, training education in uh, human factors, which combines their engineering, education, design, psychology, as well as um, um, aviation and road safety research. When we talk about any high hazardous area and training of the operators, developing of those non-technical skills, and when I say non-technical skills, I mean risk management, uh, decision making, situation awareness, and many more. So when we c it comes to training, uh, there are interventions that really works from one high hazardous industry to another to develop those skills. And uh, it is evident from the number of research that I've been conducting in aviation safety as well as in road safety, in particular when training young novice operators. Now, looking to the roads, obviously speeding is a huge problem nationwide. How do you believe novice drivers can improve their speed management behavior? Um, there is historically a uh, three E's approach, which is uh, engineering, education, and enforcement. So I think these three components and approaches should work as a system to achieve that safety result and reduce the numbers that we can see still in the statistics. So one of the approaches that can reduce speeding is um, mainly in their influence in their cognitive based uh, training. So to influence uh, their awareness and perception of speed in itself. When we look at the statistics or overall, it seems that there are different types of drivers. And let's say not all young novice drivers speed on the roads, but others do. And there can be like different typology, including those drivers that can be um, in a category of uh, manipulators, deterred drivers, and um, defiers or confirmants. So, and we need to find that approach that works for all of the types of drivers. So, uh, one of the particular uh, training intervention is self-explanation, reflection, or feedback that was found quite effective in improving both young novice pilots and young novice drivers, in particular when the information and training is related to themselves and increased the awareness um, of the particular, for example, numbers of speeding or maximum speed or the average speed they're driving, the young drivers tend to attend to that. So the big problem that some drivers are not aware that they are speeding they are not aware about the consequences and the likelihood of being involved into the accident or crash. So, and that's really a problem. And I think a research-based approach would help and would be quite effective in resolving this issue. Some of the recent research uh, that has been done shows that really uh, the approach should be simple, it should be easy to understand, and it should be effective. And that's the key in resolving this issue. Uh, and I think a number of researchers, not only myself, but working on this uh, problem, uh, not only in Australia, but around the world, as we know that speeding is the widely spread risky and illegal behavior, and it consists of 41% uh, that contribute to the road crashes. So definitely there is a gap in um, training, there is a gap in the approach and the road safety approaches that with a concerted effort, and as I mentioned before, with the engineering, enforcement and education, we have to first teach our young drivers and then improve their behaviour. So in your expert opinion, do you believe Australia's driving education is satisfactory or is there scope for improvement 
Do you think there could be anything that needs to be added to the driver's test education system? Um, the statistics really shows us that there are thousands of accidents happen due to speeding or speeding related crashes. So that can be, for example, inattention to driving, but in addition with the speeding factor and excessive speed, it really increases that likelihood and severity of the crash. So at this stage, it depends what we compare Australian education to. It is quite advanced compared to many countries around the world. However, if we are looking at the approach of eliminating to, to and achieving the zero um, zero uh, a reduction of errors, so that's really just uh, you still need some effort. So, for example, in driver education, there is a standardized component of education and experience. For example, the graduate license system comprises of several stages where it is believed that young drivers will have that sort of um, uh, time to practice and also to um, learn about their driving education. Uh, the hazard perception training has been introduced, again with the aim to reduce any potential uh, risks on the road. And still there is a gap because there is not that no component when young drivers go in solo on their P driver's license. And according to the statistics, that's the most um, vulnerable stage in the graduate licenses system. Um, because when young drivers start driving on their own, they really underestimate the risks and sometimes overestimate their own skills. And as we know from the human factors perspective and the human performance uh, approach. There are limitations that people need to be aware of and uh, particular young drivers need to develop that experience and skills to be able to drive safely on the road. So basically, really there is a gap where with a concerted effort and the research-based approach, we will be able and or hopefully will be able to reduce the number of violations, reduce the number of uh, accidents related to speeding and finally to, we will we'll improve young drivers behavior. Absolutely and if we could move on to pilots in training now what are some of the cognitive based training methods that you teach young people pursuing aviation? Mm. Um, it is really interesting that those approaches that really apply to themselves and where they can analyze their own performance for example self-explanation or reflection these training approaches really show that after con uh, executing the flight or performing an action, when you receive a feedback from an instructor and in addition analyze your perform performance, like what did I do wrong? It could be done in different way. Why have I done it? And what would I do uh, differently next time? And really apply to yourself. Shows quite a good um, promise in improving their behavior. However, in comparison to another cognitive-based training, which is reflection, and when they reflect to another pilot's performance, the performance and self-reported answer shows that really they underestimate their own skills and they believe that it will not happen to me. So with that approach, looking at another uh, pilot's performance sometimes may work, but sometimes may increase their own um, skills in, re in relation to piloting. And we also need to remember that both um, pilot training or driving training is different components. So maybe it is easy to learn technically or technicalities, how to uh, operate a motor vehicle or how to operate an aircraft, but enable to manage those skills and thinking about any other factors that influence in this high hazardous and very changing and dynamic environment is really important. Because when we're driving or flying a plane, it's really a matter of several seconds to make a decision and the decision should be right. So this is a particular problematic area for young novice operators who have really limited experience in these particular areas and there are lots of risks around us. 
And just finally, with many pilots currently out of work, do you think this will push back the amount of new pilots able to be trained? What, what do you see as the future of aviation for wannabe pilots? This is very, um, I would say, painful question. Why I say painful? Because that's how the pilots feel at the moment. As um, I read recently an article saying that half of the world's population, of the pilots' population, have been grounded. And uh, it's really traumatic for them because they take their job really seriously. They love their job and they really live with their jobs. So, but I believe that after pandemic, there will be a really boom of um, flying and uh, really the need of pilots. So that's where we will be looking and the statistics will go up and the need of pilots will be probably um, even 10 times more or even more than we need now so it will be really uh, growing and booming industry so i believe that the current pilots and the new pilots will be in demand that's for sure excellent well that is great news it's been wonderful chatting with you today dr alexandra thank you so much for your time thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me Thank you. With that, I will sign off for today, but stay tuned to Calkine for more informative interviews. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkine Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media.
Hello everyone, this is Sage and welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. And today's special guest is Mr. Regulan Gautaman, the founder, CEO, director of Virtua Group. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for a creative digital product design agency and game development company based in North Sydney, Australia, who specialises in mobile apps and software. And it will, he'll also share some insights on the trending Bitcoin and blockchain space. So stay tuned. And as you know, Calkine TV brings you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. So today we're very lucky to share some time with Mr. Gauth uh, Regulan Gautaman, sorry, the director at Virtua Group. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm sure your insights will be enjoyed by our viewers. Your company is regarded as the best performing organization in serving the business and technology solutions. Would you like to tell mm -hmm. the viewers about Virtua Group and how does Virtua Technologies innovate, please? Uh, our main company is Virtua Technologies, where we build apps, games, and enterprise applications, and a lot of web apps and stuff like that. That's what we do. And uh, we work on some of the niche spaces as well. So we integrate a lot of IoT based uh, projects as well. And apart from that, we work with uh, telecommunication companies and game development companies and studios as well. Um, so that's what we do under virtual technologies. And blockchain is one of the new things that we have done. And uh, we're doing pretty well in the blockchain space as well, which is uh, the crypto space. And apart from that, our other companies, virtual imports, uh, where we have a company called Hari Guru, where we, we are actually the number one importer of a premium kids furniture in Australia. We import from Europe and a lot of different places as well. And yeah, so that's that's what the stuff that we do. That sounds fantastic. Quite a diversified portfolio of work there. Incredible. And yeah. thank you for joining us again on Calkine TV. I believe you have been a guest in the past. And mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies has since uh, really emerged into the mainstream now. And it's becoming a big part of the digital world and after largely standing aside for years, it's, it's finally yes. de developing people's curiosity and although it is such a volatile market, it's becoming more widely embraced. So what are the potential risks for consumers and financial markets? Would you like to address this? Yep. Uh, so most cases people don't really understand this is a DeFi market which is basically there is no regulations or centralized body for people to go and have some queries to be addressed and stuff like that like a regular banks and stuff so that's a, that's one of the major risk when investing in cryptos and DeFi's and stuff um, but apart from that uh, it's still driven by people and it's actually run by uh, people like regular people and stuff so it's a bit more um, uh, so far we have not seen major issues we had few 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 hacking issues and stuff like that. But apart from that, it's relatively safe compared to uh, standard financial systems. And they've been very robust in terms of transactions and, um, um, you know, cross-border tra transactions and stuff like that. They've been very efficient, I would say. Uh, yeah, but there are some risks that people need to understand as well. It's a decentralized uh, economy. Yes, and, and that decentralized factor is interesting because it kind of democratizes the whole financial system that we work in so that this kind of an even flow of, of distribution of funds, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, etc. But then the question arises, is it going to de democratize it for everyone or just those who are the computer scientists or who understand finance and, and crypto? So I guess just more awareness raising can help uh, hopefully get everyone everyone involved um, and Bitcoin's founder Satoshi Nakamoto eternalized as the as a statue in Budapest um, do you believe that it is the beginning of a more inclusive global presence for cryptocurrencies do you think it'll be actually possible in your expert opinion uh, I think uh, I do believe because cryptos you know there is like a large sectors of cryptos which is controlled by large corporations where they do large size farmings where individual mining and farmings cannot be performed in those sort of coins such as Bitcoin. Even Bitcoin you cannot mine at home. Uh, whereas Ethereum and uh, Ravencoin, Ripple, not Ripple, Ra Ravencoin and a lot of other coins you can actually mine at home as being a regular user. And all you need is just a computer. It could be a laptop, it could be just a regular PC. And so it's like a global civilian population can actually participate and without much of a hurdle and you don't really need to be super smart in computers and stuff uh, you just need to turn on your windows and run a couple of softwares and there you go you can start mining cryptos 
um, and I think a um, lot of countries also start adopting, you know, South America has got the 70 percentage coverage of uh, ATMs for Bitcoins. That's actually a pretty cool fact, which I just came to know. Um, so, yeah, so that's the adoption is pretty huge and people start getting aware of like how to start using cryptos on a real world and uh, businesses started accepting, even including our own business. We accept crypto coins as one of the payment methods as well. And uh, so the laws needs to be a bit more clear for people to understand how they have to file the capital gain or any of the taxes that need to give the government. And then I think it's it's uh, it's a much going to be a much huge industry. So it's going to be a lot of people going to be coming together to do it. Well, it's definitely an exciting space to watch. And congratulations on on your progress of now accepting cryptocurrency as payments. That's very exciting as well. So cryptocurrency exchanges and providers of crypto services are scrambling to sever business ties with mainland Chinese clients after some major crackdowns as seen last mm -hmm. Friday, issuing blanket bans on all crypto trading and mining. What do you think will be the global impacts of such a move? Um, people were expecting to be pretty drastic. You know, we lost some quite a lot of hash rates uh, coming from China to Ethereum, a lot of these networks, but um, it gained pretty quickly because, you know, like from a minor perspective, uh, if, if there is going to be less people mining and there is going to be more jobs and they generally get a bit more as the difficulty comes down. Uh, but from a consumer perspective, the transaction is going to be a bit slower and it's going to be quite a bit slower if you're going to lose few Terra hashes and stuff like that. And um, I think from a minor perspective, it is a good thing. So there is like only less people mining, so it's going to be a bit more profitable for them. And um, yeah, but again, crypto is actually DeFi. So, you know, like it doesn't matter if China's cracking down. I don't think so. They can actually block individual miners as a whole. They can actually crack down on a lot of large businesses, but uh, it's more like a peer to peer. So it's going to be pretty hard for them to crack down on uh, individuals. Uh, yeah. Exactly right. Thank you so much for your insights, because I believe China has tried to ban crypto several times over and there are discussions on the Internet, etc., about how many times can you actually ban something. So I guess they will just keep on attempting to ban crypto. But like you say, there's always that peer to peer transactions and the individuals mining. So, yes, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now, That's we yeah. have to start winding up shortly, uh, but hopefully we can fit one more question in for you. During the pandemic, sure. we saw people realizing their dependence on technology and, and further digitization, as you probably would have noticed as well, um, with the restrictions brought on by the pandemic. And the economy was um, witnessing an unparalleled boom during the same period in cryptocurrencies as well. Nearly 4,900 new cryptocurrencies entered the market since September 2020, according to Fresh yeah. Reports. Do you have any insights to share on this? Uh, there is a lot of coins coming into, into market and DeFi exchanges. And, um, you know, if you look at Binance, there is like quite a lot of new coins has been listed. Pancake swaps have got new tokens listed. So this is all coming into place. But the point is like the tokens needs to have a purpose. Um, if there is no purpose behind it, then it's going to be a bit hard. That's the reason Helium, HNT miners and those things are actually getting popularity compared to um, tokens which doesn't really have any real world problems, solving any real world problems. So IoT space, gaming space, and uh, Access Infinity, that sort of stuff is going to be pretty cool. And I think a lot of people are going to adopt that sort of tokens. And they're going to go pretty well uh, compared to tokens which doesn't have any underlying value. Yeah, you know what? I think that is what is trending, that the play-to-earn games are the way that blockchain and, and crypto is going to really make a stance in the world moving forward and hopefully with as little regulation as possible because an interesting fact that um, a lot of Axie Infinity's players are not banked. They don't really have a bank account or financial system or access to that type of thing that we're so used to, yet they are making money through Axie Infinity's tokens. So very interesting. Thank you so much yes. for your time today, Raghulan. Really enjoyed your, your insights. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Regulant Gautham, the founder and CEO, director at Virtua Group. And coming up next, please stay tuned for this week's edition of Crypto Buzz and, of course, Calkine TV's regular lineup of expert talks and market updates. This is Sage signing off for now.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. At the moment, economists are debating whether China's zero COVID policy is hurting global growth. The policy was introduced in China during the early stages of the pandemic. Its basic paradigm suggests that the protocol of find, test, trace, isolate and support are needed. The idea behind the policy is to retain the transmission of the virus and its subsequent variants. And to do so, countries have imposed stringent lockdown restrictions and border closures. It's been observed that the zero COVID policy might have been successful in the early stages of the virus's impact. However, with further mutations, the approach is relatively inefficient. The same was suggested by the WHO chief, as he said that countries should lift travel bans to recover economies and focus on public health via boosting vaccination drives. Thus, several countries like Australia abandoned the zero COVID policy and are now moving ahead to bring the old normalcy back. So why is China still sticking to this zero COVID rule? Well, despite most countries abandoning the policy, China seems to have no plans of getting rid of it anytime soon. The nation with the world's second largest economy believes that the approach has been in fact tremendously helpful in curbing deaths and case numbers. But while China might support this policy, world economists have a different view. Since the country is a significant part of the world economy, many are worrying if its inflexibility with the zero COVID policy can hurt global growth. Due to strict restrictions in the country, there's been a substantial impact on the global supply chain, particularly a significant disruption in several Chinese-based factories of top car makers. On top of this, due to extensive lockdowns, there have been disruptions and delays for the leading chip makers like Samsung, based in China. So in January, IMF Chief Kristalina Georgova said that the country should revise its zero COVID measures. She pointed out that China's extensive COVID regulations may burden the Chinese and the global economy with it. The discussion has been revisited as the Bank of Japan's policymaker has recently said that the zero COVID curbs may be hurting global growth. And according to him, the restrictions imposed by China may prolong the disruptions in the supply chain and thus the international inflationary pressure may rise. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media.
Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Thanks for tuning in to Kalkine TV. I'm James Preston and in a business news update, hotel chain Marriott International posted a strong fourth quarter profit of 458 million US dollars on Tuesday, February 15. With the release of the report, Marriott's stock was up over 5% in intraday trading. Business and leisure travel bookings saw robust growth in the holiday season despite the Omicron surge at the time, with the results far bettering initial estimates. The Maryland-based company benefited from the increased occupancy rates in its hotels as rapid vaccinations reduced people's fears for holiday travel. North America and Europe had begun relaxing COVID travel restrictions in the fourth quarter and the hotel industry was a direct beneficiary. Marriott's market cap is around 58.13 billion US dollars and it runs more than 8,000 properties globally. Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano said each region saw a significant recovery in revenue per available room in the final quarter compared to the previous quarter. However, China's zero COVID policy stalled the recovery in mainland China itself. As for a breakdown of the fourth quarter results, Marriott reported revenue of US $4.44 billion in the holiday quarter, up 105% from $2.17 billion in the prior year's corresponding quarter. Its net income also came in at 468 million US dollars or 1 US dollar and 42 cents per diluted share against a loss of 164 million US dollars or 50 US cents per diluted share in quarter 4 financial year 2020. Both the metrics topped analysts estimates. The occupancy in Marriott's key regions, the US and Canada was at 60% in quarter 4 versus 35.1% in the prior year's comparable quarter. 
The Marriott stock price was trading at 181 US dollars and 20 cents as of 5:41 p.m. GMT on Feb 15, up 5.76 percent from its previous close. Over the past 12 months, the stock returned 31.39 percent in gains, and Capuano said the new bookings across the customer segments have recovered to pre-Omicron levels despite a hitch in January, and he was of the belief a full rebound would occur in 2022. Well, that's all for this update. For more business news, market updates, and exclusive interviews, keep it locked to Cowkind TV. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm your host, Sage, and today's guest is Ms. Angie Lau, the Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News. And Forecast.News is a digital media platform headquartered in Hong Kong. It was founded in 2018 by Angie Lau, former Bloomberg News anchor. And the agency focuses on blockchain, cryptocurrency and emerging technologies in the Asia-Pacific region specifically. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And you might already know of our guest today, Ms. Angie Lau from Forecast News, the Editor-in-Chief. Welcome to the show, Angie. To be here. Thanks so much for that kind introduction. Oh, well, thank you for making time for us. So please tell us about your successful online publication that focuses on the APAC blockchain news. When did you realize there was an opening for this type of news portal? Well, you know, uh, when I was uh, at the anchor desk uh, at Bloomberg, we were already starting to see the nascent stories emerging from this alternative asset class. Um, and then hop, skip and a jump uh, a, a few years later, just kind of exploring more in depth as to the impact of the technology and potentially, uh, you know, how it could be used in media. And it was really out of that interest, curiosity, um, and already seeing its impact across many, many industries uh, that I simply wanted to learn more, know more, um, and, and acquire as much as possible. Um, and, and certainly I was not alone in this journey. I, and when I dived a little bit deeper as a journalist, you know, we we kind of know how to make our way around. And it even surprised me, uh, even so, that there was really um, that lack of uh, coverage and credibility and pedigree that 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 our global audience is used to. And so, recognizing that opportunity existed. Uh, um, and recognizing that none existed uh, until Forecast really um, felt the need to serve this space. And so um, our audience really is uh, the professionals, the senior executives, the senior decision makers um, across industries, the C-suite, uh, who understand that this technology is very impactful, want to learn more. And we do that job of explaining it in language that everyone can understand. We explain it through impact uh, and, uh, and, and the impact that we're already seeing in this space from a business, political, ec economy, social perspective. And that's forecast. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And it's so true. The passion and the enthusiasm of the people in the space is so catchy. And the information data that, that 
they deal with is so high level that it can often go well above the heads of the ordinary person. So it's an incredible job that your team are doing to keep the uh, information out there and being understood by the masses. So you've interviewed many leading names and visionaries from the crypto sector. How important, you've touched on it a little, but how important is the media's role as blockchain becomes more and more accepted into the mainstream? conscious of is that we are that bridge between the blockchain industry and mainstream audiences. Um, technology for technology's sake is uh, simply going to live in just a very closed ecosystem and that is not where the entire industry is headed. The enormous growth that we're seeing, uh, the alternative asset classes that are being developed, the alternative application of this technology across the even traditional architecture and legacy systems uh, that exist is really where this opportunity lay. It is critical in our view that people understand the technology through impact and how it's already influencing different ways of thinking about business, different ways of engaging with each other. I think you're absolutely right. It's a human right for people to be educated and have their awareness raised because there's a lot of institutional interest in this asset class at the moment. So China's most recent ban on crypto seems to have stirred the sector and is creating bustling crypto hubs in other business centers such as Singapore and maybe now Laos and even in America with Texas uh, accepting many businesses for crypto miners. What do you think are China's main aims for banning cryptocurrencies? Is it to focus on their digital yuan, in your opinion? There's, there's a lot of facets to why China is um, uh, enacting this policy. It is not a surprise. Uh, it is just uh, a, an increase in the application of this policy. Um, there's many facets, uh, as you've said. They've been working on a digital yuan, a digital currency, for the past uh, now eight years. Uh, they've got a massive head start. We will likely see something come to fruition on a global stage at the Winter Olympics in 2022. We've been reporting on the massive um, uh, pilot trials that have been happening across the country uh, uh, with respect to that. Part of it is also the um, environmental goals of China to reach uh, uh, sustainability and uh, lessen the carbon impact uh, that, his, uh, that it's promised to do. Um, and as you know, uh, crypto mining uh, has taken, um, you know, a lot of these hydro and uh, cheaper uh, electric sources uh, that allows it to mine uh, crypto, mine Bitcoin and, and the like. And so there's also uh, that kind of environmental facet to it. Increasingly, because the industry is also very aware of these challenges, um, on the technology side, there is a reduction in the computational hardship and level of uh, mining uh, cryptocurrencies. So you're starting to hear, you know, proof of work and proof of stake and, and all of these different kind of facets that allow um, the, the spend on electricity to uh, be reduced. Um, and so, so part of it is is absolutely that there is there is a a one two punch uh, when it comes to that. But China, at the end of the day, is committed to blockchain technology, um, and we are seeing policy support there with the Bitcoin, um, with BSN, the Blockchain Services Network that we're seeing rolled out as well. Yes, it's very interesting seeing the impact of the regulations and other big changes in the crypto world and how it affects the price of Bitcoin because uh, that's still something that needs to be demystified. It's still something that hasn't really been worked out yet, but it's definitely interesting to track and monitor. And some experts believe that gaming will be one way to allow DeFi systems to have a strong hold in the financial ecosphere. Some were keen to see the South Korean economy boom with the network of major semiconductor companies and supply chains. How do you think a ban on crypto will affect the South Korean economy? Um, there currently isn't a move to ban it, but enforce and restrict um, the the regulatory aspect of it, um, and to create a, a much more defined regulatory um, lane, if you will, that that defines that space. 
Um, at the moment, uh, they had just, South Korea had just enacted uh, stricter guidelines uh, that uh, govern cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, but the on-ramp, uh, so might have been reduced to maybe a handful, whereas before there were about 60, 70 crypto exchanges, now that uh, there are only four. However, despite the, the limited choice of on-ramps, the enormous appetite from South Koreans uh, that have already existed and in this space of cryptocurrency and investing in it um, remain robust. And so uh, that is that is really um, a space that both government and also uh, private enterprise are exploring very deeply. Um, to your point, it is a, it is a leapfrog um, a moment for a lot of countries in this region. And so the application, as you've said, using uh, uh, play to earn games, which we are increasingly seeing um, adoption of, allows the average person to engage in uh, a new economy, a new gamified economy, but this, uh, this, what they're earning can also be seen as, you know, um, earning uh, things that can become liquid uh, in the in the uh, you know in, in the more global uh, crypto market, and so these are the exciting things um, that that a lot of firms are exploring. At the end of the day, there's uh, decentralized finance that allows people to engage as if they were banks themselves. Um, this space has been enormously. Um, influential even in modern banking uh, thinking. And so we're increasingly seeing centralized finance or CFI or legacy, more traditional um, uh, firms thinking about how they can uh, work and earn in this space. But Sage, at the end of the day, you know, this is a technology that allows for the very first time in our human capital history for an individual to participate in the global economy. And that global economy, that opportunity to earn, exist, to transact at an individual peer-to-peer -peer level, this is what this technology provides. And this is why we're seeing enormous growth in it. Exactly right, Angie. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's about the democratization of the existing system. And it is offering a lot of people a chance who didn't have that access to the bank account or the bank as we know it in remote regions. And it hasn't been an easy 18 months for businesses with global pandemic downturns plus tensions in the South China Sea. And as a business leader, what was the most important lesson that you learned from sustaining your business through these times. What are your near-term goals as well, please? That's a really great question. Our near-term goal is to continue to grow. In fact, um, if you'll allow me uh, to share with your audience, we are launching our first ever virtual summit, Bitcoin and Beyond, November 10th. And I do uh, encourage all of you to join us. This is a space that needs to be um, to be explored, uh, to educate yourself, to inform yourself. This is going to define our next decades to come. I used to say that business in Asia was one of the most exciting stories of our age. I've redefined that uh, and uh, included emerging technologies, including blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency, because these are creating alternative systems that are defining our future right now. As a journalist, um, these are exciting times. And so uh, just head to www.forecast.news and you'll see some information there. That's F-O-R-K-A-S-T dot news. Um, but to your point, these have been very interesting times. These have been challenging times. Uh, because of the pandemic, because of COVID and all the like. Uh, but for us, in truth, we continue to grow because we've already been a distributed and remote only remote first team. We work with some of the best people around the world and we are lucky enough to do so because we don't have a centralized office that demands their time or demands their commute to this single geographical pinpoint. We can work um, quickly, uh, progressively, comprehensively with our team around the world that spans 
uh, truly in, in every region. Um, and you'll note as well that increasingly more and more of our media peers are talking about blockchain in crypto. It is no accident that our space has accelerated by at least fivefold because of the pandemic uh, situation. And it is simply this, when people are um, forced to exist online in the metaverse, if you will, and these conversations our, our everyday reality for us increasingly more and more. When the whole world experiences that this is the digital age and digital transformation is critical for any company to really think about how it's going to remain intact and survive in the future, this has also unleashed a, a recognition that emerging technologies are not only influential and impactful, but meaningful uh, at a time like this. And so it has accelerated the space. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, we um, remain robust and we continue to grow. However, one of the challenges that I have as a leader is to make sure that, that our greatest investors uh, you know, are are healthy and safe, and that that me our greatest are are truly our team. They invest their talent, their time, their energy, blood, sweat, and tears to f grow forecast. And so, I'm sure, as you know, you know, it's tough to sometimes um, know when something stops and when something starts. Especially, you know, these boundaries are so undefined, especially when we're all working so hard. So one of the challenges that I have as, as the CEO and as a leader is just to make sure that those boundaries, even if it's not defined by my team and or ignored by the team, that I make sure that they're okay and that work-life work balance uh, try as hard as we might um, exist. That's great to hear, Angie. It's so important to have the team's morale and the synergy active and, and, and up there and thought about. So thank you so much for sharing your insights and for fitting us in your busy schedule. And it will be interesting to see what this programmable money, this um, digital asset will do for money. Could it possibly do what Internet did for information? We definitely do appreciate your time. Thank you, Sage. And if you've just joined us, we had an insightful discussion with Miss Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief from Forecast News. Do check out their website. They have a brilliant uh, summit coming up beyond Bitcoin for November the 10th, and you can register via their website, Forecast News. The full recorded interview will be available via Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. Please keep watching Kalkine TV for more of the live expert talks and market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, Continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat 
as the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. With a range of restrictions lifting across New South Wales today, cinema chains will be finally able to reopen. Alongside live music, cinema chains have been particularly hard hit by government enforced lockdowns. One of those chains is Majestic Cinemas and joining me now is the CEO of Majestic Cinemas, Kieran Dell, to give us an insight about the past two years of challenges and hopefully a very bright future moving forward. Kieran, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, James. Kieran, great to have you here today. It must be somewhat of an exciting day for you. I know uh, where your base is primarily in regional locations, which haven't had the same restrictions that Sydney have. But for those who aren't familiar, first and foremost, with Majestic Cinemas, tell us a little bit about the company. Uh, how many locations do you have and how many screens in total? Uh, we uh, were founded about uh, 19 years ago. Uh, in Nambucca Heads up in uh, northern New South Wales. But uh, we now have eight sites that range from the Hunter Valley uh, through to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Uh, most of those are in regional areas, but um, we do have a site now in, uh, in Brisbane in a metro, metro area as well. We've got about, so we've got eight sites, about 29 screens altogether. Well, plenty of places to uh, grab a bit of a popcorn, a choc top and enjoy all the big movies, that's for sure. Now, what would you say separates you from some of those big chains like Event Cinemas and Reading Cinemas? I think starting in a regional area, we find ourselves much more connected to our communities. So uh, whether that's running uh, lots of fundraisers uh, that we are often doing, uh, right through to um, the fact that we program differently for all of our sites, depending on the local community. So some places like Sawtell near Coffs Harbour, uh, the cinema there has more of a, uh, an art house feel, and so they get a lot more art house movies. And others like Singleton in the mining, uh, mining area, uh, they like their big blockbusters. So each cinema is programmed differently, uh, not just a sort of cookie cutter approach, if you like. Now, in terms of that notion as well, let's say uh, take one of your sites in Port Macquarie. I know there's a big surf culture there as well. So is that something you feed into as well of the general vibe of the, of the location? Yeah, we often run um, uh, particular types of movies for, for areas. Uh, the surf, um, surf films, for example, are pretty popular in places like Port Macquarie and Sawtell that are on, uh, on surf beaches. Um, we run lots of adventure films and certain sites uh, like adventure films right through to the other end of the spectrum where some of them enjoy um, opera or art films. So uh, not all of our sites will appreciate that, so we'll have different programming depending on, on where it is. Um, but yeah, we have a, a whole lot of alternate content, as we call it, um, which is not your mainstream movies, but it's more um, specialist content, if you like. I love it. Sounds very much specially curated for uh, each individual market. Now, Kieran, obviously the past two years has been quite brutal on a lot of people, especially those, for example, in Victoria. I know you don't have uh, places down there for majestic cinemas, but you yourself, with what you're doing in terms of having a cinema chain, there's been some really tough restrictions placed on, on the business and how it can function. Can you take me through what those past two years have looked like for you? Yeah, well, two years is, uh, is a good time frame because um, uh, 18 months has been COVID. But before that, of course, um, we had significant bushfires, um, which mm. were two years ago now, um, October, November, two years ago. Uh, and that, uh, that knocked out some of our cinemas uh, from operating. It also stopped people from, uh, from attending. And obviously, people were worried about, uh, about the bushfires. It actually delayed us opening a new cinema in Kempsey because all of the people who had to finish off the building were actually out there fighting fires at the time. So we we were delayed about a month in opening uh, a new cinema. Uh, so the bushfires were what started it two years ago. Uh, obviously we had COVID hit uh, in, in last year in March, uh, but this year we also had floods and the floods um, it also closed some of our cinemas um, and caused various issues. So we've had all sorts of uh, natural disasters. COVID itself, um, you know, we were shut down from mid-March last year uh, for a bit over three months. 
completely and we were completely reliant on government support to get through, uh, as well as our, our landlords who have mostly been fantastic uh, in providing us with assistance, uh, and, and our bank um, who have also been very good. So without those three parties providing us with assistance, we wouldn't have survived. We were shut down completely for a bit over three months, but even when we opened up, we had restrictions. I think we were at uh, uh, one per four square metre, which is about a third of our normal capacity. Um, we didn't have many movies and we were running at uh, sometimes less than 10% of normal in terms of wow. our revenue. So it, it took quite some time to get back. That was sort of July last year when we reopened. Um, over some of the period where we've had some big movies and the biggest issue for cinemas has been that, that even though we might have been open in Australia, they weren't necessarily open overseas. Mm. And so if they weren't open overseas, the big film studios weren't going to release big movies like you know, Top Gun Maverick or James Bond which had been delayed multiple times. So um, we didn't have much content for people to see. And so some of the things we were showing were not um, necessarily things we would normally show on a cinema cinema screen. So we've had to navigate through probably at about 40% on average of our normal over the last uh, year and a half through COVID. But we've had times with holiday periods like at Christmas and so on with some big movies, particularly some great Australian movies last Christmas, like The Dry, mm. that... Um, uh, you know, we could operate it up to two thirds of normal capacity, but we're still struggling to get back to that um, that full uh, business, if you like. What's been the impact on staff? Because I know you've mentioned you had you know the support of uh, landlords and banks and also government grants, but did you find you had to scale back a fair bit in terms of people you're employing? Yeah, uh, in March last year when we we closed about uh, we stood everyone down we had 140 staff um, a lot of those staff were casuals might be school kids uni students um, but a, a good core of about 40 senior staff across our, our eight sites and we had to stand everyone down myself included and everyone had to initially apply for Centrelink benefits and um, of course JobKeeper came along and that made life much uh, much easier so mm. so we but that could only apply to our 40 senior staff. So the other 100 kids, um, you know, I had one day there where I had to basically terminate the employment of 100 people in one day uh, on, on bulk. And that's not, that's not a fun thing to have to do um, because we just couldn't afford to pay uh, JobKeeper to 140 people and about 90 people might have qualified. But some of these young kids were 16, 17 and it didn't make sense. So, so we had to uh, terminate all of those staff um, we've been pretty lucky, and uh, hopefully it's not just luck, but most of our senior staff have stayed with us through the whole period. Um, and, and they've stuck it out. It's been really hard mentally for them, uh, actually in some cases, but, but with JobKeeper and now the, the, the various other programs that are in place through Centrelink, um, everyone's been able to, to manage and, and get through financially. It's more the, the mental side. And, and so this second set of lockdowns this year have actually been a lot harder on our staff than last year because there was less certainty uh, about when we were going to perhaps come to an end, how it was going to end. We're now dealing with issues of, um, of how we check people's uh, vaccine um, uh, status. And, and so this second lockdown this year, and we haven't had JobKeeper, we've had different levels of support which have been a bit more clunky from government. And so it's been a bit more uncertain and changing quite rapidly. And so the mental uh, health of our staff has been foremost so um but you know we are you know our staff have come through this uh really well both um uh, financially and hopefully mentally and are looking forward to getting busy again well let's focus on the financials now for just a moment obviously it's been a, a very tough two-year period but i just want to take you to the start of COVID back in march last year were you experiencing a lot of fantastic growth with the business up until that and do you find that it you know, COVID hitting really sort of hammer that on the head. Is that what occurred for you? Our business is a funny one because it, it's very much relies on the quality of, uh, of the movies that we have over a period of time. And so uh, Hollywood, probably the previous financial year before the bushfires and everything, it had a pretty average year, I have to say. And we get that about one every three years. Um, but we were, we were hitting our straps uh, that, that financial year when COVID hit. Uh, we had a great program set up and we certainly felt that, uh, that the business was growing. Personally, we were, um, we were building a new site in Brisbane at the time. Uh, we were just about to launch uh, a site in Kempsey that had been, uh, had been built. And we had about two or three other sites in Queensland that we were working on. So from a growth point of view in terms of the business, um, those, those sites um, we basically had to walk away from. We hadn't quite signed the deals. Um, and so it did stymie the growth in our business. 
Um, the movie business itself, it, you know, it goes up and down, but generally does go up over time. And uh, we were looking forward to a big year last year. The What's happened, though, is a lot of those movies didn't get released. Some mm. were given to streaming platforms and, and so on, but most of them have been delayed. And so we're now seeing those movies that we would have showed last year um, showing this over this year. And we would expect that to, to return the industry to growth, um, yeah, probably from, uh, from Christmas onwards. Well, you may mention there of uh, streaming platforms and how they've received a bunch of the content that would usually be fi finding its way into the cinemas itself. How has the impact of streaming affected cinema chains more broadly, do you think? It's, it's not quite what people think. If, if I had a dollar for every time someone asked that question, I'd be very rich. Um, <laughs> people ask me, Hasn't, doesn't streaming kill cinemas? And it has it. In fact, the opposite. Um, what all the research shows is that the more people stream content, the more they're consumers of content, the more they will actually go to the cinema. But the difference is twofold. One is that people want to see certain content at the cinema, so they, they don't necessarily mm. want to see um, the medium-sized movies, uh, let's call them the B-graders, the, the little thrillers, that sort of thing, uh, the romantic comedies even. They want to see the big blockbusters. And then we have an older audience and a family audience that want to see perhaps uh, smaller kids' movies like a Paw Patrol, um, which is not, uh, you know, which is big on TV, but will come to the cinema at various times. Or the older um, customers who, who want to see some of those smaller movies. So you've seen the big blockbusters, the small movies, some of the family movies um, focus on cinema, but those medium-sized um, sort of second-tier films uh, have, have gone a lot to, to streaming. So what that's meant is that the studios, to keep the, um, the supply of movies going, have made, are making more and more blockbusters than they ever did. So something that has that big screen impact and you need the big sound. The other, the other impact of streaming, I suppose, is we've all got used to, to getting things on demand. When we click a button, mm. we can watch it now. And so as, as cinemas, of course, it doesn't work quite like that. The, the cinema session times are, are set. But what we're moving towards as we're building new cinemas and even refurbishing older ones is we're building more screens and smaller screens so that um, when Tenet came out, for example, in August, which is the one big blockbuster we had last year in that period, uh, I know at Port Macquarie we were running it on the hour every hour in three different cinemas. And so it's about convenience for people and streaming has taught people to want convenience. So we find that we've got to have more screens that are perhaps smaller that enable the convenience of, uh, of times. But, but streaming itself um, can coexist and, and will coexist with, um, with cinema quite easily. Where it's been challenging over the last year is, um, is what's called the window between something being released in the cinema and something being released at home, whether it's on more likely a streaming service of some sort these days. And often there's a cost to that in the home initially as well. That's come under some pressure during the pandemic. Some of the studios have experimented, shall we say, with uh, putting things on streaming at the same time as cinemas. Uh, some of them, just to get some money in, we were all looking for, um, for revenue in that period, uh, sold some of their movies to streamers. Remember, the streamers are also reliant on getting a steady supply from cinema of product. Mm. So those middle-sized movies, when the studios are allowed to put them out onto home video uh, a little bit earlier, and onto the streaming platforms, that we might actually see more of a choice at cinemas than we've had in the last little while. <laughs> so we might see more content. So I think we'll see a change in the, in the content. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more... Uh, upgrading of cinemas. So in Brisbane, where we built our new cinema, the opening in March, we have um, uh, two premium cinemas with uh, reclining seats and the, the food and beverage uh, solution. They've been big in the cities. We might start to see those uh, branch out from the cities a little bit more because it is about the experience. And, and if you can come and, uh, and, and be in a recliner seat and be served uh, some food and uh, some alcohol, um, people are prepared to pay a little bit more for that in a lot of areas, perhaps not a lot of the regional areas uh, as yet but it is starting to uh, see an improve in that experience. So we, we will see changes over the next while. Well, there's nothing quite like feeling like a VIP, that's for sure. Kieran, thank you so much for joining me today, and hopefully we can chat again quite soon. We will. Thanks. Thank you, James. Well, that's Kieran Dell, CEO of Majestic Cinemas, and if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the full thing on our YouTube channel, Kaukai Media, along with our extensive catalogue of expert talks. That's all for this edition of Executive Horner Expert Talks, though. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Thank you.
this is Rachel live from Calkine Studio and you're watching the IPO Corner, a weekly show dedicated to IPO market performance and we bring you hot public offerings and all important information about the listing companies under the spotlight. However, before investing in any shares, investors need to understand the business prospects and operations in detail such as future risks and returns. This can include changing the IPO price or issuance date as the companies see fit. Let us now look at some recent IPO listings and their performance. Starting with Killy Resources, they listed on the ASX recently. The Gold and Rare Earths Explorer raised $6 million at 20 cents at the IPO. Killy Resources is a gold and copper explorer with its key projects located in the Tanami region of Western Australia and the Charters Towers Ravenswood region in Queensland. Next up, My Rewards International raised $5 million from investors at 20 cents a share. My Rewards International is Australia's leading provider of rewards and benefits solutions for employers, retailers, associations and businesses wanting to connect with their members. Then we have WA1 Resources. They raised $6 million in their initial offering at 20 cents a share. WA1 owns 100% of three West Australian exploration projects, considering prospective for copper, gold and nickel. Let's take a look at the IPO scheduled before the end of this month. The proposed Catalano Seafood IPO is slated for the 24th of February at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, according to the ASX IPO announcements. One of Western Australia's most cherished seafood businesses is expanding its operations interstate. Catalano Seafood is a West Australian family business established in 1969. It operates with around 70 staff. And in 2020 and 2021, it handled a total of over 2,000 tonnes of seafood. Catalano is strategically positioned in the eye of the seafood supply chain across processing, wholesaling, packaging, retail and export. The company is undergoing an initial public offering to raise up to $7 million at 20 cents a share. The company will use the funds to focus on an aggressive expansion strategy. Moving on to the next company, and according to ASX announcements, Omnium Metals Group has proposed its plans to list on the ASX on the 21st of February. Omnium Metals is a mineral explorer with a current focus on copper, nickel, platinum group elements and gold. The company is building a portfolio of exploration projects in Western Australia and the Northern Territory via acquisition, which it intends to systematically explore and develop. The company has entered into separate agreements with Kimberley Mining, Kimberley Island Holdings, Mr. Peter Lewis and GTT Metals to acquire 100% of the Order Basin project and the Albany Fraser project. Omnia Metals looks to raise up to $5.5 million at 20 cents a share in its IPO. Well, it's time to wrap up the show, but let me share this critical information first. Before investing in IPOs, investors must check the credibility and the track record of the company. The risk appetite level varies with investors, and they need to consider factors such as an analysis view, brokerage ratings, industry outlook, performance, and the peers review before making an investment decision. Also, it's important to note that companies can change the IPO price or issuance date as they see fit. Well, that's all for now on the IPO Corner Show. Stay tuned to Calkine. We have many more shows for you with live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
For the past few years, cryptocurrencies have seen exponential growth. More and more investors, especially young investors, are turning to crypto to help escape financial pressures of the modern world. As part of crypto's emerging presence into the mainstream, filmmakers are creating exclusive content, whether it be documentaries or full-blown feature films, that provide more of an insight into the crypto world and the personalities within it. So in this video, I'll take you through three high-profile crypto films that are worth checking out. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. The first film to check out is Cryptopia, Bitcoin, Blockchains and the Future of the Internet. Directed by famous filmmaker Torsten Hoffman, the Cryptopia movie gives viewers a deep dive into the world of the blockchain industry, delving from the fundamentals of Bitcoin, the world's leading cryptocurrency, to issues plaguing traditional finance. With a who's who of the crypto world featured in the movie, it's a good knowledge accumulation resource for anyone who wants to delve further into the space. The one and a half hour movie is being streamed on Amazon Prime for viewers. The second film is Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it. Now this one is another Hoffman special, which was his first movie on the subject and it was released back in 2015. It gives viewers a grasp of the evolution of Bitcoin and how it's made a place for itself in the financial world. For viewers of how Bitcoin can replace the traditional form of currency, this is an excellent film to watch and learn from in terms of how it could indeed coexist with traditional forms of fiat currency. And lastly, there's Netflix Explained Cryptocurrency. This is perhaps one of the best quick take guides on the world of cryptos. The 15 minute clip more or less gives an overview of how the world of tokens works. It doesn't bore you with the complicated mumbo jumbo topics, but in a simple language intends to lay out the benefits and risk of getting into the world of cryptocurrency. This short film is part of a series that covers a wide array of topics in short form. So there you have it, three films worth checking out if you're a crypto enthusiast or you're just wanting to gain a little bit more information on what is at times a very complex space. And if you are looking to increase your knowledge, well, a great way to start is by subscribing to Kaokai Media. So go ahead and click that subscribe button along with the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kaokai. And of course, if you did enjoy this video, please make sure to like, share and comment. For more information, just head across to the website, kaokaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kaokai. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media.
Volatile stocks are deemed to be highly risky in the financial world, but as they say, with great risk comes the potential for great rewards. Volatility of the stock has a quantifiable value known as beta that measures the range of return for a given security in relation to market index. It measures the dispersion through standard deviation or variance between returns. A security that fluctuates more than the market index has a beta of more than 1.0, and one that fluctuates less than the market index has a beta of less than 1.0. So with that said, let's take a look at the five most volatile FTSE stocks that you should be keeping an eye on. Let's begin with Harbour Energy PLC with the trading code HBR. FTSE 250 constituent Harbour Energy PLC is the UK's largest independent oil and gas company with operations in the UK, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Norway, Vietnam and the Falkland Islands. Harbour Energy PLC's stock has a beta of 4.16 and it's given a return of negative 13.09% to its shareholders in the past year and its year to date return stands at 3.1%. Its shares were trading at GBX 364.8, down by 0.6%, with a market cap of nearly £3.4 billion. John Menzies PLC with the trading code MNZS. John Menzies PLC is a leading global provider of landside and airside services. The company has developed to become a critical partner in the global aviation sector, offering logistics and support services. John Menzies PLC stock has a beta of 3.82 and it's given a return of 108.15% to its shareholders in the past year and its year to date return stands at 48.04%. Its shares were trading at GBX 460 down by 3.76% with a market cap of £439.29 million. Sign World Group PLC with the trading code SIGN. FTSE 250 constituent Sign World Group PLC is the world's second largest cinema chain that operates through 767 sites with 9,311 screens across 10 countries. Sydney World Group PLC stock has a beta of 3.57 and it's given a return of negative 46.9% to its shareholders in the last year and its year to date return stands at 26.4%. Its shares were trading at GBX 40.5 up by 3.13% with a market cap of £539.18 million. Costain Group PLC with the trading code of COST. Costain Group PLC is a construction and engineering company that offers consultancy and advisory, future shaping strategic consultancy, asset optimization, digital technology solutions, and complex programmed delivery solutions to its clients. Costain Group stock has a beta of 3.31 and is given a negative return of 13.48% to its shareholders in the past year and its year-to-date return stands at negative 4.89%. Its shares were trading at GBX 47, down by 5.43%, with a market cap of £136.65 million. And lastly, Tullo Oil PLC with the trading code TLW. Tullo Oil is a multinational oil and gas exploration and production company with a primary focus on Europe, Africa and South America featuring more than 50 exploration and production licenses located across 11 countries. Tullo Oil PLC stock has a beta of 3.28 and it's given a return of 64.28% to its shareholders in the past one year and its year to date return stands at 9.71%. Its shares were trading at GBX 51.16 down by 1.24% with a market cap of £742.18 million. So there you have it, the five most volatile FTSE listed stocks that could well be worth watching for the investor with a riskier appetite. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and press that bell icon. Also, you can check out the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. 
Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. Jacobs with you for Calkine. In this segment, we're exploring all you need to know about Nexo Crypto. Before we dive in, hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen. Nexo is primarily a lending platform that offers users instant crypto backed loans for quick access to cash and support for maintaining digital assets. The users can deposit leading tokens as collateral to receive an instant loan in the form of cash or stablecoin. Backed by its native token, Nexo, it allows users to get discounts on the interest accumulated on the existing loans. It also provides an opportunity to receive interest payments against the accumulated funds. Nexo Crypto's rise seems to be on the back of its Metaverse announcement on 7th of February. Anthony Trenchev, co-founder and managing partner of Nexo, suggested that it aims to create a whole new economy with crypto as its main currency through its Metaverse plans. Nexo has been performing well over the past two weeks, registering gains of 24.2% and 10.3% in the last 14 days. Launched in April of 2018, it targets to solve the issues related to the lending market and can offer smart contracts and Ethereum-backed loans as an automated lending process. When users deposit a certain amount to repay the loan, Nexo's blockchain returns the cryptocurrency, thereby keeping track of the transactions. Nexo maintains the database of the clients who continue to use the platform and provides royalty for for its loyal followers. So Nexo's loyal customers automatically form a part of its loyalty program where they can access 30% of its profits in the form of dividends. Nexo investors will be happy to see its bullish run come back and hope that the rally lasts for a longer period. Investors can take heart because Metaverse plans are getting good traction with the participants and the future looks promising. 
But that's it for this topic. Head to the website for more, calkindmedia.com, and make sure you do like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you for joining me. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements. With Kalkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Yeah. I'm your host, Sage. And in today's show, we have a special guest, Mr. Tom Lipsinski, co-founder and CEO of Reply. He will share valuable insights in operating a unique HR tech startup. And Vply is a web application that allows candidates to apply for jobs with a video profile. Finding a job is challenging and Vply allows job seekers to make an impactful first impressions. As you know, they last a lifetime. And so applicants are able to create a short video instead of just sending their traditional CV and cover letter. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. And very lucky to share some space today with Mr. Tom Lipsinski. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. Big fan. And I hope I'm getting close to your name, getting correct. Is that sounding... You are very, very <laughs> close. It's, uh, it's definitely a pass mark, so um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we're keen to share your insights on the show. The employment sector has been in the spotlight during this downturn, and we'd love to hear how your unique startup is helping people to gain employment. So, Tom, how has the recruitment industry responded to the concept of video applications instead of traditional CVs? Yeah, look, I, I think to start off, obviously, you know, 2020 has been a very disruptive year for many people, many sectors, and HR is no different. Um, so I think what, what started off very quickly is the adoption of video interview platforms. Um, so obviously, you know, you start off with a job search on the traditional job board, but then you sort of progress to a video interview platform. So reply is one step before that. What we do is we actually allow job seekers to apply with a 30 seconds to, you know, to 60 second video. And quite quickly, we have actually grown to, to list over 30,000 jobs on our platform. And we have 20,000 job seekers basically putting their hands up saying, I'd love to be employed by your company. Uh, so yeah, we have a community of job seekers on Vipply right now, you know, looking for jobs from Christmas casuals to, to accountant and, you know, senior executives. So um, yeah, it's been quite a, um, quite a natural, I guess, progression from the adoption of video in the last couple of years. Absolutely. We couldn't have really survived or made it through the pandemic downturn and social distancing and working from home without video conferencing and even attending medical appointments and things like that. And so why not Absolutely. use this same technology for applying for jobs? It seems that we're definitely scaling that way. And Vapply is able to ensure that they're constantly innovating to stay ahead of the curve every step of the way. How do you ensure this is possible? Yeah, I think in terms of innovation, again, we, we are quite different from traditional job boards. And I think one focus that we have is putting job seekers first. I think we're very conscious of how difficult it's been over the last couple of years uh, for job seekers to apply for jobs, you know, with, with so many disruptions in terms of industry shutting down, opening up. And uh, so, yeah, we, we really want to make the job search as enjoyable as possible. I guess looking for work is never uh, enjoyable, but uh, yeah, we want to focus on 
if a job seeker applies for a job, how can we make it fun and sort of interactive? So, you know, we've developed things such as speech to text technology. Um, again, so that part would actually be quite interesting to hiring managers when people, you know, say a lot of interesting things about themselves, their achievements, whether it's academic or career uh, achievements or unique facts about themselves, all of that would be, um, I guess, browsable or available for hiring managers to grasp and, I guess, collate and, you know, make the right uh, hire. Exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And now with the easing of restrictions set to occur very soon in Australia, um, I guess more people will be out there looking for work, more shops will be opening up again. So this app, your application, will hopefully be put to good use. And I've heard the Tech Council of Australia is looking to fill one million tech jobs by 2025. So that your... Um, in a very good space there and hopefully we are able to create Absolutely. those jobs for those tech grads and you've created a revolution 100%. Tool for the recruitment industry and please give your expert views on how job seekers and companies can build their brands through vply please yeah, absolutely. So firstly, yeah, I guess in terms of uh, things opening up 100% so we're in a great spot to you know, a lot of people would be looking for work now. They're in you know, it's been quite difficult and, uh, to look for work with so much uncertainty, but as things start to open up and restrictions are easing, uh, yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot more activity on our site and people are uh, just, yeah, I think the shackles are off and people are starting to, to look around and, you know, even look in different locations where traditionally they've been obviously stuck within the, uh, their own little community. So I guess, you know, when we talk about personal brands, it's, it's super important for us. So what we're encouraging for employers to do is to, you know, because we're video friendly, we're encouraging employers to post as much video content about them as possible. Again, just focusing on the job seeker, what would be interesting to a job seeker is, I guess, to have a virtual walk around the office. Um, who are you sitting next to? What does it look like? Um, so yeah, we're encouraging employers to post such contents to give job seekers the best I guess, overall opinion on what it would be like to work at this company. Um, so yeah, personal brands and, you know, company brands and emphasis on brand in general, yeah, very, very important. And uh, yeah, video will help with that. Yes, it's amazing how much data a video can actually relay. It's so important for people to know what they're getting into for employers and job seekers, you know, vice versa. And I suppose it saves the employers a lot of time as well, being able to um, screen interviewees quickly um, with video absolutely yeah I think I think that's one of one of the benefits of apply is that you can make a decision much quicker right instead of cycling through thousands of CVs uh, you can you know within a 30 second or 60 seconds uh, video you can make a pretty quick decision in terms of uh, would that individual fit our culture you know um, are the qualifications real is that um, you know, is the passion really there? So yeah, we're not excluding CVs. I, I definitely understand the importance of CVs and cover letters. However, yeah, you can get quite a lot of information from a, from a 30 second video even. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing your passion for your project. Uh, it's definitely inspiring to talk to the business leaders who are inventing these innovations that are so important during this time of social distancing. It's become quite a cold place, the world, and we're not allowed to talk to each other, you know, uh, and we hardly see each other and, and these video applications I think really do personalize the process so with per personalizing content and making it more interactive um, how do these videos address the lack of human connection as well in as part of the first stage of the hiring process yeah it's a great question I think um, you know I've been a job seeker all of us have looked for, for work at one point in time or the other uh, so I think one, one thing I've always found is how easy it is to apply for, for jobs, right? You get, um, you know, various sort of content, job boards, emails coming through. With one click, you can just apply for 20 jobs in a five-minute train journey. So I think that disconnect from are you really invested in that job? Are you passionate about it? Um, it it's kind of gone and it's, it's quite a lot of, I guess, desirable employers are getting so many applications and job seekers don't even remember applying for them. So for us, um, 
you know, we're re really looking at videos in terms of, you know, to do a video, you have to be passionate. You have to focus on a specific employer. You have to talk about yourself. Um, you have to talk about your achievements and, you know, unique facts about you. So I think we are bringing that humanity back. And when it comes to the actual real interview, it, it becomes a lot more memorable and enjoyable both for the job seeker and the hiring manager. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely think having that video component brings element of humanity and that human connection back. Exactly, and that is so important, especially in your space of HR. You really want to get to know what a person's goals are, what their aspirations are, what they've got to offer, and how they fit the position that you're trying to fill. And the HR industry is also being affected by technological developments as you are bringing into the space. In the short term, how do you plan to pursue more technological innovation and what's the latest subject in your research and development area? Yeah, look, we've got quite a lot, but I'll cover a couple that are, I guess, um, the most relevant and the ones that we are working on. So I did touch on that browsable job seeker library. So whatever people say, you can search for it. Someone has done a Byron Bay triathlon. Um, someone can actually search for Byron Bay Triathlon and find that job seeker. So it's quite a unique feature where people can talk about themselves and be quite open and at the same time be, you know, uh, more searchable or have certain tags or keywords that um, would be quite of quite a lot of interest to certain employers. Uh, but yeah, we are working on things such as light and sound, obviously. This is a very good example, right? To make sure that you can hear me properly, the light's good, you know, the, the contrast is good enough. So basic things like that to even calculating how quickly you speak. So if you speak quite quickly, um, you could be a stockbroker, right? Um, or if you have a really slow, calm and soothing voice, maybe you're more suited to a storyteller. Obviously, I'm generalizing here, but having a word per minute counter would be quite a lot of interest to certain industries. Um, I've been approached by, for example, partially partially blind community of how frustrating it is for them to use CVs and cover letters to find work and, you know, once one spelling mistake and obviously they disqualified altogether from uh, seeking a great employer because of certain bots um, deleting their CV. So how can we be of use to partially blind community? Um, and another one, just lastly, unconscious bias. That's always a big one when it comes to videos. So for certain employers, they use audio only at the very beginning. So yeah, we have um, certain sort of um, tools where you can hide the video initially. You can even hide the name initially and just listen to the audio or just, just see the transcript. And later on, if you're happy with that, um, open up the video and uh, yeah, additional sort of names and so on. So yeah, very big on, I guess, unconscious bias when it comes to video, just to make sure that everyone gets a fair go. Fantastic. Well, sounds like a great innovation and best of luck with your near term goals, Tom. Thanks so much for making time for the show today. Thanks again. Appreciate it. And if you've just joined us, viewers, we had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Tom Lipsinski, the co-founder and CEO of Vply. The full interview will be available at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel, so please check it out. But stay watching Kalkine TV for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight 
to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calcai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calcai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Alltech Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Alltech Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine Media. Australian EV startup Tritium is set to build a new production plant in the US in the coming months. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcine Media. Tritium's new plant is to be established in Tennessee and will produce approximately 30,000 electric vehicle fast charges a year. It's been estimated that it'll also create roughly 600 local jobs. So what's been the major reasons behind Tritium's expansion into the US and how is the position for future growth? Well, Tritium CEO Jane Hunt appeared beside US President Joe Biden at the White House recently. She discussed the company's expansion plans in the US and according to Hunt, the e-mobility facilitator's shift to the country is a direct result of Biden's electric vehicle policies. The administration is expected to announce a statewide allocation of five billion U.S. dollars in funding for EV charges. So that certainly has served as an incentive for the Australian company to take the leap. Tritium also has seen an uptick in demand for its charges in North America, and this is one of the main reasons why the manufacturer turned to the U.S. Tritium's Tennessee factory is to begin production by the third quarter of 2022, and in the next five years, the new plant is anticipated to create over 500 or 600 jobs, perhaps in the region. Hunt also added that the Australian market, where the electric cars represent only 1.9% of light vehicles, is lagging behind other developed nations. She believes that the government should frame policies aimed at boosting EV take-up rather than simply offering parking spaces. While Tritium's upper management seems disappointed with Australia's policies, the Morrison government welcomed their continental move, noting that it was also supporting EV charging infrastructure in Australia. And as the Australian startup announced its expansion plans in the US, its shares closed 39.47% higher shortly after. Even President Biden celebrated this decision, lauding it as a great news for the American workers as well as for the planet. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mitchell Travers. Mitchell is the co-founder and MD of Oz Merchant. Oz Merchant is um, something we're going to chat to at Calcine where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello Mitchell and welcome to Calcine. Hey. Yeah, great to be on the show. Good to speak with you today. Now, firstly, Mitch, we'd love to hear more about the company and if you could talk about the innovative wealth management portal that you have there. Yeah, so Osmotion is a digital currency exchange um, and what we're looking to do is provide an easy transition between traditional finance and the new emerging blockchain-enabled financial system. Um, so our wealth management portal is a custodial wallet um, which can host up to 150 different uh, cryptocurrencies for all of our uh, merchant customers, business to business customers, um, investors, consumers. Um, and what we do is we support them with the Australian dollar, fiat, on ramp, off ramp into this digital currency ecosystem, um, but also look to offer future products such as um, decentralized finance, savings accounts, um, a blockchain back office accounting solutions, so businesses can issue invoices in Australian dollars but receive payment in cryptocurrency and give their uh, the option um, of payment options. So, yeah. Excellent. It sounds wonderful. Now, the blockchain approach to finance is more streamlined and advanced and also transparent. In your opinion, how will the blockchain approach transform the finance industry globally over the next few years? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question, actually. And I think that we'll see more transformations um, over time as well. And the really great thing about uh, the blockchain approach to finance is that uh, you can really leverage this um, triple entry accounting system where uh, transactions are auditable on a public chain, they're secured, they're immutable. Um, so there is more transparency, as you said, and auditability to any transaction that goes through, um, which has all sorts of benefits for um, regulators, uh, such as the ATO um, doing tax, uh, as well as uh, innovators in fintech, um, allowing for you to leverage the technology to create more amazing products to ease our financial transition, get access to new um, income streams, uh, et cetera. There's yeah, some fantastic benefits to blockchain technology. Now, for people who are new to digital currencies, can you give your expert opinion on how they can become accustomed to the future of finance? Yeah, so I think a good way to start um, with digital currencies is um, to sort of ease your way in, uh, take a moderate risk, one that you're able to um, really justify. Uh, my suggestion to a lot of our clients is to dollar cost average in. Um, so buy a little bit of Bitcoin or Ethereum um, every month um, for some time while you educate on the market and learn about uh, the advantages of blockchain technology and uh, the potential it has to revolutionize multiple financial services and um, general industries. And then after you are more comfortable with the technology, perhaps go through a industry custodial provider such as Oz Merchants so there is less technology vulnerabilities and you can have a trusted partner to help you ease with that transition. Um, that's when you can really make more educated um, decisions on entering the market in a more profound way. Um, so, yeah. And do you see a specific demographic coming to Oz Merchant? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Oz Merchant is quite unique in the Australian digital currency market, um, actually, because we're focusing on doing a business to business service offering. So, we help merchants um, accept cryptocurrency as payment. Um, we give them the option to automatically transfer and trade that into Australian dollars so that their, um, the price of their product is not affected by the market volatility. Um, so there has been a significant uptick actually in merchants, especially luxury goods, uh, looking to leverage the benefits and the whole new investor class who are getting wealthy in cryptocurrencies who are now looking for ways to spend it. Um, so a few of our clients, such as uh, a sports car dealership, are only getting more and more customers sending requests through to pay their invoices in cryptocurrency, uh, and that's the service that we provide. Um, I guess another trend we see is 
Um, crypto is easier for younger generations to understand and jump in. Um, so we're actually seeing an emerging wealth class um, of these younger generations who have been in the crypto industry for a few years now, uh, who ha now have disposable income that they had not previously ever had access to or been high net worth individuals. So it's quite an interesting space for these businesses and merchants to reach a whole new um, sort of customer base of wealthy younger individuals. Totally. And how do you believe the pandemic has affected the overall crypto market? Yeah, so interestingly, I think the pandemic has been, uh, to an extent, a benefit for the crypto market because what we're talking about here is largely digital money, right? And during the pandemic, a lot of people, unfortunately, were stuck at home. More time was spent on the internet and we're seeing a lot more communities and online communities actually growing while people find belonging online as opposed to in the sort of physical world. Um, so cryptocurrency, I think, has largely benefited and we've seen a huge uptick in the amount of wallets and users uh, creating and entering the market um, as this news uh, disseminates throughout the entire online world. Um, we get, yeah, uh, the pandemic affecting it. Um, in a positive way. I think uh, another sort of contrast to that is the way that the pandemic affects the traditional markets largely and the evidence of that this week has been quite evident. Um, we can see that the traditional equities um, had a bit of a shock uh, last week and over the um, previous time due to the high energy prices and a, few, a lot of news coming out of America um, with the debt ceiling and what cryptocurrency enables is an alternative uh, to that and we're actually seeing in more recent times, a decoupling of the correlation between the price of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and traditional equities. Um, so I'm quite interested to actually follow that progress and see if that correlation, the break of correlation continues um, to sort of show that pandemic trend. And just finally, Mitchell, in the current revival phase, what should be the strategy for investors to frame a tailor-made approach to entail the best returns? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm a strong advocate of dollar cost averaging, as I mentioned before, um, especially if you're new to the market. Um, another thing I would suggest is really focusing on the major two currencies, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, to begin with when you enter the market. They have the most um, somewhat uh, liquidity available, and they're also the most secure blockchains. Um, so you're really looking at the strongest assets in the ecosystem. Uh, once you are com comfortable and confident with those assets, you can then start to diversify your portfolio with a, a smaller percentage um, in these more high risk but asymmetric investment opportunities um, in the terms of other cryptocurrencies uh, which service the entire ecosystem, uh, such as decentralized finance or even NFTs. Well, it's been fantastic to chat with you today, Mitchell, and to learn more okay. about Oz Merchant. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to next time. Thank you. Excellent. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tons of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by two degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calcai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calcai Media's valued clients Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka.
The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. With the crypto market beginning to re-emerge from a prolonged dull phase, investors are returning to the market and are looking for big gains. The majority of the attention will be on some of the biggest market cap projects, Bitcoin, Ethereum and BNB. So in this video, we'll take a look at these projects and how things might pan out moving forward. Just before we do though, please subscribe and of course click that bell icon. Now, Bitcoin is gradually creeping back. Having hovered around the 68,000 US dollar mark around three months ago, it dipped to just $29,000 on January 1. But it's now hovering about the 40K mark per coin and has found stable footing at this price, indicating that it could be set for another surge. Currently, Bitcoin has a share of almost 42% in the total market cap of all cryptos tracked by CoinMarketCap. This is no mean feat when we know that CoinMarketCap tracks more than 17,000 different crypto assets. Bitcoin's market cap is nearly US $830 billion at this point in time. El Salvador's experiment of Bitcoin as legal tender, India's move to tax cryptocurrency investments instead of outlawing them, and the launch of Bitcoin ETFs and other similar events might decide the price trajectory in the days to come. If the crypto market stays bullish, Bitcoin could well reach $55,000 by the end of the first half of 2022. Ethereum, the world's second largest crypto project, is, for the uninitiated, a popular blockchain network with support for new tokens and NFTs. Ethereum accounts for an 18% share of the total market cap of the crypto space. That equates to nearly $380 billion US dollars. Now, Ethereum faces fierce competition in smart contracts from new players like Solana and Phantom. But with wider adoption of DeFi and NFTs and Ethereum's shift to a new consensus mechanism, demand for the Ether token may also rise. By the end of the first half of this year, Ether could well touch $4,000 a piece. But for this to happen, it has to maintain that edge over other networks. And lastly, Binance Coin ranks as the fourth largest crypto by market cap, accumulating for nearly $70 billion. It ranks just below Tether, which is a stable coin. In other words, a coin that is not designed for investing, but instead is pegged to the US dollar. One Tether equates to one dollar. Binance Coin is a wide-ranging project with a blockchain network and a cryptocurrency exchange. BNB faces competition from other DeFi projects that have bet on decentralized exchanges, which help earn revenues without liquidating the crypto asset. BNB may touch $600 by the end of June 2022 if the wider crypto world remains bullish. Now, unfortunately, there is little assurance on where prices may hover as crypto remains inherently volatile. But if the momentum sustains, a very strong 2022 could be in store for the coins mentioned in this video and much of the remaining market will follow their lead. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to check out the website, calcimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calcine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
gaming crypto is gaining traction these days thanks to the growing popularity of non-fungible tokens and the metaverse. Let's take a look at some interesting ones. Introduced in 2019, Gala Games had a total supply of 35 billion Gala tokens. It was invented by Eric Schiermeyer, who intended to reclaim the control of games. Gala Games' goal is to provide a wide variety of blockchain games that put fun first and blockchain in the background. With the help of blockchain technology, the project hopes to restore innovative ideas into games by granting players authority over in-game assets and games. Within the Gala Games ecosystem, players may possess non-fungible tokens and affect the game governance. Gala Games, in addition to purchasing, uses its utility token Gala. Gala Games has so far built an NFT collectible series called Vox and one playable game called Townstar. Star Atlas is a virtual gaming metaverse-based huge multiplayer online game. Atlas was invented by Pablo Quiroga and Michael Wagner. It's been made on Unreal Engine 5, which provides cinematic quality real-time environments. Star Atlas's economy is based on non-fungible tokens that can be traded and obtained. In addition to Star Atlas, intends to provide an NFT release schedule and an NFT marketplace for the distribution and trading of in-game assets. Star Atlas takes place in a futuristic science fiction setting in the year 2620, where three major factions are competing for resources and control. These three factions are humankind, a consortium of alien races, and sentient androids. The Axie Infinity game universe contains intriguing creatures called Axies, which gamers can adopt as pets. For their axes, gamers can nurture, combat, obtain, breed, and establish kingdoms. Players can trade, purchase, and sell the resources they gain through competent gameplay and contributions to the ecosystem in the universe's player-owned economy. In this game, each axie is an NFT having different attributes and can enter into three versus three battles. Here, the winning team means more experience points which can be used to level up an Axie stats. Yield Guild Games is a decentralized autonomous organization that invests in virtual world NFTs. Gabby Dizzer, a team member who introduced the Axie Infinity and Yearn Finance communities, established YGG's Manila-based game studio. Their purpose is to create the world's biggest virtual economy, distribute profits to its stakeholders, and manage its assets to increase utility. In decentralized games, YGG's has created a community of investors and players who generate money through investments in NFTs that are used in blockchain-based games and virtual worlds. The dream of building a large game environment is beginning to come true. The year 2022 will likely be a watershed moment for blockchain gaming and these top four gaming cryptos are likely to benefit the most. So what do you think? You can leave a comment here and like and share this video. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know.
As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Calcai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calcai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shri Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shri Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. PancakeSwap is primarily a decentralised finance application that allows users to swap tokens, farm them and earn fees in return. Launched in 2020, the decentralised exchange executes trades through smart contracts, thus eliminating the risk associated with various transactions. Powered by the multi-blockchain network, PancakeSwap originally used the automated market maker model, which effectively means the liquidity pools are used instead of the order books. Users can add tokens to the liquidity pool, and from there they can farm and stake the cake tokens to earn rewards. On the 10th of February, PancakeSwap was surging after Error 7, Game of Truth, also known as Error, a play-to-earn game, announced its new initial farm offering, or IFO, on PancakeSwap. Cake holders will get special access to IFO 3.1 through a new private sale allocation. The ERA 7 intends to launch its IFO to investors on February 18. Cake Token is ranked 56th on CoinMarketCap as per the market cap of the project and it's enjoyed a strong run of late with gains of 12.2% and 15% in the past 14 and 7 days respectively according to CoinGecko. Investors can take heart from the bullish run that Cake is enjoying and this IFO launch may well help the token maintain momentum for an extended period. For investors, there could indeed be a cherry on the top of their cake. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon. Also, you can check out the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello everyone, Sage here. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. And today's special guest is Mr. Christopher Perception. He's the founder of Percept Form. And we're going to learn more about what Percept Form is doing for the cryptocurrency and blockchain sector. 
there's a qu trending question. Do you have to get a degree to work in cryptocurrency? And Percept Form is an end-to-end -end ecosystem focused on empowering communities through blockchain technology. And Percept Form aims to be the bridge that creates solutions in finance, education, art, and real estate by leveraging blockchain technology. And as you know, here at Calcine, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today, we're very lucky to have with us live Mr. Christopher Perception, founder of Percept Form. Hello, hello. So happy and honored to be here. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. So let's get started. We're keen to share your insights on our show. Percept Form offers online courses about cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens, helping to demystify the world that is absolutely taking off. And it has more than 600 students worldwide. In June this year, it launched Percept Pay, a marketplace that will allow businesses to accept US dollars for goods and services, but receive payment in Bitcoin. How is the response that you are receiving to this newly launched marketplace, please, Christopher? Sure. So in reference to Percept Pay, I've uh, had a lot of interest in it, for one, because it creates frictionless onboarding and offboarding opportunities for merchants. There are a lot of people who are interested in Bitcoin and they're hearing about so much on Twitter, on Facebook, YouTube, but people want to be able to understand things in layman's terms. Can a five-year-old understand what blockchain is? Can a 10-year-old could effectively convey what Bitcoin is. So that's where these courses really come into play. And as of today, we've actually crossed the threshold of 1,000 students globally that we've taught and educated. So the impact has been massive. It's taken off quickly. And we are constantly fine-tuning the social payment marketplace known as Percent. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Just giving you the details to check out his website. And if you'd like, the full recorded interview will be available on Calkine Media's YouTube channel. So please check it out. Stay with us for more live expert talks and market updates. I'll be with you soon with the crypto buzz. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hello and thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Penny Picks here on Calcine TV. I'm Holly and today I'll be shedding some light on a few penny stocks under the spotlight, including Symbol Solutions, Bella Rarox and iTech Minerals. First up though, the Australian market has seen investors' confidence in buying riskier assets as geopolitical tensions between the US and Russia seem to be easing off. The benchmark ASX 200 had risen 0.24% by the mid-trading session, taking cues from global markets. And outperforming the broader markets, small caps are again gaining investor attention after three days of consecutive falls. The ASX Small Ordinaries Index was up 1.48% or 47 points by lunchtime. Although some ASX penny-listed stocks are still in the spotlight today, luring investors with their double-digit gains. Let's have a quick look at a few of them. The first one on our list is Symbol Solutions, a New South Wales-based software company that provides SAS for energy management solutions, Internet of Things and more. The company is quite small with a market cap of a mere $6.79 million. And the company competes with players like Jacob Solutions, Graffiti and others. Today, Symbol Solutions shares rallied over 30% to the last traded price of 0.026 cents by the lunch hour, on the back of a volume expansion which showed 5.9 million shares exchanged hands so far. And today, the company welcomed Dr. Daniel Tillett on the board of directors. Dr. Tillett is the founder of Nucleics, another SAS company, and will not be paid in cash but in options and will receive 12 million in the first year of his appointment at a strike price of 0.04 cents. These options will expire one year from the date of appointment. And our next penny pick is Bella Rarox, which is also on Tuesday's list of our buzzing penny stocks, all thanks to its massive rally. The company has recently been listed on the ASX and it's hitting continuously new heights. Bella Rarox is an ASX listed mineral exploration company focused 
on materials used in the battery and renewable energy markets. The company has successfully raised $5 million via its IPO last month, and its shares are making their presence felt in the newly listed space. The stock has already more than doubled since it first made its debut on the 28th of January. And on Tuesday, Bilirarox shares were up 17.39%, and today it had further rallied by another 17.28, to the last traded price of 0.475 cents. And then the last penny pick of the day is iTech Minerals, a $42.2 million mining and exploration company focused on developing its battery and critical mineral projects in South Australia. Today, the company released a report stating its drilling activities had progressed significantly and its Ayer Peninsula tenement package, which was targeting rare earth elements, ionic absorption, clay and high-purity kaolin mineralization. With a very high rate of drilling, averaging 19 holes per day, the program is paced well ahead of schedule. And following the announcement, investors flocked to buy the iTech Mineral shares, which resulted in a price rise of 14.6% to the last traded price of 0.51 cents. iTech stock is trading at a very close figure to its all-time high of 0.55, marked Monday this week. And that is it for the Penny Picks today, but tune in next time only on Calcain TV. I'm Holly Shield signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Cryptocurrencies always find a reason to hear the headlines thanks to a flurry of fresh developments frequently stirring up the crypto space. With cryptocurrencies getting more mainstream by the day, using crypto to pay for products and services is becoming more and more popular. Many corporations across all types of industries are adopting cryptocurrencies and allowing consumers to pay for their products and services with them. Here are five such companies taking crypto. Overstock is a technology-driven online retailer based in the US. Overstock has grown from a fledgling firm to a multi-billion dollar internet retailer since its inception in 1999. Overstock began taking Bitcoin as payment in 2014, making it the first major US retailer to accept digital currency as a medium of payment. Bitcoin is a digital coin that enables secure and speedy online payments. Overstock has collaborated with Coinbase a cryptocurrency exchange that allows its clients to trade in cryptocurrencies. 
Everstock also struck a partnership with Shapeshift, a cryptocurrency exchange back in 2017. Shapeshift enables consumers to purchase online from Overstock's almost 4 million products, including DIY, furniture, rugs, accessories, bedding and the like, using all the major cryptos such as Monero, Ethereum, Dash, Litecoin, for example. Next up is Travala. Since its inception in 2017, Travala has evolved from a small startup to become the world's premier blockchain-based travel booking platform. The company uses tokenized incentives and next-generation blockchain technologies to book travel. They offer a variety of cryptocurrency and traditional payment alternatives, as well as an innovative user experience. Travala is quickly shot to prominence as a leading crypto-friendly hotel booking platform, which accepts a variety of cryptos. Next, in 2014, tech giant Microsoft began accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for purchasing games, applications, and other digital content from Xbox, video stores, Windows, Xbox games, and Windows Phone. Microsoft also announced the launch of ION in 2021 with the help feed crypto growth. ION is a permissionless public and open layer 2 decentralized identifier network built on Bitcoin's blockchain. And customers in the United States who have premier and personal PayPal accounts now have an opportunity to use their cryptocurrency holdings to pay for certain purchases with millions of online companies. PayPal does not charge for storing cryptocurrency in the account, but there is a transaction fee that users need to pay while selling and purchasing cryptos. And coffee retail chain operator Starbucks announced in 2021 that consumers would be able to pay for their coffee in cryptos via the Backed app, which converts Bitcoin into US dollars. The Backed app is a platform that combines Bitcoin and other forms of digital assets. Whether converting participant rewards points to cash or paying with Bitcoin, customers can do it all using one simple app. Apart from the companies listed above, many other firms such as AT&T, Twitch, Newegg and AirBaltic also accept cryptos as a form of payment for their products. It'll be interesting to see who else jumps on the crypto bandwagon. So what do you think about paying with crypto? You can leave a comment here. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calchime Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet 3 ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Calkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr. Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr. Iggy Tan, and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr. Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Hydrogen is an energy-dense light and storable fuel that produces almost negligible greenhouse gas emissions on combustion. The demand for hydrogen has witnessed unprecedented growth in the past few years due to its huge potential to become a significant source of clean energy.
Ideally, there are two main types of hydrogen, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. As the name suggests, the green hydrogen is formed by breaking water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen without affecting the environment or producing any greenhouse gas emissions. On the contrary, blue hydrogen is either produced by using steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming to break natural gas to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The production of blue hydrogen can create a significant amount of carbon dioxide, which is harmful to the environment. The Western Australian government plans to create hydrogen hubs and install solar panels across the 500-kilometre coastline of Pilbara by 2030. The overall objective is to manufacture hydrogen at numerous hubs near ports for export. The country has already designated five production hubs from Onslow to Port Headland as strategic industrial areas that can be connected to each other and consumers through a hydrogen pipeline. In November, the government also applied for the approval of federal funds for an early contribution of $170 million. Fortescue chairman Andrew Forrest is a supporter of green hydrogen. Now, he doesn't look happy with the plan of the Morrison government. The millionaire has recently boosted its campaign against blue hydrogen in Australia. Along with many other industry veterans, he believes that blue hydrogen is not a solution for eliminating greenhouse emissions from the environment. Several researchers have found that CCS fails to capture fugitive emissions into the atmosphere, like the emission of methane, as it leaks during natural gas extraction. In addition to that, researchers also say that this technology is not fully efficient to capture emissions. Even in some cases, it was found that the cost of production for blue hydrogen is higher as the production unit captures close to 90% of emissions. Hydrogen has huge potential to become a significant source of green energy as the world aims to make a swift transition towards a low carbon energy system. So what do you think? Should this move by the Morrison government be welcomed? You can leave a comment if you like. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalki Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. crypto market has grown by leaps and bounds from just 18.5 billion US dollars in February of 2017 to 1.97 trillion on February of 2022. At the moment there are around 17,500 cryptocurrencies and more than 450 crypto exchanges globally. The gains of the market have also accelerated over the past two years and the momentum is likely to continue with the advent of new technology and innovation like Web 3.0, the Metaverse and NFTs. In October last year, ProShares Bitcoin strategy became the first ever crypto ETF to debut in the US stock market after a nod from the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And not long after, more ETFs followed. ETFs or exchange traded funds are one of the easiest ways to get exposure to diverse crypto assets and they're relatively safer than direct investment due to the market's high volatility. So let's narrow in on the top three crypto ETFs based on their AUM or asset under management. Number one, of course, is ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF, the original. ProShares or BITO BITO, the first crypto ETF in the US, manages the front month CME Bitcoin futures portfolio. 
founded in October of 2021, the Open Ended Fund has an average daily trading volume of 197 million US dollars, while the asset under management sits at 1.16 million. The ITO does not invest directly in Bitcoin, but in Bitcoin futures on the CME Commodity Exchange. Its expense ratio is 0.95%, and the top 10 holdings include the US dollar, futures, and US Treasury bills as well. Number two on our list is a Valkyrie Bitcoin Strategy ETF. The Valkyrie Bitcoin ETF was launched in October as well, and it's an open-ended fund like BITO and has approximately 43.17 million US dollars in assets under management. The BTF portfolio includes Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Bitcoin Futures, corporate bonds, cash treasuries as well. And it does not directly invest in Bitcoin as well, and it doesn't track any index. BTF's expense ratio is 0.95 and its daily average trading volume is 12.98 million US dollars. ETF's top 10 holdings include mutual funds and treasury bills. And number three on our list is Vanek Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Like the other two, XBTF doesn't invest directly in cryptocurrency. It invests in front month Bitcoin future contracts. Launched on the 15th of November in 2021, this open-ended fund has 28.34 million US dollars worth of assets under management. Its average daily trading volume is at 1.41 million US dollars. And XBTF has a lower expense ratio than the other two at 0.65%. The expense ratio is critical because higher expenses may lead to less profit. And the CTF's top 10 holdings include the US dollar and treasury bills. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some other news to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Good afternoon and thanks for tuning in. The share price of Liontown Resources has soared over 14% on the ASX to $1.597 today. The lithium producing stock is getting attention as approximately 27 million shares were either being sold or bought on the exchange so far. So what exactly has impacted Liontown's share price and why is it on the investors' radar? 
Well, first of all, the company announced today that it has signed a legally binding sales and purchase term sheet with Tesla. This agreement will allow Liontown to supply lithium spodamine concentrate from its new Kathleen Valley, Valley Lithium project. And according to the terms of the agreement, Tesla will buy 100,000 dry metric tons of material in the first year. It will eventually increase to 150,000 tons per year from the subsequent years onward. This deal is dependent on the commencement of the commercial production at the Kathleen project by 2025. On top of this, it's also dependent upon two parties successfully completing negotiations after executing detailed definitive agreements within the May 30 timeline. And failing to do so will of course result in the termination of this deal. But overall, it's great news for the company as Tesla is aligned with its offtake strategy of targeting Tier 1 customers downstream in the global battery value chain as it validates the Tier 1 credentials of the Kathleen project. Lionstown will be using a formula-based mechanism to determine the pricing of lithium. And this formula will refer to the market prices for lithium hydroxide monohydrate. The agreement is expected to commence in 2024 and will be valid for about five years initially. Liontown's share prices soared a stellar 270% on the ASX over the last 12 months. However, its year-to-date price is in the red, down 8.86% today. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcane TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Keep Network and New Cypher tokens have merged to create the Threshold Network token, and the cryptocurrency exchange Binance has agreed to upgrade the tokens to T. The Keep Network and New Cypher communities approved the merger back in June 2021. After the network upgrade, the existing Keep and new token holders will get the new token T. Keep Network and New Cypher are protocols for data privacy on the Ethereum blockchain. Binance fully supports the merger, according to Keep Network in a post on Twitter. The Keep and New tokens will now be automatically upgraded to T tokens on Binance in the next week. 93% of Keep Network stakers voted in favour of the merger. Keep's maximum supply is around 1 billion and New's maximum supply is about 3.9 billion. Keep Network is an incentivized network for storing and encrypting private data in the form of off-chain containers called Keeps on the blockchain, making it fully censorship resistant. It addresses the problem of holding back blockchain adoption. Developers can make fully decentralized apps on the platform. Keep is the native token of the network and it can be staked. Keep's market cap is US $441 million and the network was founded back in 2017. As for New Cypher, well, it's a decentralized encryption and key management system for public blockchains. It offers end-to-end -end encrypted data sharing and decentralized storage solutions on blockchains. NU, or NU, is the native token of New Cypher. It's used to incentivize participants to perform key management services and access operations on the network. It's also used to run the worker node through the staking process. New Cypher published its first white paper in June 2017, and in the following year, it launched its private testnet. The Threshold token was created after the merger of these two platforms, Keep Network and New Cypher, and it was finalized on the 1st of January 2022. The network now aims to provide a suite of cryptographic primitives for the dApps. T is a utility for the Threshold network and is acting as the governance token for the Threshold DAO. 
users can lock the token in coverage pools and then earn yields. Keep Token is still available for trading at exchanges such as Binance, KuCoin, Crypto.com, Gate.io and Mandala Exchange and new Cypher can be traded on Coinbase Pro, Binance, Uniswap, Hobie and Gate.io. And of course, T-Token is coming very soon. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to check out our website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. The electric vehicle market has witnessed considerable growth in the last two years, with the International Energy Agency indicating 6.6 .6 million EVs sold in 2021 globally, compared to 3 million in 2020. A significant rise in sales was recorded despite the ongoing semiconductor chip shortage across the industry and the COVID-19 restrictions. China has done well with their sales so far, accounting for almost 12% of the total EV sales in 2021. Norway is the global leader in EV adoption, recording more than 80% of the total new cars sold in the country are electric vehicles. Australia has recorded staggering growth in EV sales. The country tripled its total EV sales in 2021 to 20,665 compared to 6,900 sold in 2020. Tesla's Model 3 was the best-selling electric car in Australia, with 12,094 vehicles sold in 2021. MG ZS took the second position with 1,388, and Mitsubishi Outlander with 592. Australia may witness the launch of many EV models before the end of the year. The largest new vehicle retailer in the region, Toyota, has claimed to launch around 30 EVs across the Toyota and Lexus brands by 2030. Many automakers have released their first generation offerings. A few of them have expanded their catalogue of EVs. More consumers are considering EVs as the next vehicle of their garage, as they can choose from their various options in the exciting list of cars across categories in the coming months. Various EV models, including Hyundai's Elonic 5 and Polestar 2, are expected to launch this year, but they are facing supply troubles due to the chip shortage. Kia's EV6 is also facing the same issue. The growth in EV sales is going hand in hand with the increasing awareness for environmentally friendly means of transportation. So will your next car be electric? Leave a comment below and let us know. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Bitcoin is the world's largest and most popular cryptocurrency with a market capitalization of over 800 billion US dollars. This digital token can be purchased as a long-term investment or make payments for certain goods and services. There are several ways to purchase Bitcoin in Australia. It can be purchased using a Bitcoin ATM. If you want to purchase Bitcoin using cash, this may be a suitable option. However, Bitcoin ATMs are a costly source to obtain the digital coin as they charge between 5% and 20% as fees, which is over 10 times higher than the fee charged by online crypto exchanges. 
The most convenient way to purchase Bitcoin in Australia is through a Bitcoin exchange. You can open an account online and purchase Bitcoin in only a matter of minutes. These exchanges store Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies on behalf of their clients. Bitcoin exchanges also have some of the lowest fees for purchasing Bitcoin in Australia. You can spend as little as 0.75% in exchange fees on a platform like eToro. You can also purchase Bitcoin over the counter from news agents in Australia. Here you can make payments either in cash or using cards, either credit or debit cards. There are over 1,200 participating news agents in Australia who deal in Bitcoin. However, the fee charged by news agents is very high. They normally charge around 5%, much higher than the fee charged by online crypto exchanges. So what are the most well-known crypto exchanges? Well, according to eToro, they are the world's most popular social trading platform for Bitcoin. You can open a free account and there are no management or ticketing fees and no added broker fees. For trading in Bitcoin, eToro charges a spread of 0.75%. Once you buy Bitcoin on eToro, it will be transferred to your digital wallet. Due to its ease of use, minimal fee structure and rapid account setup processes, eToro is a preferred medium to trade in Bitcoin. eToro is specifically useful for novice traders because of its copy trader functionality that allows users to imitate the strategies of expert traders, increasing their chances of making profits while reducing risks. Then there's Coinbase. Founded in 2012 by Brian Armstrong, Coinbase is an online exchange to deal in cryptocurrencies. It also specializes in providing storage facilities for cryptocurrencies. The Financial Conduct Authority regulates its e-money services. Through Coinbase, you can access over 100 cryptocurrencies and can trade in over 80 crypto to crypto pairs, making transactions on Coinbase affordable as well. You require a minimum deposit of $2.70 and the commission charged by the exchange varies between 0.5% and 4.5% per trade. That's depending on the cryptocurrency you want to trade. Binance is another crypto exchange for trading Bitcoin. It's the world's biggest crypto exchange in terms of trade volume and speed, in fact. A wide range of cryptocurrencies and low trading fees are two of its biggest advantages. If you trade in crypto to crypto pairs, you have to pay a flat trading fee of 0.1%. You can reduce trading fees further by using its native cryptocurrency, Binance Coin, for paying the trading fees. There are different trading fee tiers with lower fees for users who hold enough BNB coins and maintain certain monthly trading volumes. So there are some of the best ways to purchase and hold Bitcoin in Australia. Can you suggest any other ways? Leave a comment below if you can. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. AstraZeneca stock saw a massive surge at the end of last week, topping the index after the release of its extraordinary full year and fourth quarter results. Hi, thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcane Media.
AstraZeneca's results showed that last year was a year of phenomenal pipeline and commercial delivery. The total revenues of the pharma company increased by 41% to $37.4 billion US dollars in 2021. While the COVID-19 vaccine earnings were included in this figure, even without them, revenue was still up by 26%. In the fourth quarter of last year, the total revenue was up 62% and touching the $12 billion mark. AstraZeneca's core EPS was up as well 32% last year and through the acquisition of Alexion, the company has been able to speed up its strategic transformation. Evu Shield and Tess Spire have also been approved, which is positive news for the company's pipeline and it supports its outlook for 2022. However, due to the acquisition of Alexion and the additional funds spent on R&D and product launches, AZ has reported a pre-tax loss of $265 million US dollars, as compared to a profit of $3.9 billion in the previous year. As the prospects and cash generation potential of the company seem bright, AstraZeneca's board is planning to raise the annualized dividend from 0.10 US cents to $2.90. In March of 2022, the company is due to pay a second interim dividend of $1.97 for the year 2021, marking the total dividend for the year reaching 2.87. AZ has raised its guidance for the fiscal year 2022 after beating its fourth quarter profit expectations. However, it's warned that the sales numbers, which were significantly up due to COVID-19 products, may fall. The pharma giant is listed on the main market of the London Stock Exchange, and it has been since 1993. It's a constituent of the FTSE 100 index and it's also traded publicly on the Nasdaq exchange. The current market cap of AstraZeneca stands at £129.5 billion and has provided a return to shareholders of 17.97% over the last one year as of the 10th of February 2022. Meanwhile, its year-to-date return stands at negative 0.52%. With a robust trajectory in 2021, AstraZeneca is positive about its profitability and the growth in the long run. The company has raised its 2022 sales forecasts and annual dividends as well, and it has some bright future prospects. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Carcine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. The price of Ellipsis has gained momentum over the past few days as it gathers interest from potential investors. Ellipsis Crypto is a BEP20 token and according to CoinMarketCap, it has a total supply of 623.1 million tokens with a circulating supply of 594.1 million. EPS is the native token of Ellipsis Finance, which is Curve Finance's authorised fork. Ellipsis Finance acts as an exchange for users and decentralised protocols to trade between various stablecoins. The network is designed to enable secure and low slippage swapping of stablecoins. As Ellipsis receives support from Curve Finance, it's expected to ensure features like no liquidity lockups and no deposit and withdrawal fees. According to the white paper of Ellipsis Finance, EPS is primarily a revenue earning token and it benefits the stakes and liquidity providers. Ellipsis Crypto's liquidity providers and stakers get a portion of the trading fees. 
Generally, it's split equally between the two. EPS crypto appears to be bullish at the moment, and if it continues the momentum, it could witness a price surge in the future. However, it is essential to know that the cryptocurrency market is highly volatile and prices of virtual assets continue to fluctuate. Therefore, it's crucial to research before investing. Ellipsis is available on a number of exchanges if you are interested, including Binance, KuCoin, Mandala Exchange, and Crypto.com. Hope you enjoyed watching the video, and if you did, then please make sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkai. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Good afternoon and thanks for tuning in. With the prospects of de-escalation in the Ukraine rising, crude oil prices have tumbled over 3%, taking a deep dive from their seven-year high levels. The substantial drop in prices came after Russia stated that it has withdrawn some of the military units back to bases following the completion of exercises near the Ukraine. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Moscow is ready to indulge in talks with the U.S. and NATO on limits for missile deployments and military transparency. Oil prices has, had risen staggeringly to touch a seven-year high level as investors were concerned about the potential war between Russia and the Ukraine, which was expected to hamper crude oil supplies. But the recent developments have altered the situation yet again. Despite this, though, a serious cyber attack has hit the websites of Ukrainian government agencies and major banks recently amid the escalating tensions. At least 10 Ukrainian websites stopped working due to this attack. These included some of the major sites in the country like the official websites of the Defense Ministry, Foreign Ministry and Culture Ministry, as well as two of Ukraine's largest state banks. Meanwhile, investors are also eyeing talks between the U.S. and Iran on reviving the 2015 nuclear deal expected to bring one MBPD of oil into the market of the cooling oil prices. And underlying the tight supply of demand balance, the U.S. crude stockpiles tumbled 1.1 million barrels for the week ending in the middle of the month, according to the American Petroleum Institute figures. More updates will follow. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. At the moment, economists are debating whether China's zero-COVID policy is hurting global growth. The policy was introduced in China during the early stages of the pandemic. Its basic paradigm suggests that the protocol of find, test, trace, isolate and support are needed. The idea behind the policy is to retain the transmission of the virus and its subsequent variants. And to do so, countries have imposed stringent lockdown restrictions and border closures. It's been observed that the zero-COVID policy might have been successful in the early stages of the virus's impact. However, with further mutations, the approach is relatively inefficient. The same was suggested by the WHO chief as he said that countries should lift travel bans to recumber economies and focus on public health via boosting vaccination drives. Thus, several countries like Australia abandoned the zero-COVID policy and are now moving ahead to bring the old normalcy back. So why is China still sticking to this zero-COVID rule? Well, despite most countries abandoning the policy, China seems to have no plans of getting rid of it anytime soon. The nation with the world's second largest economy believes that the approach has been in fact tremendously helpful in curbing deaths and case numbers. But while China might support this policy, world economists have a different view. Since the country is a significant part of the world economy, many are worrying if its inflexibility with the zero COVID policy can hurt global growth. To restrict restrictions in the country, there's been a substantial impact on the global supply chain, particularly a significant disruption in several Chinese-based factories of top car makers. On top of this, due to extensive lockdowns, there have been disruptions and delays for the leading chip makers like Samsung, based in China. So in January, IMF Chief Kristalina Georgova said that the country should revise its zero-COVID measures. She pointed out that China's extensive COVID regulations may burden the Chinese and the global economy with it. The discussion has been revisited as the Bank of Japan's policymaker has recently said that the zero COVID curbs may be hurting global growth. And according to him, the restrictions imposed by China may prolong the disruptions in the supply chain and thus the international inflationary pressure may rise. 
I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Web 3.0 catapult Bitcoin to 300,000 US dollars. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Holy Shields here for Calcoin Media. Proponents envision Web 3.0 as the next gen of the internet that will take the digital world by storm over the coming years. This decentralized version of the internet is expected to shift the balance of power between tech giants and users. Now we know that blockchain runs on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, meaning that power is not centered at one specific point, but distributed among users that may be present anywhere in the world. And Bitcoin is indeed the most dominant blockchain-based cryptocurrency. And if the digital currency finds its way into Web 3.0, well, there is a fair chance that Bitcoin might become what Jack Dorsey predicts will be the native currency. And if blockchain finds its way into Web 3.0, there might be a fair chance that Bitcoin will become what Jack Dorsey predicts is the native currency of the internet. The price of BTC might be propelled forward if this does happen. And since Web 3.0 will take at least a few years to make strides, Bitcoin's price for now the price of BTC might be propelled forward if this does happen. And since Web 3.0 will take at least a few years to make some strides, Bitcoin's price from now until 2025 remains a close one to watch. The mainstreaming of Bitcoin has seen developments like the S&P Dow Jones launching Bitcoin indices in 2021, Bitcoin ETFs getting listed on popular exchanges like the Toronto Stock Exchange, and a few multi-billionaires are tweeting about Bitcoin with Tesla and MicroStrategy holding BTC as an asset. Although adoption as a legal tender has still remained subdued. El Salvador's move made headlines in 2021, but other countries are still treading cautiously. As of now, major economies, including the US, are not in any mood to legalize Bitcoin as legal tender. Meanwhile, the governor of India's central bank recently called cryptos a threat to financial stability, and China has outlawed Bitcoin altogether, with a focus on its own digital yuan project. But that aside, historical price data of Bitcoin or its moving average cannot be relied upon to predict the price of this hypervolatile asset. But if the Web 3.0 project unfolds in the same manner as predicted by its proponents, with Bitcoin truly emerging as a native currency of the decentralized internet, then the coin may rise sharply. The reason lies in the fact that it has a limited supply of 21 million tokens. And if these tokens are acquired in the new economics of the internet, prices might rally to an unprecedented pace due to a demand frenzy. Though it seems likely that Bitcoin might not enter a six-digit price trajectory by the end of the year, a favorable turn of events with regard to Web 3.0 and BTC's adoption as legal tender may take the price to US$300,000 by the end of 2025. What's your take on Bitcoin's price trajectory? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. It's been a huge week for the Polygon blockchain, which received a $450 million infusion from a variety of top investment firms, including Sequoia Capital India, SoftBank Vision Fund 2, and Tiger Global.
The huge investment follows signs that Polygon is moving into the Web3 space, which its investors clearly believe is a profitable move. Polygon operates as a layer to the network on the Ethereum blockchain and its role is basically to eliminate traffic from the Ethereum blockchain. This is one reason why Polygon is currently thriving. Over the past year, the Ethereum blockchain has become congested as a result of a huge increase in its number of users. While its usership has increased, so too has congestion, leading to higher gas prices as well as slow transaction speeds. Delays surrounding Ethereum's upgrade have also helped Polygon's popularity. Ethereum's upgrade, called Ethereum 2.0, was originally slated for completion last year, but has since been delayed for release until later this year. Ethereum's layer 2 aside, Polygon's recent moves into the Web3 ecosystem is what has made it so attractive to investors. Earlier this year, Polygon hired YouTube's former head of gaming, Ryan Wyatt, to move Polygon into this new version of the internet. Web3 promises a more decentralized, user-friendly incarnation of the net, which will house the metaverse as well as non-fungible tokens and cryptocurrencies. Polygon also has its own native cryptocurrency called Matic, which has experienced a significant increase over the past seven days. Matic is used as a staking token to validate transactions using the proof-of-stake method. Matic has a market capitalization of $14.7 billion, which ranks it 15th in the largest cryptos by market cap. It's currently valued at $1.97 after being priced at $1.53 just a week ago, an increase of over 20%. This latest spike comes after a short period of decline since it touched an all-time high of $2.90 on the 27th of December 2021. Although the year 2022 has so far been a downturn in the wider crypto market, things are possibly turning around. The winners this year will be those platforms that evolve with the changing of the internet. Polygon is definitely one to watch in this department. So what do you think about Polygon? You can leave your comments below. You can also like and share this video and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policymakers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organized by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gain Steam and Meet Three ASX Players with Battery Mineral Exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. 
what the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hassan is one name you may have heard of when it comes to the lucky few who've made a fortune from cryptos. But there's more to the story than meets the eye. Hassan originally attracted attention from reportedly making sky-high profits in the crypto market within just a few months. The 20 year old told the public that he forayed into the world of digital currencies with a mere 50 US dollars in 2020, and his investments reached 1 million not too long after. Sun is reported to be a college dropout and decided to put his crypto gains to good use by opening a charity group and spending close to 200,000 on various good causes. But his rags to riches story isn't all it's cracked up to be. The BBC has just axed a documentary about the so-called crypto millionaire over allegations of him scamming investors. Concerns were raised shortly after an article from a renowned media house went viral and stated how a successful trader, Hanada Hassan, age 20, had managed to turn an initial £37 investment into nearly £6 million within just the span of a year. And evidence of the damage has already surfaced. Several individuals had alleged that they've lost their entire savings due to the scam. Hassan's case is a classic example of why investors need to be alert and vigilant and need to do their research before making important decisions like this. More updates will follow. I'm Holly Shields of Kalkai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
As per the World Bank, we will need more than 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals for solar, wind and battery storage as the global economies fight to limit the rise in global temperatures by 2 degrees. Come 2050, battery metals are grabbing the attention of the EV or electric vehicle manufacturers and the policy makers within the governments across the globe. Join us to know more about battery minerals right from the ASX listed metal and mining players who are operating with the right vantage point as the world accelerates towards an all EV age. Why wait? Register now for an insightful webinar going to be organised by Kalkai Media titled EV Revolution Gains Steam and meet three ASX players with battery mineral exposure. Get a chance to interact with the leaders of Kalkai Media's valued clients, Coda Minerals Limited, Altec Chemicals and Shree Minerals Limited on February 24th, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. You will get in-depth insights from the CEO and Executive Director of Coda Minerals Limited, Mr Chris Stevens, Managing Director of Altec Chemicals, Mr Iggy Tan and Managing Director of Shree Minerals Limited, Mr Sanjay Loyalka. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Thanks for tuning in to Kalkine TV. James Preston with you. And in breaking news, Jeff Bainbridge, the managing director and CEO of ASX listed Lark Distilling, has stepped down from his post with immediate effect. Earlier today, Lark Distilling issued a media release confirming that Jeff has resigned effective immediately to enable him to manage a personal matter brought to the board's attention on the afternoon of the 15th of February. It said that Jeff has taken this step after one of his personal videos was published in the public domain. The video was posted by The Australian on Wednesday in which Jeff could be seen smoking what is believed to be ice or methamphetamine from a glass pipe. It's believed the release of the video is an attempt to extort money from Jeff by unnamed individuals. 
The footage was captured from a Southeast Asian nation back in 2015, and Bainbridge's resignation as CEO of Lark Distilling has taken a massive toll on the share price of the company. As of now, its shares are at $3.60, a fall of more than 20% since the scandal broke. The company has also already announced its interim managing director. Laura McBain will take on the role of interim managing director for the company. She's most recently served as a non-executive director and previously acted as the CEO and managing director of ASX-listed Bellamy's Australia from 2014 to 2017. Jeff Bainbridge's representatives have declined to comment further on the matter. And that is all for this particular report. And hopefully we can see a recovery for Lark Distilling moving forward. For the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews, make sure to keep it locked on Cowkind TV. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Year basis. Founded by Mitch. Hey there, James for Cowkine, and in this video, we're going to get acquainted with Theta. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos. Theta is primarily a blockchain-based network built to stream videos. The network uses decentralized networks wherein users can share the bandwidth and videos on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Founded by Mitch Liu and Ji Yi Long in 2018, Theta's protocol aims to pioneer content services. Centralized video services can often have high overhead costs and bandwidth issues. But with Theta, users benefit from getting cheaper content than other competing centralized platforms whilst reducing the entry barrier. Theta crypto price saw a significant surge of over 10% and a volume gain of over 500% recently. But why was it rallying? The Theta token recently was in the spotlight mainly due to the recent news of Replay, the blockchain-based video tracking and payments network emerging from stealth mode due to backing by the Theta network. This would mean that through Replay's solutions, the users of the video ecosystem stand a chance to be fairly rewarded for their contributions. Consumers of Replay, a TNT20 token built on the Theta blockchain, will now stand a chance to be rewarded for subscribing and watching content.
By utilizing the Theta Video API as the underlying infrastructure for video delivery, Replay users can also earn while they watch the content. Theta Token is ranked number 38 on CoinMarketCap and it's been enjoying a strong run of late. As of Feb 15, it's gained 24% in the past two weeks. Theta investors would be hoping this purple patch continues and the next few days could provide some key insights into its future performance. Additionally, the Replay Theta partnership will give content creators a unique way of posting content online and standing a chance to earn revenue from it. The strong utility value of the token could be crucial in terms of its long-term success, but by no means is this a simple existing for the sake of existing project. So add it to your watch list. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe, and don't forget to press the bell icon. For more information, just check out the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine.